Welcome to the full audiobook narration of P.A. Mason's Framed and Gamed, Book 4 in the Witchy Cozy Mystery Series, Trouble Down Under. Chapter 1 Dang it. I tapped a finger on the wheel of my truck in irritation as I glared at the closed sign hanging in the window of Ash's computer store. It was 11 a.m. for Pete's sake. It had been a week since I'd actually laid eyes on the man, and the fact that he wasn't returning my calls so soon after risking his own neck helping me on a case had me worried. Really worried. I pulled out my phone to call for the millionth time, and it went straight to voicemail. It was about time that I contacted the Inquisition, or perhaps the regular police to see if I could file a missing person's report. The thing that stayed my hand was knowing just how deep he'd dug into both mundane and magical databases lately. If he'd simply taken off for an impromptu vacation, or was off covering his tracks somewhere, he wouldn't appreciate me shining a beacon on him. Pulling the keys from the ignition, I jumped out of the truck on my errand to get coffee for both my employee, Bill and me. Perhaps after work I could come back and break into the shop for clues. Though, knowing my luck, I was sure Ash had the premises rigged with all manner of alarms. After ordering coffee, and a couple of sweet buns, along with a newspaper for Bill, I forced my mind to turn to my other problem. Both coffee and sugar were required for my next task of giving my employee a comprehensive tour of the point-of-sale system at the store to prepare for the weekend. If business was going to be as busy as I thought it would be, scratching down sales on a notepad and leaving them for me to put into the system long term was unfeasible. If the lesson went as expected, it would probably be simpler for me to come into the shop myself for the three-hour shift. Bad mood aside, pulling up at the front of the Garden Gate Nursery and Supplies, complete with its newly installed set of antique cast-iron gates out the front, still gave me butterflies in my stomach. A new batch of plants had arrived from the wholesaler the day before to fill the spaces that launch day had left behind, and I was looking forward to finding an hour or two to get them properly settled in. And maybe a cheeky bit of magic to bring on a burst of growth. Balancing my tray of coffees, I crunched across the gravel as Bill met me at the door and held it open. Glad you're back. I can't for the life of me get this bloody order sorted out. Handing the coffee over, I craned my neck around Bill to see a woman by the counter, her eyebrow arched in irritation. It took all that I was worth to smile instead of sigh as I strode in to assess the situation. Morning, I beamed. My apologies, I'm afraid this is my fault for leaving my post. Now what do we have here? It turned out the error was indeed mine as a mosaic pot scanned up at the wrong price, and Bill watched over my shoulder as I adjusted the sum manually on the computer. The week I'd entered the new stock into the system hadn't been my best. In my defense, I'd been a suspect in a murder investigation at the time. Now, I really appreciate your patience with us today, why don't I help you out with all this and I'll get you an extra ficus on the way out? That earned an exclamation and a smile from the customer, and I wrangled the pots on the counter to follow her out to a small white sedan. Making sure to chat with her about her plans for the indoor plants before leaving, I hoped she'd be a return customer. Just how long had Bill kept her waiting anyhow? Inside, my older employee sipped his coffee with the newspaper spread in front of him and I picked up another mosaic pot to correct the sales price on the system. My dyscalculia, or trouble with ordering numbers, caused me no end of trouble while running my business. It wasn't the first mistake I'd found that week. Dead. Bill shook his head before taking a bite of his sweet bun, his eyes on the newspaper. Say what? The pot fell through my fingertips and shattered on the floor. Bill blinked up in surprise and frowned at the mess. Who was dead? I'd had enough of that word over the past few months. Assuming the worst, I stepped over the shattered pot with a sense of dread. Sharon Symes. Bill gave me a strange look. That house fire last night? Terry down the road took off from my place to help when it got too big for the CFA to handle. House fire? I blinked. Who's Sharon Symes? Bill shrugged. Just a woman who ran one of those candle shops in town. My Mary used to go to school with her in Rutherglen. 
Oh. I ran a hand through my hair and felt awkward at my dramatic display. Fetching a dustpan and broom, I turned to clean up my mess. Well, that's awful. Sure is. They'll be looking into it properly today, I reckon, but the rag says it was an electrical fire. He flicked the newspaper to make his point. Too many houses around here with old, dodgy wiring. I'll take that on notice, I sighed as I emptied the shattered pot into a bin behind the counter. The store had a ways to go yet, and I should probably add electrical to the list of things to see to, both there and at home. Now, let me show you how to fix up prices on an order. It took a few demonstrations but Bill finally nodded and said he thought he could handle it. When I went back into the database to fix up the price properly, he tapped a page in the newspaper. It'll be busy on the long weekend. Goldberry will be bursting at the seams with tourist types. Labor Day weekend? I was still familiarizing myself with the Australian calendar and peered at a full-page advertisement for a country music festival across the border. It was a couple of weeks away by the looks. Huh. Well, I can come in on the Saturday with you, and I'll be here Monday same as usual. Do you think opening Sunday would be a good idea? Bill snorted and pushed his glasses further up his nose. If you want to run yourself right into the ground, working seven days a week with a busy weekend won't do you any favors. I pressed my lips together and considered the extra hours I'd been putting into the store. The adage of doing what you love ensures you'll never work a day of your life only extended so far sometimes. But I'd always thought opening weekends made more sense than coming in on a slow Tuesday to while away the hours, and I wasn't going to get far spinning my wheels during the week when I knew tourists turned up on the weekend. Maybe I need to employ someone a few days a week. I puffed out my cheeks. It'll be an extra cost, but maybe I can switch to weekends and they can help out during the week. Bill's roster had been the same before I'd bought the place. He came in for three hours on a Saturday in exchange for one day a fortnight off during the week. It suited me fine to carry on the arrangement, folks on more domestic projects tended to drop by on a Saturday, but browsing the nursery and gift shop needed a different tactic. Nobody was rushing out on their lunch hour to grab a philodendron for their desk or getting out of bed on the weekend on a mission to get to the nursery before noon. If you reckon you're ready for that kind of thing, Bill said non-committally. It has been a lot busier here this week. Word of mouth from the launch. I can't count on that to last forever though. I dragged a hand over my face. If I want to hold on to the same success, I'll need to attract people passing through. Well, I don't know how many tourists will come looking over this side of town, but I've got a niece after something part-time. Smart kid too. Studying business at uni. I blinked, then narrowed my eyes mischievously. Another Rowlands? Geez, you folks are taking over. Bill laughed good-naturedly at that. His wife Mary had been a savior in taking care of the bookkeeping for me, but the man was a good judge of character, and maybe offering something very casual to someone in college might be less cumbersome on the business than advertising for a part-timer. What's her name? I asked. Megan, Megan Rowlands my youngest brother's daughter. I chewed my lip as I considered it. So long as I made it plain that it was a trial of sorts, I could make the timeline work to be ready for the long weekend. I assumed she'd be a fast learner but tending a shop and managing customers couldn't be too difficult for someone studying business. The experience might even offer her a good dose of reality in running an enterprise. Tell you what, you talk to your niece and see if she's interested, then give me her number. I'll take it from there." Bill grinned and nodded, then ran a pen down the list of orders to go out for delivery. I've got a few loads to go out to the road crew. I shouldn't keep them much longer. Right. I peered at the delivery sheet and nodded. The road construction on the way to Melbourne was a pain for almost everyone except me. They ordered by the truckload, and plenty of them over the past weeks. I could forgive Bill for skipping a sales lesson for that, something which I suspected he'd counted on since before I went to pick up coffee. We can revisit the computer stuff tomorrow, I gave him my cheeriest smile. 
Bill's eyes widened just a fraction, and he rubbed his chin sheepishly before trudging out of the office muttering something that sounded like agreement. Thrumming my fingers on the counter, I wondered how many calls I'd have to field over the weekend to talk him through a transaction. A new employee was beginning to sound rather good. With that in mind, I turned my attention to the computer screen with a notion to take some screenshots to collate in some kind of manual, or perhaps a video would work better. I pursed my lips as I pictured Bill asking a customer to wait until he could get to the part of a video which told him what to do next and shook my head ruefully. Something on paper would be more appropriate. I was about to rummage up some stock to do some testing when my ginger feline familiar leapt onto the counter to land on the keyboard. Hey, I protested, shifting him off the keys. No wonder Bill has a hard time with orders. I'm sure I saw a receipt on Tuesday with your typing handiwork on it. Gus sat by the computer and glared at the keyboard. It's the location. Why must it sit in the perfect landing position? Frowning, I waved to the rest of the cleared counter. If he couldn't figure out how to land elsewhere, then he could stay off it entirely. Do I need to get you some cat stares in your old age? I teased. Surely not, he said, lifting a paw to chew at his claws. Did you find the illusionist? Gus was one of the few people I could talk to about Ash's disappearance. He'd been less troubled by it than I was, but as the week wore on, he appeared to be taking more interest. I heaved a deep breath and shook my head. Nope, closed again. I can't keep pretending that he's just going to turn up tomorrow. A tracking spell is difficult to achieve, even so if we had some of his effects. I don't even know where the guy lives, I exclaimed, then noticed two women browsing out the front lift their heads. I dropped my voice to a whisper and picked up my phone to hold it against my ear to keep from looking unhinged. And I've got a bad feeling about breaking into the shop. Ash wasn't the most trusting type. I'll wager the place is warded. Gus turned his head to peer at the customers who appeared to be making their way toward the door with an armload of plants. Then we must devise a cunning plan. We can confer with Sorka later this evening. Great. I made a show of pressing buttons on my phone as the bell over the door sounded and turned on a smile. Enlisting the help of an undead necromancer from the 16th century to find a friend was totally sensible. But sitting on my hands wasn't working for me. Chapter 2 I almost kept driving when I saw the suits carting armloads of computer hardware to the back of waiting vans. But I slowed and pulled up nonetheless. Gus put his paws up on the dash to stare at the scene at the front of the computer store. I didn't even cut the ignition as I watched open-mouthed, along with pedestrians who gawked as they went about their business in Myrtle Glen. Inquisitors, Gus said. Blinking, I inspected the vans and had to agree with Gus's assessment. They were unmarked, unlike the police vans I'd seen previously when they came to search my house, and the folks in suits rarely did the heavy lifting. Every time I'd tangled with inquisitors they'd dressed similarly, and I knew they had cause to apprehend Ash, even if he worked as a subcontractor for them. I'm glad we stopped by, I swallowed. Not a few minutes before, my familiar and I had been arguing over the point of checking yet again if the tech illusionist had returned to his place of business. The situation had to be as bad as I thought it was, and I fought the dread rising from my belly that this was likely my fault. If his hacking activities on my account had finally unearthed his surveillance of the Inquisition itself, well, I wasn't sure how I could reconcile with that. Amelia, Gus hissed. Amelia Ward, Inquisitor and Medium by Craft, stepped out of Ash's shop with her hands on her hips. Glossy black hair hung around her face, and her pouting red lips contrasted with smooth brown skin. In her heels and pinstripe black business suit, she looked more like a Hollywood lawyer than a ghost whisperer, and from the way she carried herself, I assumed she was leading the operation, which meant I had someone to demand answers from. Unbuckling my seatbelt, I slid out of the truck and belatedly cut the ignition to stuff the skeleton key in my pocket. Gus slipped out behind me and trotted off before I could protest. Reefing the door closed, I turned and met Amelia's eye before storming over. 
What in the light is going on here? I demanded. Cat crow, Amelia said as she looked me up and down. Should have known you'd turn up. I'm sure trouble must be your second name. My mouth worked. Then I pointed to the shop window. I'm trouble? What have you done with Ash? What have I done? Amelia's perfectly shaped eyebrows knitted together, then she shook her head in irritation. I'm not discussing this with you. This is Inquisition business so I'm going to ask you to move along. Another suit passed between us to heap more gear in the back of the van. Passersby had stopped to gawk, and I clenched my fists to keep from screeching. Ash is my friend. That makes whatever you're doing here my business too. That's not how this works. Amelia held up a warning finger. I've got a job to do and you're just a regular citizen who needs to stay out of the way of authorities. I considered Amelia's mulish stare and decided she wouldn't tell me anything out on the street in front of both Mundanes and her squad of Inquisitor colleagues. I knew she'd worked with Ash before, and held her eyes to get some sense of whether she was the tech illusionist's friend or foe. But Amelia was nothing if not good at her job and my shoulders slumped as the Inquisitor's icy veneer remained in place. Can't you at least tell me where he is? I pleaded. I've been worried sick. Something crossed Amelia's features. Sympathy, maybe. But it was gone in a flash, shrugging, she shook her head. I'm not at liberty to say. A flash of ginger behind Amelia caught my eye, and I cleared my throat to cover the distraction. Well, you just make sure he knows he can call on me at any time. You do let folks make phone calls these days, don't you? Of course. Amelia cocked her head. Now, if you don't mind, we've got to get this show on the road. The back of one van slammed shut, and I startled despite myself. With no other cards to play, I wrung my hands as I returned to the truck, hoping I'd hear from the tech illusionist sometime soon. Gus slipped in beside me, and I pulled away from the computer store just as one van fired up to leave. I knew something was wrong, really wrong. They have him, Gus. No, they don't, Gus arranged himself on the passenger seat. I got close enough to hear two of the louts discussing his likely location. They believe the computers will yield nothing and that he's probably out of the country by now. Then why? I chewed my lip as I reflected on my discussion with Amelia. She's playing me. Probably has me pegged as an accomplice. Which you are. My eyes welled with tears as I turned onto the road which would take me home. Gus was right. If Ash was guilty of committing crimes against the establishment, he did at least some of it at my behest. And now he was. Gone? In hiding? Somehow I pictured him sitting in first class on the way to some tropical island, it was probably optimistic. I need to fix this, I said. He was so worried about me landing in prison over Justine's death. He might have gotten sloppy in covering his tracks. I doubt even Sorka has the know-how to bury this new brand of magical evidence. If they have proof of his misdeeds, I'm afraid there's nothing to be done for it. I scrubbed at the tears sliding down my cheeks with a fist. Not if I say I coerced him into it. Maybe they'll go easier on him. I can't just. This is no time to do anything rash. We must consider this carefully before taking any action. First, I would advise we locate this illusionist, which will be no mean feat if the Inquisition is already in pursuit. I'd imagine an illusionist would have the skill to obscure his presence from most tracking spells. Then how are we supposed to find him? I huffed. We are friends and not foes. That gives us the advantage. Heaving a deep breath, I hit the gas and gripped the steering wheel as we passed the last buildings on the outskirts of town on the journey home. The prospect of a long night of conferring with an undead skull who may or may not have a magical suggestion up its metaphorical sleeve wasn't comforting, and if I knew anything about Ash by now, it was that I wouldn't find a trace of him connected to modern means of communication. After pulling up at the house and jumping out of the truck in the darkening twilight, I stomped to the back door and let go of the screech that was threatening to explode out of my chest. Gus slunk into the house through his cat flap, and I paced the paved area of the patio. 
Sorka still gave me the heebie-jeebies after briefly possessing my body a few weeks back, and our communication had been curt and infrequent since. I knew Gus would bring the crow ancestor up to speed on the latest drama, and for that at least I was grateful. Perhaps it was the screech, or maybe the pacing which caused the sensor light to flick on and off, but within minutes my other magical companion came within view. Billy the Bunyip, an ancient water spirit native to Australia, stalked over and sat at the edge of the patio. You are troubled. It's Ash, he's missing, and the Inquisition is after him. Your magical associate in town? Billy made a low rumbling sound in his throat and shook droplets of water from his seal-like fur, who was in the company of this Inquisition as I recall. Billy had met Ash and Amelia only once when they'd arrived to find us in the aftermath of a battle with a djinn. The water spirit had trouble grasping the relationships between mortals at the best of times, and trying to come up with a way to describe Ash's espionage activities seemed beyond words. He worked for the Inquisition, but also spied on them, which means he's in a lot of trouble, and he did quite a bit of that spying to help me out. They consider him a traitor of sorts. Something like that, I agreed. A troubling development. I expect Gus is conferring with the sorceress. He expressed the latter with a certain disdain. Billy couldn't abide my undead ancestor, who had trapped her soul inside her skull upon death to achieve immortality, but she'd been useful so far, four centuries of tagging along with her living descendants made her something of a spell repository. I don't know what else to do, I said a little defensively. How am I supposed to find a person who doesn't want to be found? Perhaps you should respect his wishes. Billy cocked his head. Unless you have means in which to solve his problems. I, I halted and blinked. What did a green witch have to offer someone like Ash? I'd been trying to drop off the enchanted jasmine I'd ensorcelled by way of thanks all week. A magical plant would not get him out of this mess. It was times like these when long-buried feelings of magical inadequacy bubbled up to the surface. I'm all the guy has. Billy made a gurgling sound, approximating sympathy, and I resumed my pacing. I was assuming the Inquisition knew everything about Ash's online activities. But even if it was just a fraction, say, the digging he'd done to get into the police database for me, it was enough. And how someone, even a highly skilled witch, could destroy that sort of evidence and any memory of it was beyond my comprehension. Sure, I could turn the occasional illusion trick, but my tech skills were pedestrian at best. Mixing all those ones and zeros with my dyscalculia would be a recipe for disaster. The cat flap creaked, and I turned to Gus who slipped out. It occurred to me that if Sorka had come up with something I should go inside to confer with her directly, but I folded my arms instead and arched an eyebrow at my familiar. Unfortunately, Sorka's skill with this new brand of wizardry is lax, but we agreed on a charm which I used to employ when the postal service was unreliable. This doesn't involve astral projection, does it? No, though the affinity with spirit would help the spell along. If Ash isn't too far away, I believe you could manage it. In life during the late 1800s, my now kitty familiar was the kinetic switch of the family. If you really got him going about the past, he would boast about being the driving force in the U.S. behind folks who spoke publicly about things like psychokinesis or levitating tables and whatnot. But before they popularized it, Augustus Theodore Crow spent his time drinking, gambling and turning parlor tricks as he traveled the country and we had learned in our time together that I would never walk in his matter moving footsteps. What is it, then? Magic message? Nothing quite so complex. It would be a feat even for me without means of a material connection. No, long before telephones were something you carried around in your pocket, we would cast a summoning to those we wished to see urgently. Summoning? Like ghosts and things? He speaks of soul-speaking, Billy interjected, when vast distances are to be crossed. I chewed my lip and sank into a rattan chair. Telepathy wasn't something I used much beyond communication with the three non-humans in the house. Even then, I tended to talk out loud.
So, a spell to boost the signal, so to speak. Essentially, even without means to locate the tech illusionist, you can communicate a need of him. Whether he responds is another matter. What does the spell call for? Sounds like something that would involve personal items to lock onto him. The wrong way of looking at it, I should think. Gus lipped onto the table. No, what is useful in situations such as these is an effect which simply reminds you of them. I blinked and considered my options. Aside from my laptop and phone, I reached into my purse and pulled out a business card for Ash's computer store. Holding it up, I gave Gus a questioning look. I think this'll do. We shall see, said my familiar. Chapter 3 He made it sound so simple, but even after sketching out runes in charcoal across uneven pavers for the tenth time under Gus's scrutiny, I wasn't even close. Rounded, I said. I tossed the piece of charcoal across the patio in frustration. I'm never going to get this right. It was nearing midnight, and the urge to go to bed and hope Ash would turn up under his own steam was real, barring the appearance of some mystic runic stencils and a smooth concrete surface to work on, the feat seemed just about impossible. Perhaps you can find a picture on that interweb of yours to work from. It'd help if you could name half of these in terms that a modern witch could understand. Whoever heard of a Nothai's rune? It turned out quite a few folks had, and giving up on the patio, I tracked out with a torch to the garage and cleared a space of crack-free concrete under a pile of boxes. It was a small circle, barely enough room to sit cross-leg inside. But Gus was finally satisfied that the runes were fit for purpose after scrawling the runes a few times, and even Billy sat on his haunches crowded between gardening tools and a wheelbarrow to watch with interest. Now clear your mind and hold the image of the card in your mind, Gus instructed. Channel the intense need you have of his presence into the runes. If a clear mind was close to asleep and still peeved at the rune sketching exercise, I had it in spades. But this was too important to mess up, so I held the card lightly between my fingers and closed my eyes to let my shoulders relax. Letting go of the bodily sensations which anchored me to the present, I banished the feeling of freezing cold concrete seeping into my body. I homed in on the place within my soul where magic waited for my touch. Rune work was delicate. Go too fast and the symbols would twist and smoke, too slow and they would melt into unrecognizable blob shapes. I drew power gently and let it well up inside and pictured Ash's business card like it was a direct line to the guy. I had to know he was okay. I needed to know how I could help. Power spilled out and over the markings, washing over them in raw energy. I didn't need to open my eyes to feel the runes drinking it in. My task was to funnel the energy where it needed to go and picture Ash the guy who helped to save my bacon so many times and really never asked for anything in return. Need, I let the feelings of guilt, shame, and loyalty bubble to the forefront of my mind, inviting an element of chaos into the casting and pushed it out into the circle. A static energy tingled over my skin and when the air pressure surrounding me seemed to pop, I let go and snapped my eyes open. Did it work? I blinked and inspected the charcoal runes which radiated heat but appeared intact. Steam wafted up from the circle. Only one way to be sure, I'm afraid. Gus gave the charcoal a tentative sniff. Once you hear from your man. I rubbed my eyes and heaved a deep breath. If he wants to be found. Suppressing a yawn. I left Bill to cover the last couple of hours before closing the nursery to meet his niece Megan for an interview over a cup of coffee. Bill had been pleased to announce that the college student was keen as mustard that morning, and after speaking with her myself, I thought he was right in his assessment, and if I could get her started in the next few weeks, the long weekend might work out. Providing I spent no more sleepless nights casting spells or running around the countryside looking for ash. He was supposed to be coming to me. It occurred to me on the way to the local cafe, Shannon's, that I'd never been on the other end of a job interview and that I should have put more thought into what I wanted to know as a prospective employer. 
This wasn't the typical interview situation, but I chided myself for being lax in preparation. What questions did I need to ask? It didn't help that I expected to see Ash walk into the store every time the bell over the door jingled. When I considered what I wanted out of an employee, it was easy to identify what I needed. Someone reliable, friendly with customers, and the nose to navigate a point-of-sale system. I wasn't naive enough to expect any gardening know-how, or even the ability to tell the difference between a rosebush and a gardenia, but a willingness to learn wouldn't go astray. When I pulled in on the street in front of the cafe, I astutely ignored the computer store further down. With the lunch rush long since over, the cafe appeared almost empty as I trotted inside, and after glancing around spotted a redhead in the corner who met my eye with a hopeful smile. Taking a deep breath, I headed over, amused by her crisp, white shirt and notepad and pen resting on the table. It was a far cry from my usual khaki pants and polo shirt, which were grubby from the repotting I'd achieved earlier in the afternoon. But I wouldn't scorn someone for putting their best foot forward, and held out a hand with a smile as I cocked my head. Megan? She took my hand and stood as she cleared her throat. Thank you for meeting with me so quickly. I waved a dismissive hand and asked if she'd like a coffee before putting in an order with the barista behind the counter. A pot of tea was already en route to the table, and I noted the girl's shaking hands as she poured herself a cup when I sat down. I wanted to keep this very casual, Megan, I started. I'm probably as new to hiring people as you are to sitting interviews. But when I was talking to your uncle yesterday about having another set of hands around the store, he told me you were looking for something to get you by while you're studying. Megan nodded and blinked green eyes. That would be great. I've been looking for something that fits in with my timetable, but there aren't many jobs around here outside of 9 to 5. I have Fridays free though and can work weekends or other odd hours. And how are your studies going? Bill told me something about business. I accepted a mug of latte from the server and took a sip. A degree in commerce, Megan clarified. It's mostly online, but I do travel to Melbourne sometimes for certain lectures. I'm keeping up with the work, but it's only the first year. I've got another two to go. Which meant I could hold on to her for the foreseeable future. That's interesting. Is there much call for commerce degrees in Myrtle Glen? Megan snorted with laughter, then sobered with a chagrined look. Sorry, but no, outside of working at the bank or starting my own business around here, it would be as useful as a chocolate teapot. After I'm done studying, I'll move somewhere closer to the city. There was something about the gleam in her eye that put me in mind of my own ambitions to get out of Tumbling Springs as soon as I could when I was her age. Not that I was doing anything as fancy as a commerce degree at the time. I wondered if her itchy feet would likewise take her to another small town, or if she would indeed hit it big in the city. Sounds like you've got it figured out, I smiled. So in the meantime you think you're up to wrangling plants and giftware while taking orders for compost. I'm a fast learner, Megan took a deep breath. I promise I'll work hard and won't let you down. I've just done an assessment on customer experience and analytics, and I know almost everyone in town. My IT skills are good, my written skills are even better, and I've already downloaded an app which will help me figure out which plants are which. She held up her phone and opened an app, which flashed with a picture of a person holding up a camera to a parlor palm. Ha! was all I could manage as my eyebrows furrowed at the screen. Now, if you could teach your uncle how to use something like that, you'd be my savior. Megan's nose wrinkled in amusement. I doubt my uncle knows what an app is. I snickered at that and traced the rim of my latte mug with a finger. Taking the initiative to find a tool which helped with her gardening deficits was a big point in the kid's favor. I doubted I could find a better candidate for the job if I tried. But I had to be open with her about my position, so I took a steadying breath and sat a little straighter in my seat. I'm not sure how much Bill told you about the job. I've been running the place for a while now, but have only just launched the nursery and gift shop. 
My plans are to start properly opening over the weekends to coax in people passing through, but I need to make sure the business can handle it. My thought was to have someone come on casually as a trial, then reassess in say four weeks or so. Megan gave me a considering look, and I could almost see the wheels turning in her mind. Of course. The benefit needs to outweigh the cost. I understand that. I should think so, with your commerce degree and all. I don't want to lead you down the garden path as it were, so if you'd prefer to go for something more solid, I understand. This country music festival in a few weeks will be a good opportunity to see what traffic I can get through the place. Megan's eyes darted, but she slowly nodded. I've taken classes on marketing and digital adaption. If you like, I can help with getting the word out there. That wouldn't be your job. I ventured. I don't plan on using your other skills as currency for my own benefit. It would be to my benefit to keep the job. Megan shrugged. And it would be a win-win if I could use it as a case study for an assessment. Somehow I thought the ideas bubbling in Megan's mind were a little more substantial than putting some flags and signage at the end of the street to attract attention. But if she could use Garden Gate Nursery as a test case for an assignment, who was I to turn her down? So long as it didn't get out of hand, I took another gulp of coffee and made what I hoped wasn't an impulsive business decision. You've got a deal. Four weeks of Fridays and Saturdays, and so long as the bottom line picks up enough to cover your wage, we can move to permanent part-time. I offered my hand across the table. Thank you so much. Megan took my hand with a quizzical look. Not Sundays? I'll cover Sundays, I said. Your uncle is right about one thing. Working or studying seven days a week is a good way to run yourself into the ground. Besides, I'm sure you've got homework to keep up with. If we make this work, I'll drop Fridays altogether. Megan smiled sheepishly, and she struck me as the overachiever type who found self-care and rest overrated. We agreed she would come into the store at 8 a.m. sharp the following Friday, and I quickly finished my latte before leaving. Providing things on the ash front didn't get too out of hand, I was sure I could have her up to scratch come time for the long weekend. On the street, I hesitated before heading to my beat-up truck. Clenching my jaw, I cast a glance at the computer shop and gripped my keys in my palm. It was broad daylight, and against my better judgment, I strode toward the darkened shop front with a mind to discern whether forced entry would be feasible. After our break in activities together recently, he might have assumed I'd try the same with his store, and perhaps had left me a clue. When I reached for the door handle, I jumped back with a screech, and an older gentleman passing by stopped to peer at me. You okay, love? he asked. I shook my smarting hand with a sharp hiss and blinked my watering eyes. The handle zapped me, I explained. The man frowned at the door and tentatively tapped a finger against it. From the lack of reaction it was clear he hadn't suffered the same. Static electricity, maybe. Shop's been shut up all week. I reckon the fellow who runs it is closing down. The wife told me half the stuff in there got carted out yesterday. Right, I agreed. Guess I'll have to get my phone fixed someplace else. Bloody phones. The guy shook his head with a grin. That's why I won't have any of those new ones, which Numpty decided to make them out of glass anyway. I made a show of smiling and thanked him for stopping before making my excuses and heading back to the truck. My fingers still tingled, and it absolutely wasn't static electricity which had caused the shock. That door had been warded against witches. Either Amelia Ward didn't trust me not to come back snooping around or thought Ash might turn up eventually. I just hoped I hadn't activated the magical equivalent of a GPS on my person. Not that Amelia would find my day-to-day -day activities all that exciting anyhow. Chapter 4 Megan's first day had been a runaway success, and after she left for the day at 4 p.m., I said as much to her uncle. Clever kid, that one. Reckon she's going places. Bill rubbed his chin and hung the truck keys on their hook under the counter. Did you hear there's been another fire in town? Past it coming back from that delivery on Sutherland Street. No, 
I frowned and recalled some customers out front chatting about a fire which I'd assumed was the one from the week before. Wasn't the last one just a week ago? Last Wednesday night. This one went up in the early hours this morning apparently. Completely destroyed. Old Greg Martin lived there on his own since his wife passed a few years back. He was a good bloke, too. Dead? I asked. Afraid so. Bill heaved a deep breath. We've either got a bloody firebug on our hands, or the power suppliers have a lot to answer for. Two houses don't just go up in flames like that, without there being some funny business going on. I was familiar with the term firebug, an Aussie description of a serial arsonist, but that didn't feel right. Don't they usually start fires in the bush? Burning a house with someone inside is plain murder. Usually. Bill shrugged. Who knows what goes on inside these morons' heads? So, I guess they're still establishing the cause? Won't be official for a few days, but mark my words, it'll be another electrical fire. Scary, I sighed as I slipped a banking envelope under my arm. I might just cut the power before I go to sleep tonight. I know I will be. But you better get that over to the bank before they close. I'll lock up. I nodded my agreement and told Bill to call in the morning if he got stuck with any orders. I'd arranged for Megan to come in for the three-hour shift and thought she would have better luck troubleshooting any issues than her uncle. In fact, I was pretty confident she could. She'd been watching me like a hawk all day and poking around in the system in quiet moments. Gus fell into stride with me as I crossed the lot toward my truck, and I blinked down at him in surprise. Haven't seen much of you today, mister. A Tom Cat was lingering by the machinery. I kept watch for most of the day after moving him along. My mouth twisted into a smirk, but I didn't tease my familiar. Human soul or no, the influence of primal feline instinct made his kitty observations sound so normal. In his own way, he was doing his part for the business, and if I pointed out how ridiculous it sounded it would only embarrass him. Megan's working out well, I observed as I opened the truck door to let him in. And from the sound of it, she's a cat person. She was looking forward to seeing you. Ugh. I despise cat people, he grunted, as he hopped up into the passenger seat. We'll see. I rolled my eyes as I climbed in beside him and got the engine going. I don't suppose you spotted Ash lurking out there somewhere? Not a whiff. Gus arranged himself into a ball as we pulled out from the lot. We should consider another summoning with different runes over the weekend. You think it didn't work? I asked almost hopefully. Or maybe he was out of range? It is difficult to say for certain. Perhaps the illusionist ignored your call, but with another push he may change his mind. Great. I puffed out my cheeks and rubbed my eye as I turned toward the main street of Myrtle Glen. I'd spent the entire week on high alert waiting for him to surface, and I'd never been much good at sitting on my hands. There was one other possibility, but I had to hold on to the hope that he would call if the Inquisition had him. Maybe if I called Grandma she could. Elbow her way in as an arcane council member from a different jurisdiction and demand they drop their case. Gus gave me a flat stare. I'm sure she would do just that if you were the one in trouble though I doubt her reach is that strong. As it stands, you may very well end up in trouble as an accomplice. Don't doubt that your grandmother would sooner bury the man to keep you safe than go out on a limb to protect him. I let that sink in. While it sounded harsh, my grandma was a hard woman, and I knew deep down Gus was right. I was in this on my own, and had to rely on my own resources to set this right. After pulling up at the bank, I grabbed the deposit envelope and made to get out of the truck, but before I slipped from the seat, a silhouette down on the corner by the dentist caught my eye. Even from behind, the black pants suit and glossy black hair was unmistakable. I glanced back dumbly at Gus and pointed in Amelia Ward's direction. Gus jumped on the dash as I left the door open and marched toward the Inquisitor. It appeared her attention was caught up with the local constable, Christopher Lewis, and from his slack features, I knew I could butt in without raising any questions. 
fancy seeing you here. I grinned as I sidled around the Inquisitor and waved an absent hand in front of the constable's face which didn't affect his vague countenance. Must be serious if you're putting our good officer here under your thrall. Amelia arched a perfectly groomed eyebrow at me. I'm working, Cat. Do you mind? My relationship with Amelia had improved since I'd arrived in Australia and she'd been conscripted into the investigation over Aunt Tabby's death. Heck, she even gave me some pointers just weeks ago on what I might do to establish who the actual murderer of Justine Shaw was. But I held no illusions that if I got between the woman and her vocation, she would make a bitter enemy, which begged the question. Twice in two weeks, last week at Ash's store and now here with Constable Lewis, I blinked. On the day there's been another house fire, incidentally. Is that why you're picking his brain? Because last time I checked, the Inquisition only got involved in murders involving magic. And from what I'm hearing these were electrical fires. The sleuth is at it again, huh? Amelia drew a terse breath. What is it that you want, Cat? A recommendation to Stella to give you a job interview or something? I folded my arms and huffed, only to know, as a card-holding member of the magical community, if there's a threat of the supernatural variety in my town. Your town? She gasped. You moved here less than a year ago, and trust me, I'd never even heard of the place before then. You're not some honorary member of the Inquisition. I don't owe you any explanations. On the face of it, she was right. Back home, I wouldn't dare dream of throwing my weight around with agents of the Arcane Council. But it didn't help my rising sense of indignation flaring. So, should I head home to cut the power in case my house goes up in flames while I sleep or not? Amelia's lip twitched. As far as a tell, this was the closest I imagined she would ever come. Maybe. Look, I can't talk to you about any of this, Cat. Please, just trust me to do my job. And Ash? I should trust you with him, too? We both know he isn't a bad guy, and yet you're cleaning out his shop like he's on your most wanted list. Amelia sniffed and put a hand on her hip. One thing I learned real quick in this job is to never assume. You ought to try it sometime. Now if you don't mind, the longer I leave this guy in a stupor, the worse the headache will be in the morning. I looked up at Chris who still appeared vague, but I thought the lines around his eyes looked a little strained. Perhaps the better course of action would be to pay the constable a visit myself, with some tea to soothe his head, and see what I could wrangle out of him myself. Sans the stupefaction wand. Fine, I grunted. I need to get to the bank anyhow. Leaving the Inquisitor to her work, I let my mind swim with possibilities as I went through the motions of depositing cash in the bank. She was in town about the fire, that much was clear. That I'd wrangled a maybe out of her at all was remarkable, and meant there was a very real possibility that I'd get caught up in whatever was behind the arson, but I still didn't see what that had to do with Ash. He was the last person I'd accuse of setting fire to the houses of two, apparently unremarkable, mundanes while they slept inside. After stepping out of the bank, I wasn't surprised to see that Amelia had vanished, and that I couldn't see Constable Lewis anywhere nursing a sore head. I was on my own with more questions than answers again, and I had a date with my neighbor Kelly at the pub for dinner. For a scarce minute I thought about cancelling but knew it would only result in me pacing the four walls at home for the night ruminating on events. At least at the pub I might hear more about the victims and whether there were any connections between them that I wasn't privy to. On the trip home to change, I relayed the exchange to Gus who didn't press me for information and agreed it gave us something new to consider. I had no doubt he would spend the evening devising a cunning plan of sorts to inspect the blackened crime scenes for clues, but I couldn't see how that would be useful. What I needed to know was what these people had to do with Ash and hope the two anomalies were simply coincidence. Because if I had it all wrong and it wasn't the hacking activities that Ash was in trouble with, then things might be even worse than they appeared. After taking a shower and leaving offerings of roasted chicken and beer for the other members of my household, I traveled back into Myrtle Glen, where Kelly was already waiting for me. 
It didn't escape me that her wholesale flower business was shaky with the local florist murdered, and I wanted to support her however I could. Just like she'd been there for me with the launch of the nursery. When I pulled in at the Royal Hotel, the cars crammed in the lot told me it would be busier inside than our usual Tuesday night engagement. I spotted Kelly's van though and squeezed the truck in by the dumpster at the far end. I supposed it was no wonder there was a big turnout, people had died in our small community, and I doubted I was the only one who hoped to learn the why of it. As I strode up the ramp toward the double doors at the back, I bumped into a figure coming the other way with their head turned to wave goodbyes to whoever they left inside. Grabbing for the handrail, I twisted around with a squeak, then grabbed a hand to prevent the person from tripping over. When surprise turned to recognition, I realized I was staring into the green eyes of Travis Larkins, landscaper and customer who'd asked me out for a drink just two weeks past after we'd both been cleared of murder. Geez, sorry. His eyes rounded. Cat. Of all the people to knock over. My hand still gripped his as I caught my breath, and I gave him a sheepish grin. You should be thankful it wasn't some little old lady. His eyes flickered down to our clasped hands and he swallowed. I let go and he cleared his throat and held his hands to his hips a little awkwardly. Too right. How've you been? I just got back from Sydney last night. Travis had told me he was taking time off work and heading interstate for the funeral of his ex-girlfriend a couple of weeks back. It was an odd situation to be in but after being cleared of the murder he'd simply said he owed it to her family to show up. They'd never wronged him, as he put it, and I suppose there was still the business of wrapping up her affairs, including their shared house. I'm fine, I said, nodding as though to assure myself I was. How are you holding up? Travis drew a deep breath and shrugged. I'm, it's okay, funerals are always hard but Justine's mum will come down next week to start packing things, which is only right, I guess. I'll help her in any way I can. I only nodded, feeling fiercely like a Jezebel despite the fact that Travis and Justine had been over before she died. It was Justine's transgressions that had ended it and ultimately led to the murder. But it still didn't feel right that I was looking forward to the promised date with the man once things had settled down. It must be terrible for them. And for you, I said, as I folded my arms. Travis only nodded, his face somber and tinged with what I interpreted as regret. Business driving you to drink? He jerked his thumb toward the pub as he changed the subject. Not yet, I chuckled. I'm just meeting Kelly here for dinner. If she's managed to get us a table, that is. Well, I won't keep you then. I think I saw her in a booth. I'll come past next week once I've sorted out which job I'm working on next. Sure, looking forward to it. We shared smiles and sidled around one another as we each left in the opposite direction. Looking forward to it. Did I come off as sounding too eager I wondered as I stepped inside the pub looking for Kelly. The last thing I wanted to do was put any pressure on the guy to hurry up with the date. In fact, it all felt like it was way too fast anyway. I'm sure being spotted out together would get tongues flapping in the small town, and I was sure neither of us wanted that kind of attention. No, we both needed time. The question was whether we could keep things friendly without being too friendly when he dropped by the store all the time. What was that saying? Good things come to those who wait. I really needed to take a good dose of that advice all round. Chapter 5 Kelly was indeed sitting in a booth along the wall and looked relieved when I slid in across from her with two gin and tonics. I've had three people ask me if they could use the table, she grunted. Anyone would think this is the only place in town to get a meal. Well, no wonder, with what's been happening. Folks probably think the wiring is safer here. Kelly shook her head and sighed. Awful, isn't it? It's just been one thing after another in this town, like we're cursed or something. I blinked as my throat froze before realizing that it was just a figure of speech. Kelly knew nothing about magic, or the very real possibility of curses. Did you know the people? Greg and Shauna, was it?
Sharon, Kelly corrected. And yeah, she ran the candle shop next to the op shop where mum works. Greg used to be a plumber before he retired. Played lawn bowls with dad every Thursday. My condolences. Did they? Know each other or something? Kelly took a sip of her drink and shrugged. I didn't know either of them particularly well, but I don't remember ever seeing them together. Dad didn't say anything about it this morning after he got the news. Kelly was definitely not the busybody type, and unless it was common knowledge, I didn't expect her to have much by way of intel. If I wanted information, someone like Marlene or Cindy Pike were better bets. Those two couldn't keep their noses out of other people's business. Well, I just hope there's an explanation that comes to light sooner rather than later. Bill seemed pretty rattled by it. How are you anyway? Is that greenhouse back in order yet? The police had searched my neighbor's industrial-sized greenhouse when they suspected we had a hand in the recent poisoning of florist, Justine Shaw. Checking the hydroponic setup for unplugged hoses was tedious work on that scale. It's better, but I've got some plants looking a little sad. If anything, I've got too much stock on my hands at the moment. I've been talking to a few of the gift shop owners who are thinking about taking up flowers now, but it'll take a couple of weeks to get the supplies they'll need. That's promising, though. Have you got any ideas on what you'll do with the surplus? I scanned the menu and decided on pasta. There's always the markets. I've got two lined up this weekend and spent the afternoon bundling bouquets. I guess I'll sell them cheaper, but even then, it's better than wholesale prices if you take out the time to get them ready. Let me know if you need any help. I'm more than happy to man a stall or get them wrapped up. Kelly shook her head. Mom's helping this weekend, but I'll let you know if I need to get more ready for Sunday. If you have any business cards, I'm happy to have them on the table while I'm there. And back at you. If you have anything you want to put in the store, I'll sell it at cost. Not sure how many I'd move, but I'll do my best. Kelly nodded and waved a menu. Know what you want yet? If we don't order something soon, we'll get moved on. Glancing around the crowded pub, I had to agree with her assessment. Folks standing at the bar were eyeing those sitting, and I thought our meal would be brief if Kelly had to get up early in the morning. Grabbing my purse, I said. Feels like a carb night tonight, no regrets. No regrets might have been an over-exaggeration, I mused, as I popped the button of my khaki pants on the drive home. The ravioli had been delicious but sat at the bottom of my stomach like a lead weight. It had been nice to talk shop with Kelly, though, even if it didn't turn up anything on the arson front. The air in the pub had been different, more somber, than the recent gossipy events of murder and disappearances. There was nothing saucy about the situation, it was just plain sad. When I rolled up at home, I wondered if Gus had any more thoughts on summonings and sorcery that would keep me up for the rest of the night, or rituals to discern the truth behind the arsons. So long as they didn't need moonlight to work, I was of a mind to leave it for the morning and climb right into bed, but then I noticed the glow of the sensor light from the back of the house and hoped it was Billy grabbing a beer from the fridge and not an intruder. Gripping my keys, I treaded lightly toward the edge of the house and took a steadying breath as I embraced magic from deep within my soul. I stepped around the corner, and it took a second to register the identity of the man sitting on a patio chair drinking a beer next to Billy's hulking form. Ash, I breathed. Where the heck have you been? The lanky tech illusionist raked his fingers through his too long brown hair, and I noticed the dark circles under his eyes and even gaunter cheeks than usual. I crossed the distance between us and threw my arms around his shoulders. Everywhere he murmured into my hair as he returned the hug with an awkward pat to my back. I couldn't risk getting in touch before now. Maybe I still shouldn't have come. I released him and pulled up another seat before glancing at the silent bunyip. Ain't no one getting onto this property without Billy knowing about it and we've got plenty of hiding spots in the swamp. Billy only grunted an affirmative and unscrewed the top of another beer. Tell me about it. I came in through the back, Ash said ruefully. 
I blinked at Ash's sodden muddy sneakers and snorted, though I doubted he would have been able to traverse the swamp in the dark without Billy guiding him through. I have so many questions, I sighed, but maybe you want to start at the beginning, and we can fill in the blanks later. Ash nodded wearily and took a gulp from his beer. It's been a long couple of weeks. I thought if I got myself off the map things would settle down, but after the second fire I knew I had to come back. I'm being framed, Cat, and I doubt this will be the last fire in town while I'm on the run. Framed, I echoed, then clamped my mouth shut so Ash could continue. Ever heard of Patrick Jones? I frowned and shook my head. The only Patrick I'd ever met was a guy who distributed hydroponic equipment in California. He's pretty notorious in Australia, Magical Mafia. His brand of magic was enchanting, and his last string of crimes involved exploding mobile phones. He's now serving eight life sentences in a top-security Inquisition prison. But then there's the matter of all his gear. Which is where you come in? I quirked an eyebrow. Yup. Ash rubbed his eyes. The contract work I was doing for the Inquisition? A lot of it involved setting up security for a vault in the middle of nowhere. Stella Marshall didn't even want the information stored on their central servers. The Magical Mafia in Melbourne has a lot of reach. She didn't want her people getting strong-armed into giving them the location and codes. I held my tongue though a dozen questions swirled in my mind. Was Ash forced to give up the information? Did this mean his hacking activities on my account weren't discovered like I feared? What I rigged up should have been impenetrable. An isolated building with its own data room, all communications on paper stored at another location. There isn't a trace of its existence online. Ash rubbed the bridge of his nose and closed his eyes. They shouldn't have been able to get in, which means it must have come from inside the Inquisition. What did they take? I asked gently as Ash fell into a haunted silence. Ash blinked. A rotary phone. The vault is like one big series of lockboxes. If they got anything else I couldn't guess what, but it was when I got a call, when was it? The night before your launch, I knew it was the phone. It was too dangerous to destroy outright, they suspected it would explode but one of the Inquisition's enchanters was able to rig it so that it played a certain tune if anyone answered its call. So how is it you're here alive? I asked. Ash frowned, then realization dawned in his eyes. Sorry. The phone was designed to make outgoing calls to target mobile phones. Once it made the connection, it would take hold of the software and lie dormant until someone plugged it in to charge. Then it uses electricity to create a surge big enough to start a fire. Extremely complex sorcery. Once I answered the call, I dropped my phone in a bucket of water and buried it in my backyard. My mouth worked as I tried to process the information. Then confusion sharpened into outrage. Wouldn't it have been more useful for them to make the darn thing give clear instructions not to plug the cell phone into the wall when someone picked up? I snapped. Two people have died this week. Ash held my eye and cocked his head. You really think anyone would have taken something like that seriously? In the age of scam calls, would someone really destroy their phone because an automated message tells them to? The tune is the Inquisition's code for high alert security breach. Everyone in their ranks knows what it means. But nobody else? Even regular magic users? I folded my arms. That's ridiculous. Ash shrugged. The phone was never used to target mundanes and jaded as it sounds. The people it did target either took another mafia player off the board or targeted Inquisition agents. Things are different in the city. There's a war waged between the good and evil of mage kind every day. The only code they all follow is to keep it from mundanes. I shook my head, unable to comprehend the politics of it all. But that could come later. So, when they couldn't take you out, they started killing random folks to set you up for murder. Not exactly random, but yeah, that about sums it up. They need someone to take the fall for it. They, I said. You think it was organized in-house? 
Ash stood and started pacing, and I spotted Gus who sat quietly beside a potted bay tree. I guessed he'd been sitting there the whole time, but he and Billy kept quiet as Ash appeared to collect his thoughts. It could be organized, but there would have been easier ways for the Inquisition to hold onto the phone for their own uses, yeah? They could have just fudged the records to say their enchanters safely destroyed it. No, I think there was a lone wolf behind it, either using it for their own purposes or selling it off to the highest bidder. Who then? I pressed. There were two people I know were aware of the operation. Sure, there would have been higher-ups, but two people I know had been to the vault. Stella Marshall and her most trusted in-house tech illusionist, Ray Beecham. Didn't you say? He was the only one. And there were strict protocols in place. He worked on the security inside the vault, and I took care of the perimeter. That way neither of us had both keys, as it were. So, it's more likely to be Stella? She had access to both? Ash dropped back into his seat and hung his head in his hands. I don't know, I just have this gut feeling that it wasn't her. And it seems stupid, you know? The place is full of all kinds of powerful items. I can think of five that I would have chosen ahead of that thing, which wouldn't leave such a blatant pattern behind. Maybe for the magical community, but if they wanted it to target mundanes it could be just the thing they were looking for. But you said the victims weren't exactly random. Did you know them? Not exactly. But I can guess how they're connected. You remember the potions which Zoe I told you about? The first victim was her boss. The other was her neighbor. Chapter 6 Zoe the Potions Witch From the cow eyes I remembered on Ash's face when he spoke about her a while back, I'd suspected the woman had caught his romantic attention. I'd always meant to make her acquaintance as the only other witch in town, but since arriving in Australia, I hadn't had a burning need for something to be brewed up. So, you think she's involved somehow? I asked evenly. No, Ash stood again and resumed pacing. Maybe. I don't know. Whoever is behind this could be using her circle to frame me. I pressed my lips together and tried to pose the next question with tact because you have a thing for her?" Ash swung around to stare at me, and it took all I had not to give in to the smirk threatening to take hold. But underneath that, a warning light flared in the back of my mind. How much does Zoe know about the work you've been doing? Ash frowned, and his mouth hung open in bewilderment. Nothing. What are you trying to say? Well, if the rotary phone was used on people connected to her, no way. Ash shook his head frantically. She had nothing to do with this. Maybe Stella or Ray found out we were getting close. But that's all it could be. Close. Huh. Well, that sounded like admission enough to me. I'm not trying to shoot down your girlfriend here, but if there are other possibilities, we need to at least consider them. She's not my girlfriend, he said with a dismissive wave of his hand, and she didn't know a thing about it. All I told her was that I had to do a day trip on a contract I was working on. Day trip? There was something Ash was holding back. And the more he resisted, the more likely there was more to it. I thought you said the place was remote. Ash dragged a hand over his face and his jaw flexed. We took a road trip together. Just to get out of town for a while after she had a bad week at work. We stayed in a place a few hours north of the vault on the way back and I left her at the motel while I met Stella for the final inspection of the perimeter. So that means she knew you were on some secret squirrel job in the area on that day. I licked my lips. Have you had any contact with her since you disappeared? Ash opened his mouth and froze as he appeared to grapple with what he said next. Or, Stella was keeping tabs on me that day and was aware Zoe was back at the motel. If she's connected to this, it's my fault. And there was the crux of it, I mused, as I refrained from sighing. There was clearly nothing I could say that would convince him otherwise. And if he cared for the woman as much as I imagined he did, it was likely he would run in head first to condemn himself and save her from any further harm. So what are you thinking? I switched my brain to pragmatics. 
And how can I help set this right? Right? You've got to be kidding. I'm up against the Inquisition. I either hand myself in or start a new life somewhere. I stared at the tech illusionist who had done so much to help me in my times of need. Now that he was in boiling water, I had little to offer, and if he saw those two choices as his only options, I suspected it wouldn't be long before he reached out to Zoe. You're going to ask her to go with you, aren't you? My mouth quirked into a sad smile. He held my eyes for a moment before looking away. I've got resources, you don't get into this business without having an escape plan, but I can't do it if she's at risk. Well, you can't just go and knock on her door, stay here tonight, and we can figure out a way for you two to rendezvous us in the morning. Too risky. I either get Zoe out tonight or leave for a few days. I bought a tablet which I configured with a new email address so you and I can keep in touch. Ash produced a slim tablet in a hard case from a backpack and set it on the patio table. It was a relief to have some line of communication with the man, but I refused to let him slip away so soon. Amelia Ward was in town today. I bumped into her questioning Constable Lewis. We can't be sure she hasn't decided to make a night of it. No, the safest place for you to be right now is here. I've been rattling her cage about your whereabouts. At this point, I'm the last person she wants to see. Ash snickered. It was the closest thing I'd seen to a smile since I'd discovered him. You thought she had me? At first I did. But Gus here, I pointed to my ginger familiar, slipped into your shop while they were carting out computers and overheard them talking about you, which is why I did the summoning. I kept up the ruse with Amelia for appearance's sake. That spell was weird. Ash made a face. I jumped out of bed in the middle of the night in a cold sweat, and all I could see was your face. I shrugged. You didn't exactly make it easy for me to reach out. Suppose not, he conceded. Maybe you could teach me that one. Could come in handy in times like these. Sure. I stood and slid the back door open. So long as you agree to let me feed you and put you up in the spare room tonight. Ash's eyes flickered to Billy, appearing to weigh the water spirit's ability to keep unwanted visitors out. Under scrutiny, the bunny up stood and arched his back in a feline movement, then bared his fangs. You shall sleep without fear of discovery was all he said before bounding off into the darkness. Guess it beats finding a motel that's open across the border, Ash conceded. And you'll help me get in touch with Zoe? I sighed and nodded wearily. As much as I thought my friend had the wool firmly pulled over his eyes about this girl, I owed him. And it bought me some thinking time on how we might wriggle free of this mess. Not to mention the opportunity to size up this Zoe myself. He has made his choice, Gus said, from his perch on the counter as I gathered ingredients to prepare pancakes. Given his situation, fleeing is hardly an overreaction and he said it himself, he has the resources to disappear and start again. But he didn't do it, I shot back silently, lest I wake the sleeping tech illusionist. We can figure this out. We have three suspects. Stella, this Ray guy, and Zoe. Surely we can do something with that. Once we have the evidence, I'll go to Inquisition HQ myself to negotiate on his behalf. If it doesn't work, then he can run. And how do you propose to deduce which of these three so deftly incriminated our man? I tapped the whisk against the side of the mixing bowl, set it in the sink, then wiggled my fingers. Magic. Gus made a pathetic mewling sound, which I took for a sigh and leaped down from the counter. I have instructed Sorka to keep quiet while we have guests. Any conferring will need to wait. One-to-one -one telepathic conversation with my familiar was one thing, but Sorka's undead soul seemed to take no heed of such privacy. Not that I thought Ash would cause any trouble about my undead necromancer ancestor, but I had to agree with Gus's assessment. The quieter she kept the better, and she must have known it was in her interest since I hadn't heard a whisper from her since Ash arrived the night before. 
I was about to quiz Gus on his thoughts about spells when I heard the padding of feet on the floor and turned to see Ash emerge from the hallway leading off from the kitchen. Morning, I said with a smirk. Did you sleep well? Ash absently smoothed his hair which stuck up at all angles. Blinking, he gave a sleepy nod. Better than expected, actually. It's nice knowing someone's keeping watch, I guess. I popped the button on the kettle and pulled down a mug from the overhead counter. Well, I've got instant coffee and pancakes coming up. My grandma always said nobody should make rash decisions on an empty stomach. Ash narrowed his eyes, then drew the curtains on the sliding door before sitting at the table. Did she say anything about keeping fugitives out of sight? I snorted and turned on the stove. Actually, I was thinking I might charm the windows. If you're going to stay here a while, then it makes sense to fortify. I'll be gone by tonight, Cat, Ash said gently. I don't want to get anyone else into trouble. Nonsense. I haven't seen any wanted posters, so I can't be held accountable for offering you hospitality. Besides, I don't mean to let you give up. Not yet. You've given me two names to work with. If we can find the evidence to implicate them in the crime, you won't have to abandon your entire life so they can get away with it. They've murdered people, Cat. Ash thumped his fist on the table. Don't you see? If they were willing to go to that length, what do you think they'd do to someone who got close to discovering them? Spooning pancake mixture into the fry pan, I gritted my teeth. They won't suspect that it's me who's after them and it's not like they can use the phone trick on me now. I can't let anyone else get hurt because of my mess. No, you're not doing this. Oh, so I'm supposed to live with the fact that the guy who got me off the hook for murder has to spend the rest of his life in hiding while I didn't lift a finger to help. I snapped. I might be a plain old green witch, but that doesn't mean I'm useless. Ash flinched, and I held his eye until the acrid smell of burning reached my nose. Cursing, I grabbed the fry pan off the heat and dumped the whole thing in the sink as tears streamed down my cheeks. I made a coffee in silence, then thumped it down in front of Ash with an accusing look. I'm not saying you're use. Then let me help, I seethed. We can work on this together, or I'll do it myself. And I say two heads are better than one. Ash swallowed and heaved a deep breath. You're too headstrong by half, you know that, right? You can blame Grandma for that one. I pulled up a seat. Now we need a plan. You want to get in touch with Zoe, I'll make it happen. But I'll need to know how to get to Stella and Ray. Ash took a gulp of coffee and rubbed his eyes. I know more about Ray than Stella. Only met him the once, but I got the impression he was pissed that a contractor was brought in on the vault. So... I did some recon. Hacking the hacker? Ash raised his eyebrows at the word hacker and drank some more coffee. Tech illusionists try to keep tabs on each other where we can. His craft is pretty good, but not as good as mine. Measuring his words, I reached for my mug of citrus blend tea on the counter. So you guys were in a measuring contest of sorts? Ash rolled his eyes, hardly. But I take precautions. He tried to shake me up a little online, probably to prove to Stella that I wasn't the man for the job. I let that be and took a sip of tea. What have you got on him? Only his usual habits, a few incriminating online activities he's connected to, that kind of thing. Ash paused. But I do know the bar he frequents every Thursday. An inquisition place. I was tempted to go in with a glamour to see what I could get out of him, but it's too risky. Huh. I pondered on that. You thought he would see right through it? Maybe. Or that he'd suspect once the conversation turned in that direction. It's something to consider. If we could get some spells or a potion which would help loosen his tongue. I stood and tapped my lip thoughtfully. And you know what? I've been putting off having my magic user registration permanently transferred to Australia. I think it's about time I pay a visit to HQ to set the paperwork right. Ash's cheeks paled. What are you suggesting? I don't quite know yet, I said, as I headed to the sink to clean out the fry pan. But we've got until Friday to figure it out. 
Lucky for us that I've just put a new employee on. She can handle the store while I take a trip to Melbourne. In the meantime, we'll get you in touch with Zoe and hit the spell books. Ash remained silent as I scraped the burned pancakes out of the pan and cleaned it to attempt breakfast again. By spell books I meant Sorka, and I hoped my ancestor was listening in on the conversation and was already hatching a plan. Chapter 7 I hadn't been able to convince Ash to stay at my place any longer than it took for Knight to fall and Billy to guide him back through the swamp where his rental car sat in some parking lot along the river. He'd assured me he would be back after checking out some ideas he had on where the paperwork might be located for the vault's security and had warned me not to try anything in the meantime. Anything except reaching out to Zoe, that is, which I'd done on Sunday through Witchy Web on the pretense of needing a potion. She'd only replied on Monday, and we'd agreed to meet after work on Tuesday to talk about it, after I'd insisted we discuss it in person. She probably thought I had an embarrassing hygiene problem or something. I'd kept Ash up to date on the plan to meet with her via the tablet he'd provided, and double-checked my purse for the burner phone he'd provided for Zoe. Bill had already left for the day, so once the clock hit 5 p.m., I locked up and roused Gus from a spot in the waning sun by the wrought iron gates. Ready? I asked. Gus stood and arched his back. Let's order this potion. After climbing into the truck, I checked the route to Zoe's house on my phone and wondered if she'd had time to get home from work. I imagined things were exceptionally difficult on that front for her with her boss passing and thought Zoe must be working with the extended family to keep the business running. Maybe I should bring her something? Would that be weird? Everybody in town knows about the fire. Buying gifts for a suspect? Gus scoffed. I thought you said she was a more likely culprit. I kept seesawing on that. On one hand, I thought Ash's obvious feelings for the woman clouded his perception. But on the other, what motive could she have to plot the theft so cunningly only to use the rotary phone on those around her the minute she had taken it? It was either a case of the world's dumbest criminal or a mastermind who had planned to pin the crime on Ash from the start. Still, if I were in her shoes, I wouldn't have targeted my boss and neighbor and put myself in the limelight. Maybe she is, but we don't know for sure. And if she isn't behind it, I do feel mighty sorry for her. While planning the visit, Gus and I had already ruled out using magic on the potions witch. It was too risky to go about casting, and a witch with her talents would smell something slip to her a mile away. This was an exercise in testing the waters. I wanted to understand how she felt about Ash. Did she really return his feelings, or was this a case of a woman leading a man around by the snout? Let me come in, I'll sniff around while you keep her talking. I don't know, I pulled out of the parking lot and onto the road south, which would take me to her house in a less affluent part of Myrtle Glen. She'll know you're my familiar, it'll seem weird, won't it? Less weird than taking your cat to work every day. Gus had become something of a mascot in the store. Bill didn't openly fawn over him. I sometimes spotted the pair together in the back shed sharing lunch, but the customers were another story. Gus might have pretended he didn't like the cooing and scratches behind the ear when someone happened upon him in the nursery, but he seemed to linger when people were around. Customers usually asked if he was a mauser and were surprised to learn he traveled back and forth each day. Maybe not. I guess Sandy King always got around with that parakeet on her shoulder. I recalled the older witch from back home in Tumbling Springs who perpetually wore sunglasses. Marisa thought she must be a pirate when we were kids. Gus snorted with an internal kitty laugh, and I took a deep breath as I turned down a side road. It didn't matter if Zoe thought I was weird. She probably already did after refusing to give her the details of the supposed potion I needed until we met. And I'd wager none of that would matter once she heard about Ash, regardless of whether she was behind the theft. When I pulled into the narrow street Zoe lived on, the first thing I spotted was the blackened ruins midway down the row of houses, and I pulled up absently while gawking. There wasn't much left of the place, 
with a scorched chimney standing sentinel over broken timber and tin behind a wire mesh fence. I guessed, given the total destruction, it was just lucky that the fire had left the adjacent houses unscathed. But my eyes wandered across the street where two people stood talking, and I groaned as I recognized Amelia Ward. Again, what was with her appearing all over the place? It didn't look like she'd spotted me, but only because she was talking to a man in a hard hat and fluorescent vest who was gesturing to the house as he tapped a clipboard with a pen. The report on the fire, maybe? I doubted Amelia was interested in whatever demolition works would need to take place. Either way, I didn't want her seeing me going into Zoe's place on a secret mission to put her in touch with the man Amelia was looking for. And it was only a matter of time before she glanced my way. Shoot. I thumped the steering wheel in frustration. What am I supposed to do now? You arranged to see this Zoe to procure a potion, did you not? Gus climbed onto my lap to peer over the dash. Seems to me you have nothing to be concerned about, even if the Inquisitor checks out your story. Leaving now, on the other hand, would appear suspicious. He was right. I'd covered my tracks, and if I made a U-turn to leave they would surely spot me. But did that mean I could proceed as planned? I couldn't be sure what magical gizmos Amelia had on her person, and if she used the stun gun she favored on Zoe after I left, would she learn what we spoke about? I was pretty sure Inquisitors weren't allowed to use magic on witches, but what if Amelia was that desperate to learn Ash's location, she decided to bend a couple of rules. Maybe we just go order the potion and get out of here. Amelia could listen in to our conversation if she's got the place under surveillance, and if Zoe's being watched, we can't be certain the phone is safe to use. Paranoia doesn't suit you, Gus quipped. But there may be some risk, yes. Can you fashion a note with instructions to hand to her? I bit my lip and wondered what instructions Ash would give to me if he were in my shoes. I thought he'd probably tell me to skedaddle. But failing that, I grabbed a notebook from the glove compartment and fished a pen from my purse. Ash wants to speak to you. Don't make the call in your house. Don't take any electronic devices with you when you make the call. The Inquisition is after him, but he's being set up. Keep the phone switched off at all times, and if you get a call with a weird tune on your regular phone, do not, under any circumstances, plug it in to charge. Come and see me at the Garden Gate Nursery and Supplies when you can. Tapping the pen on the notebook, I racked my brain on what other details Zoe might need to know. Even if she was the culprit and betrayed the note to the Inquisition, all that could come of it was that Amelia would call Ash instead of Zoe, and he was still on the run and out of reach. A betting a fugitive, I could live with. Having a witch succumb to flames because I didn't warn her was something that would stain my soul forever. Folding the note, I used a hair elastic to secure it around the burner phone and tucked it into my purse. It was game FaceTime. Rather than slink by and hope Amelia didn't see me, it was in my interest to appear as if I was sticking my nose into her business yet again to keep up appearances. The question was how far to take the charade. Let me out first. On second thoughts, I might linger in an accommodating bush to see what I might learn from Amelia's discourse. Mouthing an affirmative, I opened the truck door a crack and Gus slipped from my lap to slink underneath a car on the other side of the street. Adjusting the rear-view mirror I stared at myself hard enough to crack the glass. I could do this. Lying might not be my strong suit, but with Ash's freedom on the line, I'd give the performance of my life. Climbing out of the truck, I kept my eyes on Amelia and thumped the door closed with gusto. That drew both the Inquisitor and her companion's eyes, and I raised my eyebrows as I crossed the distance between us. As I neared the pair I noted the guy didn't have the same glazed look of stupefaction I was used to seeing with Amelia around, but I had no intention of being discreet. Again? I scoffed. What is with this? Does the Inquisition really have the resources to keep you posted here indefinitely? Amelia narrowed her eyes and spoke to the man beside her, whose jaw had dropped in a look of confusion. Excuse me, just one of the family members. I think we're done here anyway. 
The Inquisitor took my arm and marched me down the street out of earshot. I could ask you the same thing, she hissed. Seems every lead I chase these days I find you skulking around. I tugged my arm from her grip and rounded on her. I'm just here to pick up a potion I ordered. Maybe if you let me in on these leads of yours, or what the heck is going on around here I'd stay out of your way. Really? Because I'm of a mind to record you as a person of interest in this case, and if this keeps up, Stella might just agree to an involuntary reading to find out what you know. Oh, it's like that, is it? I huffed. Seems to me like you're hitting dead ends, Inquisitor, and are looking to point the finger to buy yourself more time. And here I thought you had your man safely in custody. What is it then? Not enough evidence to hold him on whatever charges you've dreamed up. Amelia ran her tongue over her teeth. We're going to be talking again real soon. You can count on it. With that, she turned on her heel and strode off to the dark SUV parked in front of the wreckage. I stood with my arms folded and watched a truck roll past with the guy who'd witnessed my tirade doing his best to avoid looking at me. I was of a mind to stand there until Amelia had left, but after climbing into the car, she didn't appear in a hurry to leave. She held a phone to her ear, and I thought maybe she was making good on her threat to entreat Stella into bringing me into Inquisition HQ. So much for Gus listening in. But I thought I handled it okay. I crossed the street, stalked past Amelia's car with a glare, and headed up the driveway of a small brick house with a tiny Toyota parked in the driveway. I only had moments to consider Amelia's more agitated state and what it meant for the investigation when Zoe opened the door before I could even knock. Cat, she cocked her head. At first glance, Zoe could have been the granddaughter of my local post office clerk, Jan Thorpe, with a tie-dye linen dress, risks covered in beaded bracelets, nose ring, and blonde dreadlocks, she appeared New Age spiritualism all over. Somehow my first impression was that she and Ash would make a cute couple. A uh, hi, I said, a little too brightly, thanks for seeing me. Zoe stood aside to let me in and pointed through to a small living room crammed with ornaments, colorful throw rugs, and some vintage vinyl sofas. I sat on the very edge of my seat and stole a glance through the window where I could still see Amelia's SUV parked next door. So, I guess it was about time we bumped into one another. Zoe sat across from me and poured tea from a tray on the table. I'd heard there was a new witch in town ages ago. Would you like some chamomile? Sure. I took a shaky breath. Sorry, I should have reached out before now. My grandma would have my hide for being so impolite. Oh, I didn't mean it that way. We're all busy, I understand. She handed me a cup and saucer in a violent shade of orange. It's not like we're in a supernatural town. If you're anything like me, I'm guessing you prefer to keep to yourself when it comes to the craft. I've only got a listing on Witchy Web for those in need. The closest potions witch is a fair drive away. Minerva Flagstaff, I added silently. I'd been unfortunate enough to make her acquaintance soon after I'd moved to Australia. When it came to potions, I was sure I'd prefer to deal with Zoe. Well, I appreciate it. My cousin is a potions witch back home, so I never really had to improvise on my own before. If my cooking is anything to go by, I'm sure a potion would blow up in my face. Zoe smiled and took a sip of tea. And your craft. Did I hear you were a green witch somewhere? Sure am. If by somewhere she meant Ash, who was our only mutual acquaintance, to my knowledge, I could grow you any ingredients you need. Once they're harvested, I'm a fish out of water. Zoe smiled, but it didn't quite reach her eyes. Had she been hoping I would mention Ash? Or did she look far too sanguine for a person who had just lost her neighbor and boss under suspicious circumstances? And what brings you to my door today? I tutored under a holistic healer, so my talents are best suited to remedies. Um, I rummaged in my purse with clammy hands to grab the burner phone and note. That's perfect, actually. I have a bad case of. Ah, oh, warts, you see. Not the regular kind, either. I got a bit too close to some fungi I'm rearing with strange properties. I swallowed and felt my face burn with the lie. 
When I looked up it was apparent that Zoe wasn't convinced from the suspicious calculation in her eye. I held out the phone with the most meaningful looks I could summon and jerked my head toward the window. Her eyes narrowed as she stared at the phone, and I cleared my throat and shook it at her. Oh! Zoe took a deep breath and took the phone gingerly from my grasp. Sure, I've heard of that. You've got to watch what you mess with in the world of fungi in Australia. Just let me look in this grimoire for a minute. Her eyes flickered between me and the phone, and I gave her an encouraging nod. Unwrapping the hair elastic, she unfolded the note and scanned over it as I wrung my hands. Her eyes were the size of saucers by the time she looked up. An unspoken exchange of words took place. I pointed out the window vaguely and tapped my ear. She mouthed the word really and shook the note. I nodded firmly and pointed to her, then me, and made a speaking gesture with my hand. A stalemate of silence ensued as she stared at me. So, I ventured. Do you think you can help, or should I reach out to someone else? Oh, I'm sure I can come up with something. I'll get in touch in a few days to let you know how it's coming along. You know how it is. You can't rush a good potion. I let out a relieved breath. Really appreciate it. Zoe let me out of the house in a daze and as I strode to the truck, I saw Amelia turning out into the next street. I had a long email to write to Ash to give him an update. I just hoped I'd taken all the necessary precautions. Chapter 8 I was repotting some azaleas under a sunny sky when Travis's metallic green truck pulled into the front lot. The knot in my stomach which had plagued me since leaving Zoe's the evening before melted into butterflies. It was the first time he'd been to the store since the launch a few weeks back, the same occasion when he'd suggested that one of these days he'd take me out for a drink. He flashed a smile as he hopped out of his truck and glanced at the wrought iron gates he'd gifted me, which stood proudly at the entrance, on his way past. A smirk crept onto my face, and I tugged the gardening gloves from my hands to tuck them into the back pocket of my jeans. Hey you, I smiled. Back to the grind already, huh? Travis grinned and shrugged as he stopped by my potting station. Can't sit still for long, and I have customers waiting. I think some of that must be my fault. I've had a few folks pass through to buy plants only to round up a list of watering systems and supplies to get cracking on the garden. I'm not complaining. Travis shrugged. Seems like you should take a finder's fee. So long as I keep your business, we can call it even. I dusted the potting mix from the table and wondered if that sounded too eager. What can I help you with today? Travis turned and shaded his eyes to look out over the lot beyond the plants to his usual fare, soil and supplies. Looks like I'll be taking a lot of fill out of this next job to create a pool area. Archie wants pavers down around the hole, ready to go when the pool company from Melbourne makes the delivery. Sounds like a big job, I observed. Are you doing the digging yourself? Yeah. Travis raked his fingers through his hair a little sheepishly. I've got a new excavator coming down from Wagga Wagga next week. So long as I don't hit too many rocks, it shouldn't be a problem. Huh, I said. Folks usually had to call in earth movers from Rutherfield with equipment big enough to handle jobs like that. Quite the investment. That would have set you back a pretty penny. Travis chuckled. At the moment it looks like a bucket of rust. It'll take more than a little elbow grease to get it running smoothly. Well, I almost choked as I spotted a dark SUV pull up in the lot and then swallowed. Um, I'm sure you've got it under control. I'm afraid I don't have much by way of pavers lying around. But we got in some new samples last week from the supplier. I'm not sure where Bill might have left them. As Amelia Ward climbed out of the SUV, I silently cursed. It would be just my luck to have her haul me into Inquisition HQ in front of Travis. The landscaper followed my gaze, and I desperately tried to think of something plausible to explain the Inquisitor's presence and move him along. Shoot. That's my accountant. I forgot she was coming in today. Do you mind checking with Bill about what you need, and I'll give you a call later to fix up the order? 
Travis glanced back at me with an arched eyebrow, and I met his gaze while trying to keep panic at bay. Ah, yeah, no worries. I'll have two separate orders. I'm starting a small job tomorrow, so I need Bill to make a delivery in the morning. Sure, I nodded and took Travis's elbow to move toward the gate, leading out to the machinery shed. This won't take too long. There was an issue with my taxes, and the accountant is helping me straighten it out. Is everything okay? Travis stopped, forcing me to spin around. Are you in any trouble? Amelia strode past the wrought iron gates with a bemused smirk on her face. I wouldn't put it past her to make a scene. It'll be fine. Just complications of an American gal doing business in a foreign country is all. I'll talk to you later, okay? I tried to keep the pleading tone from my voice, but if Travis's expression was anything to go by, failed abysmally. Was there a touch of hurt there? I swallowed again. Fine. I'll leave you to it. He stalked off, and my eyes lingered on him as the crunching of gravel and high heels drew near. He's cute. Amelia said, almost too loudly. I'm guessing you didn't want him around for this. And what is this, exactly? I threw up my hands. You spend weeks refusing to answer any of my questions, then barge into my place of business. Stella agrees that you know more than you're letting on. Amelia cocked her head. So, we're going to have a nice little chat about this whole situation. I ground my teeth and pointed to the office door. Be my guest, then. Amelia clip clopped in on her heels, barely faltering on the uneven surface. That irritated me even more, I could barely manage heels on the best of days. After closing the door behind me, I stormed over to my post behind the counter and gestured to the stool reserved for customers on the other side. Well? I snapped. Amelia took her time pulling a notebook from her tote bag and perching on the stool. After clicking her pen, she gave me a smug smile and tapped the page. You know where Ash is, don't you? My jaw dropped and my throat froze. How could she know? I squawked in indignation. She was trying to rattle me. In whatever dungeon you folks have underneath your building, sure, not that you've confirmed or denied it. Amelia simply cocked her head, the smug smile remaining on her lips. Well, what do you want me to say? I demanded. Ash goes missing, you turn up, and nothing makes sense from there. He was supposed to come to the launch of the nursery, and never turned up. Frown lines creased Amelia's forehead. I imagine having a friend with Ash's talents was very useful, you know, when you're facing murder charges. I clenched my teeth and stood a little straighter. What are you implying? Amelia shrugged casually, amusement plain on her features. I read the case file. The sister of the other suspect, Rihanna, was it? Took you to bring her in with new information to get you off the hook and apprehend the real killer. I wonder how that came about. With no help from the Inquisition, that's how I said. What does that have to do with whatever Ash is mixed up with? If he helped you out, I imagine you'd have quite the debt to repay. You know when he found himself in a whole world of trouble? I tried to stare the Inquisitor down, but with my heart racing and her penetrating stare, I couldn't help but look down at the counter and blink away tears. You've got it all wrong, I choked. I don't think I do, which is why it'll be no surprise to hear that Ash is on the run. He's made contact with you, hasn't he? I sniffed and dragged a sleeve across my face. On the run from what? He's harmless for Pete's sake. He's either told you or he hasn't. I'm not about to lay my cards on the table until we talk about what contact you've had. I glanced out the window to gain a moment to consider my options. Amelia Ward was one of the good guys, wasn't she? Surely she was in a better position to help if the theft of the rotary phone was an inside job. And I knew her well enough to be almost certain she wasn't mixed up in this. But it wasn't my risk to take. These fires, I said, changing tact. It's no coincidence that you're poking around with the local law on that front. Do you really think Ash is capable of something like that? He's a tech guy who runs a quiet little computer store. 
He doesn't even have the heart to kill the spiders crawling around in that shop. Are you seriously accusing him of murder? Believe me, I've seen Stranger. And he wasn't exactly a saint online. I took a deep breath and caught sight of Travis walking past the office. Our eyes met briefly, and I cursed myself for the tears. My face was surely a blotchy red mess, which would only raise his concern and uncomfortable questions later. I gave a strained smile and a wave and made a show of putting a folder on the counter to leaf through. Ha, Amelia observed. You definitely didn't want that one around to see this. Explaining why my accountant has me in tears will be awkward to explain. I reached for a tissue from under the counter to blow my nose once the landscaper was out of sight. But that's none of your business. Living in two worlds is always a delicate balance. Amelia shrugged. We do have a few magical towns in the state, you know. I know those are popular stateside. I grew up in one, and as soon as I was old enough to make my way out into the real world, I did. I shoved the folder full of brochures for irrigation systems away. Each to their own. I prefer the bright lights of the city myself. There are at least a few blocks which are exclusively reserved for witches. I thrummed my fingers on the counter and said nothing. If this conversation was taking some kind of detour so Amelia could try to get me talking, I didn't intend to play along. The Inquisitor swiveled on her stool and gave a low whistle as she surveyed the room. This place is really coming along, quite the transformation really. When I kept my mouth shut, she turned again and gave me a weary look. I'm not your enemy, cat. We want the same thing, right? You seem settled here. I'm sure you'd prefer the person behind these fires out of your town and behind bars. It's not Ash. I ground out. Find the person who's really behind it. Amelia pursed her lips. If it's not Ash, the guy who goes on the run the minute these fires start, then who is it? I'm sure as the resident sleuth, you could take a good guess. Taking a deep breath through my nose, I made a decision I hoped I wouldn't come to regret. The way I see it, Ash going missing tells me that these fires were set by someone hoping to frame him. I can't even find a connection between Ash and the victims, other than the fact they lived in the same town. Ash has no enemies in Myrtle Glen. But I find it suspicious that after he begins working for your people that he's suddenly caught up in an investigation. Or, Amelia folded her arms. Our boy Ash gets an offer too good to refuse from the Magical Mafia and starts playing both sides. Playing both sides? I scoffed. Wait, do you think the Magical Mafia are responsible for those fires? Why the heck are you hunting down Ash then? It wouldn't be the first time our people have been lured to the dark side and been burned for their trouble, pardon the pun. But if Ash gave them something they wanted, then he's in trouble anyway. Maybe not murder-level trouble, but the Inquisition doesn't take kindly to double agents. Serves Stella right, really? Having a contractor work for the Inquisition was a bad move. A bad move? That sounded like criticism. The last thing I'd expect from Amelia Ward, but revealing that she didn't think Ash was the one who burned down those houses, my spirits lifted before crashing down again. She wanted me to talk. It was hard to keep that front and center in my mind. I don't know what to say, Amelia. If it's the magical mafia, then you should really turn your tail back to Melbourne to arrest whoever's behind it, instead of playing cat and mouse with Ash, before anyone else dies. The Inquisitor's face hardened, and she snapped her notebook closed and slid from the stool. Have it your way, cat. But don't say I didn't warn you. I can say from experience that an involuntary reading is unpleasant. I only shrugged as Amelia showed herself out of the store and stalked away on those high heels to her SUV. Once she'd pulled out of the lot and screeched away, I let myself sag. I hadn't betrayed Ash that was the main thing. In a battle of wills I thought I'd had the upper hand. Now it was time to puzzle over her words and figure out where she sat in all this. Could she be trusted or not? Chapter 9 It's a gamble, but I have to know. I slipped a charmed piece of quartz down my shirt into my bra. 
The only way I can get a read on this woman is getting nose to nose with her. Gus went to protest but Sorka got in ahead of him. Yes, she crooned. Facing down one's enemies and seeing the truth in their eyes is a power which transcends witchcraft. She was being more than a little self-righteously smug. It was probably my fault given it was the first time I'd spoken directly to my undead ancestor in weeks. I know you're worried, Gus, but what better opportunity do I have? Amelia came into the store to shake me down, so I have every right to make a complaint about it in person. I don't agree that a charm as simple as this has the power to thwart an involuntary reading. If it did, some malefactor would have discovered it before now and spread the word. It is but a sorka protested. Enough, I snapped. I don't intend on giving her cause for an involuntary reading. Besides, she knows who Grandma is. Reach or no, I'll bet Stella would have second thoughts on ordering a reading until she has proof Ash and I were in contact. And what if it isn't her behind this? She's the one with the power to apprehend the real thief. Or she could be the one orchestrating the whole affair. The person brazen enough to murder two people to conceal their crimes, Gus said. Point taken, I conceded as I grabbed my purse. I'll be careful. Perhaps I should come. No, I said, for the umpteenth time. Cruising around Myrtle Glen with me is cute. Coming to the city and infiltrating Inquisition HQ is absurd. I can. What? Sneak around their office undetected? A witch is familiar in a whole building of witches? I don't think so, and I'm not going to risk spelling you to go beneath notice. That would give Stella everything she needs to tinker around with my memories. And a charmed crystal wouldn't Gus countered. Yes, perfectly reasonable. I only sighed and grabbed my keys to go. It was Friday morning, which meant Megan was coming into work. I'd already called her to see if she felt up to manning the counter solo while I made a trip to Melbourne, but all the same I wanted to stop by the shop to get her set up before leaving. I was concerned Zoe might finally turn up, I hadn't heard squat since my visit to her house, but Megan could take a message if that was the case. There'd been no reply from Ash either after I'd recounted the events in an email, which left me guessing on whether he was ticked off about it or whether I'd made the right move. After getting out of the house and onto the road, I passed through the early morning fog on the way to the store. When I pulled up, Megan's tiny red hatchback was already in the lot. Morning I called as I slid down from the truck. A bit fresh out, huh? Megan smiled and followed me into the store before unwinding a knitted scarf. Autumn weather. I looked at the forecast this morning we'll get some sunshine this afternoon. Well, that's promising. Let's hope it holds up all weekend. I hit the lights and powered up the computer. I've put together all the social media posts to let people know we're open over the long weekend, but I'm not sure that'll get to the visitors in town. Next year I might have to look into sponsoring the festival to get some traction. Oh, that's no trouble at all. Megan put her bag behind the counter and chewed her lip. Actually, I've been looking into the promotional materials for the festival and have left comments all over the place recommending the nursery. I hope you don't mind. The local council even included some top destination posts which I tagged. Oh, I blinked and considered Megan. If my head wasn't stuck in the clouds thinking about this case, perhaps I would have done the same. Thank you. You didn't have to do that. Megan shrugged with a small smile. I'm excited about it. And I want this to be a success. After running Megan through the basics and leaving her a list of odd jobs to do in the quiet hours, I left her with my number if any issues arose. Oh, and if someone by the name of Zoe turns up looking for me, just let her know I'm out and take a message. No worries. I'm sure everything's going to be just fine. On the way out, I collected a couple of curved green flags I'd ordered printed with nursery, which had arrived the day before. After lugging the base plates up into the truck bed and getting them set up at the end of the street, I dusted off my hands and gave myself just a moment to admire them and hope it brought some new folks in town for the music festival through the nursery over the weekend. And to think that was my biggest concern just scant weeks ago.
as if getting a relaunched business up off the ground wasn't enough to handle. The road to Melbourne was long and uninteresting. There wasn't much traffic to speak of until I'd passed a few bigger towns, and the horizon filled with urban sprawl. It was mid-morning though which meant the morning rush was over, yet I crawled toward the city center as wider highways turned to smaller streets lined with traffic lights. Visiting Inquisition HQ wasn't something I had on my bucket list. In fact, I hadn't even thought to make a trip to the city to check out the more mundane fare since arriving in Australia. Living in California for a time had taken the shine off city living for me, and any plans I had to travel involved getting further off the beaten track to see the sights of central Australia. The GPS on my phone took me to Lonsdale Street where I figured I'd need to start looking for parking rather than worry over where the Inquisition's building was located exactly. After being honked at a couple of times by cabs, I finally slipped down a ramp marked with a big P sign to head underground into a warren of parking spaces lit by dull, orange lights. The parking fee which blinked up on the machine by the elevator was unthinkable for a gal like me with small-town sensibilities, but I only shuddered as I paid, then took the lift up to street level. The city was much like any other metropolis, with people scurrying either in suits or casual clothes, their attire marking them as either those who earned their money in the city or those who spent it. I appeared to be in a business district, with only cafes and mirrored doors, dwarfed by looming buildings which kept the ground in perpetual shade. Glancing at my phone, I saw the address was a block over, and kept my eyes sharp as I crossed the road on the lookout for numbers on the buildings. On the roads back home in Arkansas, most folks wouldn't even see the signs for Tumbling Springs. It was a magical town which meant it took some considerable effort to keep the place concealed from the rest of the world. The charms were mostly illusion, not exactly making things invisible, but ensuring eyes just slid over what was in plain sight. Once someone had seen through the veil, though, it was like it had never been there in the first place. Which is why I wasn't surprised when I suddenly had to double back on the street after walking too far. I had to concentrate and blink a couple of times to bring the building in focus, and it was no surprise why the concealing spell seemed so heavy. While its neighbors were all modern glass pushing up into the sky, Inquisition HQ seemed squat by comparison, even though it must have been at least five stories. With a grey rendered facade, moulded features reminiscent of gargoyles and scalloped pillars framed the windows, making the whole entrance look like a museum. My eyes hurt just from staring at it, and I knew I should just walk right in and have done with it. Yet I hesitated and glanced at a small doorway across the road marked as a café. A dose of caffeinated courage was mighty tempting, but I knew I should get this over with. I was an outraged witch citizen here to demand answers. My fingers tingled as I pushed the heavy timber door open, the arcane council must have missed the memo on automatic openers, and I felt a sense of pressure pop as my boot landed on a polished marble tile. I jumped when the door literally hit my butt as I remained frozen mid-stride. Inside, Inquisition HQ was a world away from its gloomy, dark facade. A soft giggle drew my attention to the left where a woman sat behind a sleek mirrored desk with a futuristic-looking headset over bright aqua hair cut into a bob. First time here, huh? She smiled. You're not the first one to get caught off guard. No kidding. I blinked and gawked at the foyer, which was ultra-modern with LED lighting making it seem brighter than daylight and obscured glass walls decorated with potted parlor palms and low-line leather sofas. Here for a license transfer? I frowned and stepped away from the door toward the woman who had her head cocked in polite question. Pardon? A license transfer. I'm guessing you aren't local. You have up to 18 months to transfer your magic license from arrival into Australia if you intend to stay for more than two years. Here, let me get you a form. The woman retrieved something from under her desk, her aqua blue hair the only thing visible from my vantage. This was not how I imagined my visit would go down. I was here to demand to see Stella Marshall in a fit of outrage, not to complete forms. 
but I had neglected to even think about my magic license among the other, more mundane paperwork of staying in the country as a regular citizen running a business. I'll take the form to go. What I'm really here for is to see Stella Marshall. The woman straightened with a look of confusion marrying her pretty, painted features, and she slid a clipboard over the counter. Stella? Have you got an appointment? No, I do not have an appointment, I snapped, feeling a little bad for my tone but reasoning that I needed to stick to the script. I'm here to make a complaint about one of her inquisitors, and you can tell her she's going to want to see me, pronto. Oh, ah, well, the woman licked her lips. Why don't you go take a seat and get started on that form anyhow, and I'll let Stella know you're here. She is very busy. She'll be busier if she doesn't prioritize this. You can let her know Katerina Crow isn't above making a scene on the international stage about how incompetent her agents are. The receptionist had seemingly recovered from her initial shock, and the frosty veneer of a fake polite smile had replaced confusion, the kind only a person of that vocation could ever pull off that well. I'll let her know. Snatching the clipboard from the counter, I turned on my heel to stalk to the sofa by the glass elevator. I noted that the receptionist hadn't left me a pen to fill in the transfer, but I didn't want to go back to the desk to demand one. Instead, I folded the form and stuck it into my purse before folding my arms to wait. After about ten minutes I thought Stella might keep me waiting for hours to stew, but while checking my phone for the third time, the muted whoosh of the elevators had me springing to my feet in anticipation. I'd only met Stella the once, way back when the investigation over Great Aunt Tabby's death was at its conclusion, but I recognized the woman instantly. Brunette, with springy curls pulled flat over her scalp into a ponytail, and wearing a black business suit paired with more sensible shoes than her employee Amelia. She arched her eyebrow and looked me up and down before throwing an irritated glance at the receptionist. Cancel my one o'clock meeting. This might take a while. Well, that sounded ominous. I picked up my purse and threw it over my shoulder with a pointed look. I shouldn't be surprised you turned up here, Miss Crow. Amelia tells me you've been sticking your nose into her investigation for weeks. I should thank you. You've saved me some trouble by coming in. Let's take a ride in the elevator. I could have bitten back, but I chose not to. Narrowing my eyes, I followed the Inquisitor into the elevator and kept my posture loose and my features blank. It wasn't until Stella hit a button to take the elevator downward that a surge of panic rose in my gut. Going underground could only mean one thing. I couldn't imagine that they reserved the upper floors for involuntary readings and interrogation magic. Chapter 10 The elevator took an age to halt, and I couldn't guess how far underground we'd gone, with no numbers flashing up above the doors like a regular lift. Stella stood beside me with her hands clasped in front of her, remaining silent with a small smile curving her lips. When the doors opened, she waved me ahead of her with a smirk. The corridor was a far cry from the ultra-modern interior of the building's lobby, with caged fluorescent lights overhead and stucco walls painted in aged light green. Swallowing, I stepped out of the elevator where the intersecting hallways went both left, right and forward, and gave the Inquisitor a questioning look. Right ahead, she pointed. It was unsettling to walk in front of the Inquisitor, unsure if our destination was the next windowed door or further on where the corridor seemed to stretch for a hundred yards. But when a group of people rounded the corner, four outfitted in black gear more suited to being on a SWAT team, and another cuffed in street clothes, I halted despite myself. Throwing a look over my shoulder, Stella only frowned at me and jerked her chin to indicate we should keep walking. The group of four men sidled past us, and the one in front spoke as he passed me. Yo, Stella. When's Beecham back? I need him to fix the van's restraining field before one of us gets burned bringing these thugs in. Flies back in tomorrow, Stella barked, and if you keep breaking the damn thing, I'll start charging your unit for the repairs. Beecham? I hurried ahead, wanting to put some distance between myself and the cuffed warlock. I had to assume there was only one Beecham. Ray, our other suspect, it had to be him. 
and if he'd been absent, that was a tidy bit of information. The sound of scoffing answered Stella's retort, but she ignored them and spoke. Next door on the right. I came to a standstill in front of a door like every other one I'd passed, with a window on the upper half which I presumed was one way. Stella leaned past me to open it, and I stepped inside the small room where I noted a stack of files sat on the table with a chair either side. Somehow I imagined an involuntary reading would take place in some electric chair looking contraption in a dark underground lair, not a place reminiscent of a police interview room. Sit, Stella said briskly as she closed the door behind us. You wanted to see me? I'll let you go first. I'm guessing you're here to tell me Ash Stevens is innocent. Taking a seat with clenched teeth, I dropped my purse beside me and gave the Inquisitor a steely look. What would be nice to know is what Ash is supposedly guilty of. Amelia Ward has been in Myrtle Glen for weeks and has kept her lips zipped on the issue of arson and people getting killed. And why should an Inquisitor reveal details about an ongoing investigation to the likes of you? Stella smirked as she took a seat across from me. You're not in the USA now, Cat. Your grandmother might hold some sway stateside, but here, you're just a regular witch who's getting awfully close to obstructing justice. I was sick of having Grandma thrown in my face like I was some entitled child back home. The truth was, I wouldn't have dared meddling in an investigation on that scale just a couple of years ago, then again nobody I'd ever cared about had been put through the ringer like this. People are dead, Inquisitor, I said flatly. If this is a magical investigation, I deserve to know whether witches are in danger in my hometown. Have they been in danger so far? Stella cocked her head. Because from the reports I've read only mundanes have been caught up in this. Except for Ash, I countered. He's a dear friend of mine, who only seemed to get into trouble the minute he started working for you. And besides, since when does the Inquisition get involved in regular murder cases? Stella thrummed the table with her fingertips with an amused expression. Doesn't that say it all? Regular people get murdered, and one magic user goes M.I.A. What does that tell you? That you're not looking hard enough to find out what's really going on. If you think Ash is capable of murder, then you've really skipped doing your homework. Is that so? Stella chuckled and reached for the stack of files, because from where I'm sitting I've done plenty of research. Stella opened a thick manila file and pulled out a photograph which she slid over the table. Curious, I picked it up to peer at the black and white grainy image, likely taken from CCTV footage. A man was entering a shop of some kind, with long dreadlocks and baggy clothes. I squinted at the image and gasped. I couldn't mistake the face anywhere. It was ash, and going by the hairstyle, the picture was taken quite some time ago. Are you familiar with the case of Patrick Jones? Stella asked, and from her tone I could tell she was taking a good deal of pleasure from my discomfort. Patrick Jones. The name sounded familiar, but where? He was a little before your time in Australia to be fair, but he was a pretty notorious magical mafia boss up in Brisbane. We finally brought him in a few years ago and I can assure you I've got boxes of these files in storage detailing his crimes. With these kinds of arrests, we know it's like biting the head of a snake. There are always more associates ready to step up to be the top dog. That's why we keep these pictures, even if we can't identify the magic user at the time. What are you saying? My voice sounded panicky despite myself. Stella tapped the photograph with her fingertips. This one, for all intents and purposes, was Dale Silver, associate of Patrick Jones, who we knew had a highly skilled tech illusionist working for him. Dale wasn't his real name either, but we never did figure out Ash's true identity. My colleagues were impressed with his skills, but if he managed to start fresh after getting out, it's clear he still has some ties with the underground. No, I said firmly. This is Ash we're talking about. I don't know what this picture is all about, but he's not a criminal or a murderer. You want to know what's behind all these murders? Fine. If that's what it's gonna take to get you to open your eyes and help us find Ash, I'll tell you. There was a magical item used in these arson attacks.
crafted by the one and only Patrick Jones, which was held in a high-security facility that Ash was aware of. Maybe he made a clean break from the magical mafia. Maybe he thought they would never catch up to him. But it's a long time to keep a lie under wraps. Secrets like that almost always come out in the wash. I sat there with my jaw hanging, completely gobsmacked. If Ash had a previous life working for Patrick Jones, why wouldn't he tell me that? But if Stella was saying Ash was aware of the vault without telling me she'd contracted him to work on the security there, I also knew she was spinning this tale to her advantage, and why would she contract somebody to secure an item with that kind of connection to its creator? It smelled like a trap, and the last thing I wanted to do was lodge my foot so far in my mouth that it gave Stella what she needed to authorize an involuntary reading. I don't believe you, I said. For all I know, that picture is just something you have up your sleeve from his younger days going into any old store. Stella snorted. And what would I get out of that, exactly? If we bring in the wrong man, the murders will keep happening. We were at an impasse. If I said anything more, I might reveal too much information. I considered my next words. If what you said is true, it still doesn't mean that Ash is guilty of murder. He could be on the run from these people. Sure. But we won't know that until we find him, will we? Stella leaned forward with her fingers laced on the table. So tell me, Kat, have you two been in contact since Ash went missing? No, I lied. The charmed crystal tucked away in my bra warmed and I flinched, having forgotten about its presence. Momentarily confused, I leaned back with a scoff as I tried to cover my reaction. The crystal was supposed to help fend off a reading, so if it had been activated, did that mean there was an enchantment in the room to keep me from telling lies? My breathing quickened at the notion and I shook my head. Stella peered at me intently but her expression gave nothing away. I was guessing she had to take me on face value. Ash hasn't tried to reach out to you. I know you two were close. Not at all, I lied again, and held steady as the crystal grew warmer. Then I find it interesting why you're pursuing this so hard. You must know something, I can tell you're holding something back. I took the opportunity to smile at the frustrated Inquisitor. I can assure you, Inquisitor, I have nothing to contribute to your investigation. Only the truth which is that Ash isn't capable of the things you're accusing him of. Then you won't object to assisting us to locate him then? Stella took a round object from her pocket and slid it over to me. Frowning, I stared at the flat disc, but refrained from touching it. Now, why would I do that, Inquisitor? It's been a week since the last murder, Stella tapped the table, and two weeks since the first. It's only a matter of time before there's another house fire, and if Ash isn't behind it, he can assist us to find the person responsible. If he is. Well, I'm sure you wouldn't be so steadfast in support of him in that case. Every instinct screamed at me to refuse, and I lowered my eyes to the disc itself, wondering what its properties were, and whether Stella would really give me the truth of it. But people were being killed in my hometown. How would it look if I were unwilling to help? Standing, I thumped my palms down on the table to glare at Stella. Why would I help a woman who hired a known mafia associate? Did you set him up? Something stinks about the whole situation, Stella, and I'm gonna find out what it is. Stella's eyes glinted as she glared right back at me from her seated position. You do that, but you'll want to tread pretty lightly, Cat. If you give me cause to authorize an involuntary reading or charge you with meddling in this case, nothing is gonna save you from a magically fortified cell. I held her eyes as I snatched up my purse, not bothering to respond to her threats, and looked to the door with an arched eyebrow. I think we're done here. Stella shrugged and pocketed the disc on the table before tucking the photo back in its manila folder. The trip out of the cell down the hallway and riding back up to the ground floor was conducted in icy silence, and when I stepped into the marble-tiled lobby, I was surprised to find Stella following me to the door. If you reconsider, she ventured, you know where to find me. I paused and glanced back at her. 
then shook my head before exiting Inquisition HQ. The chilly morning had indeed warmed to a sunny day, and I stormed down the street toward the parking lot considering what I'd learned as passers-by strode, at a more leisurely pace. The fact that I hadn't heard from Ash had been irksome, but the revelation that he'd had some kind of previous life he hadn't disclosed made me madder than a wet hen. I was still sure he wasn't behind the murders, but it was clear he was holding something back. I had every intention of finding out what that something was but couldn't shake the feeling that I'd made my sleuthing that much harder with Stella's threats looming over my head. The Inquisition would keep a close eye on my movements, that much was clear. The question remained though, who the heck was behind the theft of Patrick Jones's rotary phone and the subsequent murders of regular folks in the small town of Myrtle Glen? Chapter 11 over the next few days I didn't have time to stew over my visit to Melbourne and Ash's subsequent radio silence despite my email pleas for him to get in touch. As the first long weekend I'd opened the doors of the nursery, I'd hoped to get plenty of business from the country music festival in town, but by the afternoon on Sunday I was exhausted from the steady stream of people dropping by to browse the plants out front and giftware inside. Megan had done a stellar job in spreading the word on social media, it seemed, and with only little Olmi holding the fort after a busy day with Bill on Saturday, I was considering calling my new employee to come in for the Monday public holiday. It was a good problem to have, and in a lot of ways I didn't feel like I'd earned it with my lax preparation and head in the clouds while worrying over Ash. But if one more tourist type asked if I served coffee while pawing over knickknacks, I was liable to scream. The foot traffic slowed at around three, and I was contemplating shutting up shop a little early after doing a decent day's trade when another car pulled into the lot, causing me to deflate some. But when I caught sight of blonde dreadlocks and a breezy yellow jumpsuit, my heart leapt into my throat. It was Zoe, and by the look of her skulking toward the door, she had something interesting to say. Finally, I rounded the counter to meet her at the door. Zoe, I smiled. I thought you might not come. The woman smiled uncertainly, and with hunched shoulders, crossed the distance to step inside. Honestly, I wasn't sure either. I flipped the closed sign on the door and turned the locks. It might not deter people from arriving, but I figured at least it would keep them from interrupting an awkward conversation. Taking a determined breath, I waved Zoe toward a stool at the counter. Can I get you something to drink? I asked. No, Zoe said, shaking her head. Not unless you've got hard liquor behind the counter. I chuckled, grateful that at least that she had broken the ice, and plopped myself on the stool behind the counter. Meeting her eye, I asked the question that I'd longed to ask all week. Have you spoken to him? Zoe licked her lips before answering, once. But he got me off the phone pretty quick he's paranoid that the Inquisition will catch wind of it. I can't say I blame him. I nodded slowly. It didn't tell me much about where the woman was sitting in terms of her perspective. He's been ghosting me. I don't know if he is angry at me for giving you the phone while an Inquisitor was parked out front. I'm glad you did, she said firmly. I was worried sick, and when people started getting killed, people connected to you. I cocked my head. From where I'm sitting, that's the part that doesn't make sense. I'm sorry for your loss, it's just. I want to know why he's getting targeted, and the victims just don't stack up. Zoe dragged a finger under her eye, a motion plain on her face. I bit my lip, figuring my words had been too harsh, but I had to know how Zoe and her network fit into the puzzle. I don't know either. Ash thought that whoever is framing him might try to rattle him by getting at me, but it's not like we were. Involved, I said and sighed. Maybe not in the going steady sense, but if somebody thought you guys were spending a lot of time together they might have put two and two together, even if they were a little off the mark. I neglected to mention that getting at Zoe was indeed a good way to hurt Ash. I didn't think he would appreciate me voicing my thoughts on his clear attraction to her. He said he would hand himself in. I don't know how I feel about that. I'm too scared to answer the phone, but all the same, 
if he ends up in prison over all of this to save me. I don't know how I could live with that. I reached over the counter to clasp Zoe's hand. The thought of the murderous rotary phone turning its crosshairs to me had crossed my mind, but so far there wasn't a huge risk of that. For Zoe, it was very different. Listen, Ash has helped me out a bunch of times, and I have no intention of letting him fall on his sword for a crime he didn't commit. I want to figure this out, and it's hard to do that while he's avoiding me. I went down to Inquisition HQ on Friday and... You went there? Zoe hissed. If it's the Inquisition that's behind all this then you're in real danger. I wanted to clarify what I learned about Ash's supposed past and the tidbit on Ray Beecham's absence, but had to remind myself that Zoe could very well be tied up in all this. It was time to hold my cards close to my chest. As far as they're concerned, I'm just a nuisance. I've been giving them a hard time for weeks, but someone has to get more information, and it's not like Ash is capable of doing any recon. Has the Inquisition spoken to you? Zoe recoiled and snatched her hand from under mine. No, I don't want to talk to them. If they find out. I waited for Zoe to finish the thought, but she only closed her eyes, like she had said too much already. Find out what, Zoe? Zoe stood and dragged her hands over her face, then folded her arms as she began to pace. Bingo. There was something behind all this. I just needed to get the woman talking. Myrtle Glen was supposed to be this sleepy little town where I could go under the radar. Barely any witches in town, and nowhere near the city. I was happy here. I didn't respond, hoping Zoe would continue her tale of her own volition. Ash and I, it's just complicated. We were both caught up on something a long time ago. It was Ash who helped me get out. Get out of what? I took a deep breath but I figured I already knew what was coming next. Zoe halted, her eyes filled with tears, and she stared at me long and hard. She couldn't talk to the Inquisition. Ash was inaccessible. She had nobody else to speak to except me. I tried to keep my features as earnest as possible. My ex. He was a bad boy trying to make a name for himself in the magical mafia up in Queensland, and when his boss got arrested, things got really ugly. I wanted to leave so bad, but you don't just dump someone like that and expect to just walk away. The Ash had already gotten out, and when he reached out to me, she took a shuddering breath. He was my savior, you know? He took care of everything. It all clicked into place. Ash had clearly been holding a candle for the woman the whole time and kept tabs on her after leaving the mafia. That he took the risk of reaching out to her at all while she was in that situation spoke volumes about his feelings even if it appeared that they were unrequited. The Inquisition showed me a picture of Ash from a file on Patrick Jones. I wasn't sure I believed it at the time. I pressed my lips together. So, I'm guessing your name isn't really Zoe? Ash wasn't a bad guy. Zoe's eyes flared with anger as her lips trembled. He was stuck, same as I was, except that he had the means to get out. Not like a young and dumb potions witch caught in a bad relationship. What did he say on the phone? I asked switching tactics, figuring that Ash had decided on running. Zoe stared at me long and hard before responding. He thinks he can get us out of the country, but I'm not sure. I drew a deep breath through my nose. Sandwiched between the magical mafia and the Inquisition, I couldn't say that I blamed him. But all the same, there had to be a way out of this. If one of his old contacts had tracked him down, working with the Inquisition to find the culprit could be a good move. But Ash was so sure it was an inside job, he was unlikely to ever agree. Can I borrow the phone, Zoe? I narrowed my eyes. He's not talking to me at the moment, but I've got a few things I'd like to share with him. Maybe it'll help. Zoe ran her tongue over her teeth as she considered my request. It was clear she didn't want to leave Myrtle Glen, and if Ash was pressuring her to upend her life all over again, then it was in both our interests to come up with a plan B. How can you be sure the Inquisition isn't keeping tabs on you? She threw up her hands, they could be listening in right now for all I know. 
I've stirred the pot, of that I have no doubt, I agreed. But we have to have faith in Ash's skill. He wouldn't have had me give you that phone if he thought they would intercept the call. I'll be careful, okay? As far as the Inquisition is concerned, I came to see you with a weird fungal infection. Zoe made a face, but the crinkles around her eyes told me she found the dubious story amusing at least. What are you going to say to him? While I was warming to the potion's witch with an unfortunate dating history, who believed just as I did that Ash wasn't responsible for the arsons, I couldn't trust her yet. I pointed to my computer screen and kept my answer as vague as possible. I need him to do a little searching online, is all. A green witch's skill set isn't exactly suited to the world of solving magical crimes. To my dismay I spotted a van pulling into the parking lot with two kids and a middle-aged couple hopping out. I wasn't done with Zoe yet, but I had the feeling she would make an excuse to leave the minute those customers banged on the door. Zoe followed my gaze with a frown. Just don't do anything too crazy, all right? Zoe pulled the burner phone from her purse and set it on the counter. If you sneak off somewhere to make the call, there are no guarantees that you won't be followed. I let go of a deep breath and smiled gratefully. Thank you. I promise to get it back to you in a couple of days, so you can speak to him again, you know, if you want. Zoe only nodded, and I walked her to the door, where I snapped the lock open and flipped the sign once again, even though I wanted to run back home to talk the situation over with Gus and Sorka. It must have been my desperation talking if I was so keen to hit up my undead ancestor for spells. Zoe slunk off to her car as I hailed a greeting to the customers, and as they poked around among the nursery, I watched the potions witch drive off in her small, red hatchback. I couldn't help the excited sense of anticipation at speaking to Ash again, knowing that there were more stones to turn over in this case. The tech illusionist had a lot of explaining to do, but I always knew deep down there was an odd reason behind him winding up in Myrtle Glen, fixing computers instead of working a high-profile job in the city. Hiding from gangsters seemed like a pretty good reason, in retrospect. Chapter 12 Gus at least seemed as excited as I was about the revelation of Ash's jaded history with the magical mafia. Unfortunately, he was sitting on the other side of the fence as far as suspects went. Think about it, he said from his position seated on the glass outdoor table. He's young and cocksure about his skills. Who's to say his former associates didn't track him down and used this potion's witch as leverage to get what they wanted? So, you think he lied to me? Why would he do that if he gave over information about the vault? I took a sip of beer and rubbed my temple. If that was true, surely he would have ignored my summoning. Trying to frame the Inquisition for a crime he was complicit in is beyond stupid. Of course he lied. Lying is done with words and also with silence. Trying to assuage you of his innocence is an understandable human folly. We each of us don't want our friends thinking badly of us, even if we are at fault. I shook my head. Why would he care about what I think of him if he never sets foot in Myrtle Glen again? No, he's innocent, but I take your point. Someone might have breached his new identity online. Gus made a low kitty rumble in his throat which I interpreted as irritation. So, what do you propose to do? Being grateful that we weren't going to spend half the night arguing, I took a gulp of beer and set it on the table. Well. If Zoe was right about one thing, it's that I've got to keep everything cool. Veering out of my normal routine will draw attention if Inquisitors are keeping a close eye on me. But I've got Ash's burner phone and I need to make the call, which is why I was hoping Billy might turn up out here. I doubt the Bunyip knows about the function of phones. I snorted. Gus at least was right on that front. I mean that I need him to get me out of the vicinity unseen so I can make the call from somewhere discreet. A new voice sounded in my ear, the Okiski cannot shield you from prying eyes. Sorka. A knowing smile tugged at my lips. No, but he can guide me through the back of the swamp in the dark without any trouble. What you need is a charm which will keep you unseen. 
much like the spell I gave you to search the flower woman's house, though to keep from scrying eyes we can do better than that. You show much aptitude with your dry oct, child. It is time we push further with your illusionary skills. The woman had been trying to butter me up since possessing my body without consent back when I was solving the murder of florist, Justine Shaw. It felt like an age had passed since then, but as I reckoned with how long it had been since the doomed wedding reception, I was surprised to realize it had only been a little over a month ago. I'd be amiable to a spell or two. If it helps me solve the case, I glanced at the glass sliding door toward the hallway where Sorka's skull was stashed away. Got any ideas? Sorka made a self-satisfied noise in my mind, and I figured she was gleeful that I was at least talking directly to her now. I knew she'd been listening in to every word I'd traded with Gus about the case, so catching her up wouldn't be a problem. Out of respect, I stood to fetch the skull out of the house and sat it next to Gus on the table. The boy spoke of a place concealed by Dryokt he fashioned himself, and betrayal by those who sought to protect the items within. There is a way to determine if this is the truth. The runes on Sorka's skull glowed a faint green. You must travel to this place and discern if the protections have been broken. You will need the boy's help of course, but should the spell be severed and not opened by design, you will have your answer. I blinked and considered Sorka's suggestion. It was like figuring out whether an intruder had used blunt force to gain entry, or had simply used a key left carelessly under the doormat. Of course, I breathed. Sorka's cackling at my agreement didn't bother me overly much as I considered how I could sell the idea to Ash. I was guessing the vault was the last place he wanted to be, but if Stella Marshall was behind the theft, there was no need for her to break down the magical fortress when she had the means to gain entry. If it turned out that Ash's spell was still in place, we would have enough to assume it was her, but if someone had blown the place to bits, it had to be more likely that either rival tech illusionist Ray Beecham or some of Ash's old contacts were behind it all. Billy interrupted my thoughts as he finally turned up at the patio. I smiled as he grabbed a beer from the refrigerator and ambled over to us. You are conferring with her again, Billy grumbled as he sat back on his haunches. No quibbling you two, Gus said. Katerina is in need of assistance from both of you, and if we spend the night trading insults, we shall get nowhere. Smiling at my familiar, I gave him an approving nod. At least I didn't have to play referee this time. All I need right now is something to keep me off the map so I can make this phone call, and a trusty guide to get me out the back of the swamp to someplace quiet, preferably with cell coverage. It didn't take long to get going. In the kitchen, Sorka guided me in performing an enchantment on a talisman, an old silver necklace which had belonged to Great Aunt Tabby, without the need to link to her, and although I was dubious about its efficacy, my ancestor assured me the charm would hold for long enough to speak to Ash. Gus had seemed about as convinced as me, having been at my side in previous enchantment experiments, but when I clasped the talisman around my neck, the round pendant was icy cold on my skin. It had taken little more than an hour to complete, and although I was still wary of my necromantic ancestor, I had to admit she was handy in a tight situation. Outside, Billy had consumed a six-pack of beer if the empty cans were anything to go by and sat quietly contemplating the darkened garden when I slipped outside. Ready? he asked. I put my hands on my hips. I'm not sure this talisman is much good if you can sense my presence that easily. Your sorcery will not befuddle supreme beings. Are there any supreme beings you wish to evade? Billy turned his head to give me a questioning look. Besides, opening the door gave your location away. Before Sorka could make a sharp remark, I stifled a giggle and stepped away from the pool of light surrounding the patio. Billy followed me silently, though his shoulder brushed against my hip to guide me through the darkness. It took a while for my eyes to adjust to the pitch-black surroundings with only a half-moon illuminating the treetops and glistening water from the swamp. Billy guided me toward the small John boat tied at the water's edge on the side of the property, and using my hands to feel the way, I stepped carefully inside. 
The water spirit nudged the boat along, the only sound gentle lapping water against its hull. Knowing the waters were treacherous with tree stumps and uneven land masses jutting to the surface, I refrained from using the small oars to propel myself along and sat quietly with my fingers laced in my lap. It took a good while to navigate toward the back of the property where the swamp constricted to a small inlet to the Murray River, and when the boat nudged against the mud of the far side, I jolted forward in surprise. I suggest we head east. There is a place further along where humans erect tents during the warm seasons, Billy said. It is quiet there at this time of year. Agreed, I projected telepathically. I'll try not to trip over anything on the way. Billy chortled telepathically at that, no doubt amused as the supreme being he was that I had inferior night vision. As we walked in relative silence, aside from the odd cracking stick underfoot, I wondered if the camping site was where Ash had stopped when arriving at my property similarly a week ago. Ideally it would be best to get over the river we walked alongside and over the border into New South Wales to make a clean getaway from my property, but bridges in town might be too risky to use. I figured if I convinced Ash to take a road trip to the vault, I'd need to have Billy push the John boat through the inlet and into the river to cross inconspicuously. I thought perhaps I was in for a twenty-minute walk, but it felt like an age before Billy steered us away from the river's edge and into scrubby bushland. Ahead, clear spots here and there marked by disused fire pits showed where campers had made their holidays and crude benches fashioned from logs stood dotted beside wider tracks where cars had evidently cut through the trees. Those were the only signs of inhabitants, and after casting around to assure myself there were no lights of a lone camper within the vicinity, I let myself drop to the nearest bench and tugged the burner phone from my pocket. It had one bar of coverage, which was better than nothing, I supposed. Billy slunk away into the darkness, and taking a deep breath, I dialed the only number in the contacts list. Zoe? Ash answered after a scant few rings. Guess again, I said. It's me, Ash. The line went quiet, and for a second I thought he might hang up, but instead I heard a muffled groan. Cat, tell me you aren't calling from home surrounded by electronics. I'm not that stupid. I'll wager there isn't a smart device within a mile of where I am. Is this phone satellite? Something like that. I heard muffled sounds of movement on the other end of the line. Hold on a minute. I waited for Ash to speak, figuring he was moving to somewhere less conspicuous, or at least with fewer devices, and was gladdened that he was prepared to speak to me. Listen, he said at last. This is getting too crazy. I don't want you involved in any of this anymore. There's no way out of a situation like this, which is why. You were hoping Zoe would run off with you into the wind? I interrupted. She's scared, Ash, and I can't say I blame her. But we've got some talking to do. I went to see Stella, and she showed me a picture of you from your former life. Ash hissed. What were you thinking? I didn't give anything away, I promise. I even had a charm which I'm pretty sure kept Stella from knowing about any white lies I told. But I know now why you lead such a quiet life, and how Zoe came to be in Myrtle Glen, too. I should be the one who's peeved here, but I'm still on Team Ash. I know you didn't do this, so let me help you figure out who did. Impossible. Whatever picture Stella has of me only confirms that it's an inside job. She never said anything to me about my past. She must have kept it up her sleeve to use before she hired me for the vault job. Not necessarily. I puffed out my cheeks. On the way into the interview rooms underneath HQ, another inquisitor, who asked after Ray Beecham, stopped her. She said he was flying back in Saturday, whatever that means. I don't know how long he's been gone, but surely that's the kind of lead you can follow. Ash didn't reply right away, which I hoped was a good thing. I can follow that up. Good. And that's not all. I've been thinking about how we can test out who might have been behind all this, and if we take a trip out to the vault. It's too risky. I closed my eyes and gritted my teeth in frustration. I'll just figure out a way to do it myself, but it'll be a lot easier to have you there. 
what we need to find out is whether your spell is still protecting the vault. If it was anyone but Stella, the magic would have been severed. Unless she wanted to make it look like someone else did it. Frowning, I considered that point. I'll come up with something. I've got someone helping me out its family, so don't get your panties in a twist over it. She deals in. Unconventional magic. If there's a way to identify the magic user who breached the vault, then she would know how to put a spell around it. When and how? He sounded resigned. Perhaps Zoe had been more resistant than she'd let on, and he was facing the choice of surrendering himself before she got hurt or going along with my half-baked plan. I'll meet you somewhere after work tomorrow. Billy can get me over the river unseen. Just send an address where you can pick me up over the border via email, and I'll be there. I don't know, he ventured. Listen, you've got work to do figuring out Ray Beecham's movements at the time of the theft. I'm going to take care of the rest, and if we can get proof that it was Stella or Ray, I'll take it right to the Arcane Council myself. Even if you were to hand yourself in at this point, how do you know Zoe would be safe from her ex? That point must have stung, because it took a while for Ash to mutter a terse agreement and promise to send me an email the following day. Exalted, I ended the call and cast around for Billy to guide me back to the house. Dangerous or no, I was going to find a magical means to discover who breached the vault at Ground Zero. Clasping fingers around the icy talisman around my neck, I thanked the stars that I hadn't thrown my ancestor's skull off an accommodating cliff after discovering her among the family relics. Chapter 13 I almost groaned when I spotted the metallic green truck pull into the parking lot just before closing time. I'd just picked up my purse to go and had rounded up Gus from his snooze under a display, in anticipation of meeting Ash for our rendezvous. But it was Travis, and my heart leaped into my throat as I recalled our last run in where I'd been in tears with Amelia Ward in the office. What the heck could I possibly say about that? My cheeks flushed with embarrassment. It wasn't like the landscaper to call in that late as I knew he was a guy who liked to start early and finish up mid-afternoon on his projects. I also noted that he'd swapped his customary shorts and fluorescent t-shirt for jeans and a much more form-fitting t-shirt as he approached. My mind ticked back to our last conversation and whether I'd forgotten to order the pavers he had looked at with Bill. Hey, he said with a smile as he pushed the door open. I thought I might be too late to catch you. Oh, I bit my lip and slipped my keys into my pocket. I was about to ah, but that's fine. How are you doing? I should be asking you that. He quirked an eyebrow and leaned on the counter. After that trouble with your accountant? I heaved a deep breath. Damn Amelia Ward. I, um, well, it's pretty embarrassing, actually. I have dyscalculia like dyslexia with numbers, gives me real trouble in the tax filing department. Technically, none of that was a lie, as much as it galled me to skirt around the real reason the Inquisitor had showed up. Underpaid your tax? Ouch. I guess it must be pretty different from the States. Totally different, I sighed. Getting together paperwork was never my forte. But don't worry about any of that. That's why I'm paying someone to handle that kind of thing for me. Running your own business with number trouble must be pretty rough. And this isn't your first one either, is it? I'm sure you said something about hydroponics. I waved a dismissive hand. A short-lived enterprise. But yeah, I was never any good at math. I can't tell you how many times I need to go back and fix things in the system. Can't be good at everything. Travis shrugged. How's business going, anyway? It looks busy every time I drive past. You must be swimming in customers. I've been pretty lucky, I admitted. This nursery gig was a bit of a gamble. If business didn't pick up, I would have had a hard time making up the difference. Just lucky to have found this place, I guess. I always wanted to figure out a way to earn money gardening. Should have been a landscaper. Travis chuckled and the twinkle in his eye caused me to smirk. You offering me a job? I teased. I actually came here to offer you that drink I mentioned a few weeks back. 
That is, if you'd still like to go out somewhere with a scruffy tradey. I don't know what came first, the exaltation or the awkward sense of mortification. Travis had planted the seed weeks ago that this was coming, and yet I couldn't quell the sense of panic at it arriving so soon. He must have sensed it, with his smile sliding as he cleared his throat. It's okay if... Of course, I interrupted, willing my cheeks to keep from burning. You just took me by surprise. I'd love to go out for a drink with you. And from where I'm standing, you don't look all that scruffy today. There, I said it. It felt like all the pressure had been lifted from the room as Travis raked his fingers through his hair. I don't know if it's too soon or not, but I'd just like to spend some time together talking, you know, away from here. I get the feeling it's already too busy for chatting over orders. On Friday I dropped by and saw you'd already employed Bill's niece. You did? I cocked my head. Megan hadn't mentioned it, but then again she would have no reason to. I had an errand in the city to run, but I think Megan shows a lot of promise. Maybe I'm just fussy but I prefer ordering from the boss. He gave an impish grin. How does Friday night work for you? I shifted on my feet, wondering if I should push Travis back until the ash situation had resolved. As it stood, I had no standing plans for Friday, but who knew what I might turn up with the tech illusionist later that night. But the case had been drifting, and I had no real reason to believe next Friday would be any better than the one coming. Sure, I agreed. Pick you up at eight? I thought we might go somewhere a little further than Myrtle Glen, if that suits you. He didn't have to say somewhere we wouldn't be gawked at, and the resulting target of speculative gossip. Nothing would get tongues wagging faster than two of the murder suspects of Travis's ex-girlfriend canoodling together in public so soon after her death. Not that I had any immediate plans of canoodling. Sounds great, actually. I scribbled my address on a post-it and handed it to him. With a promise to see me on Friday, Travis left, and I finally let myself drop onto the stool behind the counter to pull myself together. I was going on a date with Travis Larkins. You really do have peculiar tastes, Gus said, as he strolled into view from around the counter. Oh, hush you! I giggled. We need to go home and get our game faces on. When Gus realized I meant to take Sorka with me in a backpack for the road trip, we had a long and hard argument over his insistence in tagging along. But that meant not only taking the John boat through the swamp but into the Murray River itself, which quickly quashed his zeal. The ginger feline had never been overly fond of water. The rest had been straightforward. After the sun went down Billy once again guided me over the waters, and after scrambling with a large backpack up over the bank of the river and into the bush, it had been a long trek to the nearest road. Taking only the burner phone with me without the benefit of a GPS app, I walked from memory to a recreation reserve car park where Ash had promised to meet. After spotting a van parked farthest from the street and out of view from the road, I heaved a sigh of relief and trudged to him. Geez, he exclaimed as I opened the passenger door and climbed in beside him. He waved a hand at me, and the charmed talisman on my chest sent an electric shock through my body. Where on earth did you get a concealment charm like that? I grinned at having surprised the illusionist. Oh, you know, just learning a new spell or two. Turns out I'm not that bad with illusion craft. Ash squinted at the silver pendant on my chest. Some spell, he muttered, as he got the van going and pulled out of the car park. That family member I was telling you about has come in pretty handy. I unzipped my backpack and lifted out the velvet-wrapped skull. You sure you aren't going to veer off the road and into a tree? Why? Ash glanced at me with a puzzled look. Sorka has been helping me out with spells for a while now. Except, I had no idea about her until I found all of Aunt Tabby's things. I unwrapped the skull and set it on the dashboard. Turns out she was the first of the crows born in the States who decided passing on to the afterlife wasn't for her. Ash leaned back in his seat and gripped the steering wheel with white knuckles. What the hell, cat? I spoke before Sorka could start nattering. It was just lucky we were on a long straight road. 
Her soul is bound to her remains such as they are. She's like a familiar, except you don't have to feed her. I'll not be compared to soul bound. I'm joking, I said. Anyhow, Ash, this is Sorka. Sorka, this is the illusionist you've heard so much about. Please to make your acquaintance. Sorka's voice dripped with honey. We must make good use of our time while traveling so as best formulate a plan. Ash frowned at me. I thought you had a plan. I must first understand how you laid out your defensive dryoct. Then it is a matter of determining how it was foiled. Ash sat up straighter in his seat and looked askance at the skull. Can you put that thing away, cat? It's creeping me out. I don't want to get pulled over with a skull on the dashboard. Sorka made a harump sound as I threw the velvet cover back on and tucked her noggin away in the backpack. Sorka was around back in the witch trial days. You know, before arcane councils cracked down on the magic witches can and can't use. Her spells are helpful. Trust me. She made it sound like my spell work was subpar, he protested. How could she possibly understand tech illusion craft? The wheel was barely invented back then. Besides, if the Inquisition knew about your great-grand-whatever hanging out in a relic which reeks of necromancy, you'd be in serious trouble. So what? I hand an ancestor of mine over to Stella Marshall and have her thrown into the magical equivalent of an incinerator? I tutted. We're at a disadvantage here. And we have someone willing to help who has only been absorbing spells for the past three and a half centuries. Sorka cackled evidently tickled that I was now standing up for her. This is true, and none of this modern magic of yours. So, uninventive and overcomplicated, you young ones work within the walls you build inside your mind. Glamour, herbology, alchemy, they are one and the same. I'll wager you both have not touched even a fraction of your potential. She was sounding gloaty and superior again. I rubbed a hand over my face and sighed. So how long are we on the road for, anyways? I've got to go to work tomorrow, so full disclosure, I plan on napping in the car. Ash glanced at the time on the dash and pursed his lips. Probably three hours each way? I was afraid of that. We would still arrive before midnight, though, and I figured three hours on the way home and possibly a nap on the couch before I had to get up in the morning was better than nothing. I can work with that. How are you holding up? Ash glanced at the backpack between my legs and puffed out his cheeks, as if deciding whether to talk freely. Barely, he admitted, I've been waiting for Zoe to call. I've got a whole exit plan put together. But I don't know. I don't think she'll pull the trigger. I swallowed. It was no small thing to have the person you've spent years pining for thrust you away like that. Especially when I knew for him. The alternative was handing himself in for a crime that he didn't commit, so she wouldn't end up as the next victim. She scared Ash. I patted his knee. She wouldn't have come into the office to see me if she didn't care. She should be more worried about the Inquisition. I don't know how they got their hands on a picture of me back when I was working for the other side, but if they know about me, who's to say they don't have a picture of her in some folder? Her ex was pretty prominent, not that she was working for Pat. Patrick Jones? I bit my lip. How did you come to be working for a guy like that? I couldn't see you signing up willingly. I was young and stupid. Ash shrugged and met my eye as he turned onto a wider road. I was pulling some low-level schemes online and his brother found me. He's a tech illusionist too. Well, he was anyway. He died when Patrick was finally taken down, when he busted into my house and put a gun to my head, saying he knew all about what I was doing, I thought I must have ripped him off. Turns out he wanted to recruit me. Puts a new spin on the term gun to your head I suppose. I folded my arms and stared bleakly at the road ahead. Must have been terrifying. I wanted nothing to do with Ben or his brother, but I didn't have a choice. I kept my head down for three years doing as I was told and learning everything I could to get the hell out. When they arrested Pat, I used the opportunity to run. And how is it that you didn't think to mention those guys as possible suspects? I mean, 
If anyone has better motivation to want that phone back, it's them. Pat's in jail and Ben died. Ash took a sip from an energy drink in the cup holder. The phone itself wasn't something everyone knew about. There'll be new guys on top now with their own enchanters and illusionists. I can't see why they would bother coming all the way down here to do a heist like that. I didn't want to argue the point, but I didn't take Ash's reasoning at face value either. There had to be more to that angle that meets the eye, but first we had to rule out some basics at ground zero. Did you manage to find anything on Ray Beecham's whereabouts? Ash nodded. I got the flights in and out of the country, but that doesn't tell me much. I might have made the same diversion if I wanted people to think I was in Thailand sipping cocktails. The dates show he was overseas at the time the phone would have been taken, but I'll have to dig deeper. It feels a little frivolous. Unless I can see his face on CCTV footage, I doubt I'll believe any trails of hotel bookings and credit card charges. He had a good point. The craft of tech illusion sadly made even the most concrete of evidence seem worthless in the modern age. Hoping that Sorka's brand of magic was enough to cut through reliance on technology, I settled back in my seat and pondered on how one might establish if Ray was really on vacation at the time of the theft. Chapter 14 Ash sure wasn't lying when he said the place was remote. I swore I spent at least a couple of minutes perched on the edge of my seat as we turned into the driveway of the property itself waiting to get a glimpse of the vault. He pulled up before I could see anything though and took the van behind a stand of gum trees presumably out of sight. The landscape seemed flat for the most part. Though with it being pitch black, I could only go by what I'd seen of the roads leading up to the place. You're sure the van is safe here? If there are folks guarding the place. Then we're screwed. Ash unbuckled his seatbelt. But I obscured the sound of the van before we got on the driveway. Once we open the doors there'll be a bigger chance that they hear us stomping around. And a deft piece of spellcraft that was too. But if you are concerned about the presence of guards, I would suggest we call on the nearest set of eyes to be sure of any threat. Ash raised an eyebrow at me, but his features weren't as averse as they were at the start of the trip. Curious, I pulled out Sorka's skull from the backpack. And what is that supposed to mean? We must commune with the creatures who watch over these surroundings, something the Alkiski takes umbrage with but to no purpose. Borrowing a set of eyes for a time does not harm a robust bird. Animal possession. Ash frowned. Which sounds useful until you get stuck in the mind of a slug for the rest of eternity. Slugs are not fit for this purpose, Sorka tutted. One must choose the animal carefully. One with a sharp mind but lacking too much predatory instinct. A raven, for example, makes an excellent observer, but one must gain its confidence first and only delve deeply enough to glean its recollections. We do not have time for such a bird. A wren would do nicely in this instance. Borrowing a lesser bird's eyes for a time would be perfectly safe. A set of eyes closer to the vault sounded like something we could use. A thought sprung to mind. My mother as a witch practicing healing arts had always preferred working with patients with four legs, and perhaps she'd used similar spells to get inside the mind of an ailing animal. It gave me a sense of comfort that the spell couldn't be all that bad. Besides, I could understand why Billy would be livid at the idea of an undead witch meddling with the animals at home. He was protective of both flora and fauna in what he deemed his territory. It beats getting caught trampling around in the dark, I conceded. What'll we need to make this work? Just your mind, child. You must open your perspective to sense living things around you. I can link with both of you to show you how. Fear not, I can perform the spell unassisted while you watch on. The latter was meant for me, and I gritted my teeth in apprehension. The last time I'd linked with Sorka she'd taken possession of my body. An experience I wasn't in a hurry to repeat. Nonetheless, with all three of us linked, I figured Ash and I could act as wingmen if Sorka took any liberties. I'm inclined to agree, but Ash, if she starts with any funny business, Hit that skull with the nearest rock, okay? 
I mainly meant it for Sorka to hear, but Ash flinched and made a face. What do you mean, funny business? I met his eye. She gets a little grabby on the controls sometimes. I lost control of my faculties for a good few minutes the last time we linked. Awesome. Ash rolled his eyes and huffed. Just what we need. He didn't outright refuse, which was encouraging. And I took Sorka's silence for a tacit agreement that she wouldn't pull any stunts. Shall we? I offered a hand to Ash and closed my eyes. He took it, and as I reached a trance-like state, I felt the energy forces of both Ash and Sorka just outside my soul's periphery. Both exuded the same amount of energy, which was remarkable given that one was dead and the other alive. When we connected, an electric ripple went up through my arm, and I shifted on my seat. Remaining passive through the link, I saw Sorka forming her own magic in my mind's eye. She seemed to push outward, where I sensed smaller life forms as balls of energy surrounding us. The ground was like one big glowing surface, I imagine on account of the sheer number of critters in the soil, but upward the shapes were easier to make out. Sorka reached a tendril of her soul stuff up toward a small blue shape, and curiously I watched on, having never thought that manipulation of one's soul stuff on that level was possible. I watched on in morbid fascination as her soul stuff met the small blue shape, it enveloped it much like a snake swallowing a mouse, I felt a sense of revulsion coming from Ash, and was likewise repelled by the sight. But we didn't have long to dwell on that as the vision moved sharply as if through a sucking vortex. It took a second to get my bearings but Sorka was already crooning to the bird, encouraging it to lift its wings and take flight. A literal bird's eye view was a sight to behold. With superior night vision, I saw the landscape from its vantage at the top of the gum tree as it lifted off into flight toward a squat, bunker-like structure. There were no trees around it, and likewise no vehicles parked nearby, but I sensed that we already had our answer as Sorka picked through the creature's memories and found no humans encroaching on its patch for some time. I wondered belatedly whether a bird could tell us who approached the vault to steal the rotary phone, but it had been some weeks since the theft, and sifting through the memories of a bird was fragmented at best. With a swoop around the vault, I saw no movement on the perimeter, and no windows where a person could be lurking. Sorka guided the bird back toward our location, and after careening down to land, let go of it with a mutter and stroked the bird's energy with her soul stuff as she retracted back to the van. I opened my eyes with a gasp as I let go of the link, the sound of Ash's rapid breathing the only sound in the van. We shared a long look as I calmed myself to slow my pounding heart. Could that thing know who was responsible? Ash tore his eyes from mine to stare at Sorka's skull. All we'd need to see is their face, and... Birds take little stock of humankind, Sorka interrupted nor do they remember faces. To them, we all look much the same. But that one's nest is a good distance from here, and she was sitting on a clutch of eggs a few weeks past. Ash sighed. It figures. Come on then, the only other thing we need to worry about is tripping any magical or mundane alarms. We got out of the van to approach the vault on foot. I hadn't given up the idea of an animal who might be of help though, and cast around for any signs of four-legged creatures in fenced fields who might have witnessed something. But with the property being as large as it was, I couldn't see any sign of a fence even with my flashlight on. Ash stopped a good fifty yards away from the structure itself, and I pulled up short, hoping he had sensed nothing malignant blocking our path. Good, we can set a divining spell from here to discover any traps. Cat! Bring out those crystals, will you? We'd at least already gone over that part of the plan together before leaving the house. Crystals were required to mark a defensive circle where we could scry for any spells from a distance before approaching to make a closer inspection. I proffered the torch to Ash who held it up with a questioning look as I got the supplies from the backpack and marked eight cardinal points of a circle etched into the dirt by an accommodating stick. With a gesture, I stepped inside and Ash followed, then gripped Sorka's skull as I muttered an incantation she'd instructed me in at length the night before. 
with heavy lidded eyes, I felt the air stir around me, and in the place between reality and the soul planes, I perceived sizzling lines form between each of the crystals on the ground. Beyond that, a round dome of blue energy encompassed the vault. I took Ash's hand who took my meaning to Link so I could share what I saw with him. He gripped my hand a little harder as he saw through my eyes, and I wondered if he was seeing his own handiwork before us, or a new defensive spell marking the perimeter. Either way the spell appeared stable, and I sensed that its intention was that of a barrier rather than a fence. It was strange, I didn't know exactly how I knew that, but with Sorka's presence just beyond mine, I thought she had something to do with it. You may leave the circle and approach, child. Is this your crafting, boy? Yes, Ash breathed, which means it's still standing. He sounded relieved, but I thought perhaps he had jumped the gun. Come on, let's take a closer look. Outside the circle, the blue glow of the spell had muted some, but it was still bright enough to make out. It wasn't immediately clear which side was the entrance of the extensive building, but as we navigated around the side, I spotted a heavy door further along. My steps slowed as we neared the entry, as I spotted hints of white intermingled with blue. It didn't seem to fit with the rest of the spell, despite being enmeshed and barely visible. I'm guessing that's new, right? Ash stood with his jaw hanging as he stared at the door. It's been patched. Nodding, I puffed out my cheeks and folded my arms as a chill ran up my spine. Keeping the spell together was crowding up my mental energy, so I released the spell and gently let go of Ash's link. Even with the blue glow gone, he remained staring at the door, as if he could discern the magic secrets if he glared hard enough. I guess that means we're talking forced entry and subsequent repair. But that's what we expected, right? Ash drew a sharp breath and tore his eyes from the door. I don't know. I expected my spell to be gone, you know. Any cleanup crew from the Inquisition would have just dispelled the entire area and started again. Meddling with another person's magic is. Dangerous? I offered. So are most of the things inside this place. But this means we should look harder at Ray Beecham's whereabouts. I'm guessing it would take no amount of skill to achieve that on your way in and out of a heist, and he's the only other tech illusionist who knew about the place. I thought perhaps Ash might have been a little dumbstruck by the thief's skills and recalled that he had insisted on being the superior illusionist working on the vault. If it was gangsters, I somehow expected less sophisticated means of gaining entry. I clapped a comforting hand on his shoulder and nodded toward the van. How about we get out of here, yeah? Ash only nodded, and we stopped to collect my gear before tracking back to the van. My mind was already turning on how we might establish if Ray had been overseas at the time of the theft. If we couldn't trust any digital trails, I figured we would need to take a more personal approach. Chapter 15 I woke to a gentle nudge of my shoulder and sat up with a panicked gasp. Blinking, I tried to take in my surroundings. It was daylight, and I was still in the van. Wah, I croaked. Relax, we're at the recreation reserve, I let you sleep once we got back. Ash gave me a lopsided sleepy smile, but you should probably get moving. I blinked at the time on the dash. It was 7 a.m., and if I wanted to get to work on time, I knew I was already cutting it fine. You didn't have to do that. I knew hanging out near Myrtle Glen so prone was probably making the tech illusionist pretty frantic, but he only shrugged. It's okay, I've got some stuff to do today, and I need to slip into town to do it. In broad daylight, I swallowed and fetched the canteen from my backpack to soothe my parched throat. That's nuts. I'll need the phone back as well. You know, just in case. I narrowed my eyes at him, knowing where this was leading. You're going to see her, aren't you? It's the only way I can see forward, Cat. He set his jaw, as if expecting an argument. Over the phone is too hard. If I can just convince her to come with me, I'll set her up wherever she wants to go. Even if that's the other side of the world from me. He was getting desperate, that much was plain, 
but this case still wasn't done in my books. Not by a long shot. We still have Ray. What'll it prove? Ash threw up his hands. If Ray was behind that patch-up job, the Inquisition's diviner should have sensed it from the interior spellwork, which only means that they've covered it up from the inside. If someone had obliterated it, that'd be a whole other story. Unless Ray brought someone in on the heist, I countered. If that were a risk, he wouldn't have left his magical signature on it. Ash dragged a hand over his face and switched tactics. I just need to see her. I won't rest easy unless I know she's safe. That at least I could understand. I pulled the phone from my backpack reluctantly but held it firm as he went to take it from my grasp. Only if you promise not to yank Zoe out of Myrtle Glen and disappear in the wind. I've got some ideas, and I'll follow through whether you're around for it or not. Ash considered me for a moment and drew a deep breath through his nose. It'll take some time to get everything ready. If Zoe comes with me, we won't be that far off the map. Good, I said. And you better be answering your emails. Ash agreed with a mumble and glancing at the clock again. I knew I needed to get moving. After packing up my things, I jumped out of the van with a promise to be in touch soon and trekked back through the bush toward home. Sorka at least left me to my thoughts as I made the trip, and I examined every angle of the case as best I could. I had to give it to Amelia Ward. Solving magical cases was a lot more complicated than regular ones. I couldn't help myself. After finishing a long day of work, I swung past Zoe's house to stare at the brick facade, wondering if Ash had convinced the potions witch to leave with him. After knocking on the door to no answer, and noting the empty driveway, I thought it was possible she'd agreed. It's probably safer for the witch to go into hiding Gus said after I returned to the truck to head home. It just feels a lot like giving up, you know? I pulled away from the house in a huff, he just can't see any potential future where he gets off the hook. Probably reasonable Gus grumbled. What do you propose as the next steps? I'm hoping either you or Sorka has a trick or two to discern lies that will fly under the radar. If Ash won't believe any conventional evidence about Ray Beecham's whereabouts at the time of the theft, then I guess I'll have to go right to the source. You suspect I might know of such charms Gus sounded amused. Oh please, you don't spend your life as a gambler without a few tricks up your sleeve. We had cruder whiskey. It was near impossible to tell if I had added anything to someone's cup. A potion, then? I gave an appreciative nod as I took the turn toward home. That'd work nicely. I don't think I want to get too up close and personal with the guy or start casting in front of him. In truth, I mostly procured such elixirs. A traveling man didn't have the advantage of a well-stocked alchemical pantry or cauldron in his suitcase. I refrained from remarking on what had appeared to be quite a well-to-do lifestyle back in the day. The crows did well for themselves in the 19th century, and that at least had left the family with some wealth that had passed down the generations. So, Sorka would be a better bet? Perhaps he conceded. It seems you are warming to her. I bristled a little, with Gus's snide tone suggesting that my initial aversion to our shared ancestor was misplaced. But I pushed that aside as I considered that the assessment might be correct. Sorka had been more than useful out at the vault and hadn't tried any funny business. Maybe. But I'm still not convinced that an undead witch living inside her own skull is a good omen for the family. I don't understand what she gets out of it, you know? Some fear death or at least see themselves above such things Gus said a little wistfully. But I do not believe she wishes the family harm. I left it at that, vaguely uncomfortable about the fact that I'd neglected to tell Grandma and Mom about Sorka. I'd put it off mainly because I knew how much of a family ruckus it would cause, but it still felt like hiding a dirty little secret. Perhaps underneath it all I was concerned they might insist I send her right back to Tumbling Springs for safekeeping, leaving me without a dubious fount of magical knowledge. When I pulled in at home, I went straight inside to slump on the couch and pulled out the tablet Ash had left me. As I was crafting an email, Gus came into the living room, 
having eaten his roast chicken, and hopped up beside me on the sofa. You're contacting the illusionist. I remember him saying he knew of some inquisitor bar in the city. I'm sure he said Ray is usually there on a particular day of the week. A bar would be perfect if I need to slip him something. Amid a crowd of witches practiced in detective work with keen observation skills. A crowd of drinking witches with keen observation skills. Don't worry, I'll be subtle. I hit send on the email and set the tablet on the coffee table. Here was hoping that it wasn't a Friday night that Ray was at the bar. I didn't want to cancel my date with Travis. You must practice some sleight of hand tricks. I will instruct you Gus smooched my arm to get my attention. First the potion. I scratched my familiar behind the ears and stood. I'm guessing it'll take a while to make. Do I hear you are in need of a brew, child Sorka called. I must confess, your current dilemma is quite intriguing. What is it you are up to now? I went to retrieve Sorka's skull from the cupboard filled with witchy gear and placed her on the counter. I need something that will help discern lies at the very least. Ideally, something that will get the truth out of Ash's former colleague would be better. Hum, there are many possibilities. Augustus, do you have a charm in mind? I smirked at hearing my familiar called by his full name, but if it irked him to be referred to as such, he didn't show it. It has been many years since I have had need of such an elixir. I fear any recipe I give may not work. As I recall, the compounds required were very particular. No matter, Sorka crooned. I am sure we can fashion something for the purpose. We shall need to work under the light of the moon, though. On it, I said. I'll let you two figure out what we have in the cupboard that'll work. I knew it wasn't unusual for some potions to call for moonlight, and others the power of the sun, and thankfully Tabby had kept a fire pit out back with a camp cooking iron apparatus which made swinging a heavy pot over the coals fairly easy. The light had faded to an orangey dusk, which gave me time to get the fire burning down to keep the potion at a steady temperature. Using the kindling and firewood I had on hand, I got things started, and hoped it didn't act as a beacon for my neighbor Kelly to come over for a visit. Once I was sure it was burning with gusto and wouldn't fizzle, I left the fire pit to do its thing and returned indoors where I hoped Gus and Sorka had come up with something. When I inquired on their progress, Sorka began rattling off ingredients as I collected them from my stores. Things like St. John's wort, dried mint, cardamom pods, and stinging nettle I had in good supply. I was running low on elderberries and passionflower, but Sorka insisted I had enough. When it came to the last ingredients, though, I balked. I'm sure I don't have kava or powdered moth, I stated flatly. Kava as a psychedelic root wasn't something I usually heard of in potions, and the idea of keeping powdered moth was gross. Tabitha did, Sorka insisted. As an aid to reach beyond the present in her later years. It was a little off-putting to hear that my great-aunt was in the habit of brewing insects and hallucinogens to keep her magic sharp. Making a face, I rooted further into the cupboard, where Aunt Tabby's stores remained in unmarked glass spice jars. It took a little while to determine which bottle was which, and after gathering everything together and rummaging for a suitable pot, Sorka coached me on the method while I ate a sandwich. Gus hung around seemingly hanging off Sorka's every word, and by the time I was ready to get started, it was well and truly dark outside. But before I could haul everything out the door, the sound of a notification came from the living room, and I abandoned the pot on the counter to check the tablet on the coffee table. Ash had replied to my email, and I scanned through his reply eagerly. Tomorrow, I said for Gus's benefit. Ray is usually at the bar on Thursdays by six, but Ash wants to meet me in the city to talk first. Seems risky on his part, Gus leaped onto the coffee table to inspect the message himself, particularly if he has the potions witch with him. Maybe he means to give me something to help. I bit my lip, sure that Zoe would be better placed to provide a potion to get Ray talking than I was. The only other thing he sent is a picture of Ray. 
but he hasn't said why he wants to meet or given me the address of the bar, either. He probably wants to talk me out of it. It would be a long drive for that to be his purpose. True, I puffed out my cheeks. I'd known driving to the city at all was risky given how far it deviated from my normal routine, but was confident that Stella couldn't do much about me hanging around an Inquisition bar if she learned of it. But if Ash was there, it was a whole other story. I figured the tech illusionist had to be cognizant of that too, and had to have faith that he'd planned for it, and had a darn good reason to want to speak to me before I went in head first. Either way, we better get this potion right first try. Looks like another long night tomorrow. Chapter 16 The drive to Melbourne, after rummaging in my closet for something appropriate to wear, left me weary before I'd even hit the outer suburbs. I was still a little uncomfortable wearing a sleeve dress and heels, but both Sorka and Gus had insisted that I needed to use my feminine wiles to have Ray take a drink of something I gave him. It felt icky on the eve of my date with Travis, but sacrifices had to be made, and hopefully it would be a five-minute conversation at the most. Sorka appeared confident that the potion had worked when I fetched it before the first rays of sunshine could spoil the magic from its position hanging beside the fire pit, but without testing it I couldn't be sure. I'd already come up with a plan to have Ray taste a cocktail I'd ordered, and if I likewise took the potion and tried a simple lie to test the efficacy, I'd know if the venture was wasted or not. It still seemed like a heck of a lot of trouble for something which might not work. As I neared the city center, the traffic slowed with people commuting from every direction on a workday. I crawled along congested laneways and roads, my mind flitting from one thing to another as I considered what Ash wanted from me that couldn't be simply communicated via email. If Zoe had left with him, I was sure he would have kept her someplace safe, which wasn't around the corner from a bar filled with inquisitors. Going out on a limb to meet me must mean he had something important to share. I'd already mentally prepared myself for the parking fee, after finding a space in an underground lot, and begrudgingly swiped my card before leaving my battered old truck between a Mercedes and a sporty BMW. I hadn't brought my phone with me in case the Inquisition was keeping tabs on my location data, and when I got out on the street, I cast around for a street sign to place myself within the map I'd memorized of the grid-like city. When I made it to the small laneway where Ash had said we would meet, I sighed. There was nobody there, and in the poorly lit space between high-rises, I caught flashes of what seemed like rats scurrying against the wall. But I had to stifle a gasp when something, or an invisible someone, took my hand to draw me deeper into the darkness. This is crazy, he hissed. He remained hidden from my eyes as I squinted into the darkness at him, which I supposed was prudent. Don't tell me I've driven all this way for you to talk me out of this. I kept my voice low. Whatever you've got planned, I'll do it, I won't have you committing magical crimes on my account. That's not going to work. I shook my head. I'll need to speak to Ray after he's had the truth elixir. I heard, rather than saw, Ash suck in a sharp breath. Drugging an inquisitor is more than a misdemeanor. Only if they find out about it, I huffed. There's one question we need an answer to. Did Ray really go on vacation like he said? If he did, we can rule him out as the person who stole the rotary phone. It's hardly suspicious to talk to someone about jet-setting around to see the world. I won't press any further. If he didn't, then you'll have to find the evidence that proves it a better way, so we can present it back to the Arcane Council. They can handle the involuntary reading to get the rest. If the tech illusionist was giving me a moolish look, I couldn't see it in the seconds that dragged on. Did Zoe help you with it? Zoe? I made a face. I thought she was with you. She. Ash sighed. I guess she didn't want to leave. My heart broke for the guy. Feeling my way in the darkness, I patted his chest and pulled him in for a hug. I'm so sorry. I know how much you were counting on it. Ash cleared his throat, and I let go of his lanky frame. 
As far as last-ditch efforts went I figured that was it for him, which was likely why he was willing to be so brazen in coming to the city and volunteering for the job. This isn't done yet, Ash. Let me do this, and then we can figure out the best course of action. I'm guessing it'd be easier to bring down Ray than Stella, and we have the opportunity to know right now. How do you know your potion will work? I grinned. I'll take some too. In some fancy cocktail. If I can't say the sky is green, then I'll know, and it won't seem like I've spiked his drink. I'm guessing your skull grandma helped you with it? She's handy in a pinch, I said and shrugged, and she has yet to give me a spell that didn't work. I don't know. She talks about modern magic being pretty tunnel-visioned. I would never have guessed I could pull off spells so far out of my repertoire. Probably because truth elixirs are illegal, animal possession is dangerous, and messing with live magic is even more fraught, Ash grumbled. They weren't written into family grimoires for a reason. To limit our knowledge? You've got to admit that seems pretty short-sighted. There are more rules governing magic than spells these days. Look at you, dissenter. Ash snickered. And here I thought you said I was the one with authority problems. Maybe I'm coming around. I smiled grimly. So, are you going to give me the address to the bar or not? Ash grabbed my hand, and we began walking. Not with you looking like that, I'm not. I squeaked in indignation as I glanced down at my dress and heels. Was he implying? Relax. Let's find a bar so we can get some better light. I narrowed my eyes at the tech illusionist but had already figured that any magical solution to my appearance had less to do with how I was dressed and more to do with being recognized. When we rounded a corner with a pub across the road, he gave me a nudge on the small of my back. In the bathrooms, he whispered. It made sense that he didn't want people staring at me while holding an invisible hand, so I trotted across the road when a break in cars and cabs allowed and took a deep breath as I walked inside. It didn't take long for me to locate the signs for the restrooms, and I was relieved to find a single, ambulant bathroom next to the ladies. I held the door open a little longer than I normally would as I stepped in and felt something brush past me before locking the door. Under fluorescent light, Ash's concealment charm was less effective. The white tiles on the wall behind or through him were heavily distorted, and I could make out his basic outline in flickering specks of brown. Still, it was impressive in a world where invisibility spells were supposed to be fairy tales. That's a pretty nifty spell, I said poking his chest. I'm guessing you didn't find that on a list of approved charms. The glamour dissolved, leaving me staring at the tech illusionist who had dark circles under his eyes and a grubby t-shirt under a heavy jacket. He only quirked an eyebrow at me and shook his head. It's not the easiest spell to hold on to. Luckily I've got something in mind which should help keep people from recognizing you. If Ray has seen your picture, no amount of southern charm will convince him to drink anything you offered to him. My cheeks burned. I hadn't thought of that eventuality in my excitement. I suppose that's wise. Pulling a compact from his pocket, he handed it to me and nodded to the mirror. It took some doing getting my hands on this. I have an illusionist lady friend who I used to work with on some online schemes who lives nearby. She handled any face-to-face -face meetings with investment firms. So that's what you were doing before contractor work for Stella. I frowned and turned to the mirror. Scraping some cream from the top of companies who make it their business to screw clients for the sake of investors isn't something I lose any sleep over. And I make sure we reconfigure the odds in the client's favor when we're done. I tutted as I opened the compact and powdered my face. A veritable Robin Hood. Exactly. I frowned as I applied the makeup to no effect. Is there something I'm missing here? Ash smirked and took the compact from my grasp. I watched with interest as he applied the makeup to his face, and while there were no differences I could see in the mirror, when I looked at him directly, I saw marked changes to his features. His nose was longer, his eyes rounder, and by the time he was done, 
the cleft in his chin made him appear like someone else altogether. Now that is pretty neat. Cassandra will kill me if I don't return this to her. It took months to perfect, and plenty of painful mistakes along the way. I don't think she's in a hurry to make another one. But I glanced in the mirror. It only works when someone looks at you directly. You'll still have to be careful, Ash agreed as he slipped the compact back in his pocket. And I know there are cameras inside. Ray might not recognize you, but anyone looking at the footage will see your true face. It's not illegal, but I'm sure if Stella finds out, she will bring you in. So, keep it cool and try to not look at any cameras directly. I bit my lip. Okay, I won't be long. Will you still be here when I leave? I've got to get going. But I'll keep my eye on my emails tonight. One last thing, though. Ash rooted around in his pocket to retrieve a card and handed it to me. Emma McLean? I made a face at a fresh magic license. The credentials lacked a picture, but I knew the card should flare red in the hands of someone who had falsely appropriated it. Just in case, he shrugged. With that, Ash gave me the directions to the bar, and I felt the gravity of the situation bear down on me. If I was discovered, would that give Stella what she needed for an involuntary reading? I had to be confident that even if it happened, she would only see the truth. That I was trying to find out who was truly behind the arson attacks. You okay? Ash gripped my shoulder and peered intently at me. There's still time to walk away from this. I'll go in your place. No, I shook my head resolutely. If Sorka and Gus were right about one thing, it's that a guy at a bar will be less suspicious of a woman feeding him drinks. Unless, of course, you've made me look like a leper. Ash chuckled and thrust his hands in his pockets. If someone like you struck up a conversation with me at a bar, I'd wonder what good deed I'd done to attract that kind of attention. I'm sure Ray will feel the same way. As far as awkward went, it was more than weird to hear Ash say something like that in a public restroom of all places. I had to remind myself that he was at least five years my junior, head over heels in love with Zoe, and that I had a date with Travis the following day. Besides, he was probably talking about the altered face in front of him rather than my usual look. All right, I'll let you know as soon as I get home, okay? Ash nodded his agreement and gestured to the door. I took a steadying breath before unlocking it and stepped into the loud pub with one last glance over my shoulder at the unfamiliar yet familiar guy who remained in the bathroom. As far as friends went, he was totally worth it. Now it was on me not to mess this whole operation up. Chapter 17 there was no question that it was a magic user bar after finally locating the entrance concealed with the same enchantment that obscured Inquisition HQ from mundane passers-by. Without even a name above the doorway, I figured I couldn't be blamed for happening upon an Inquisition bar thinking it was a place for all magical types. There was a security guard just inside the door who asked for my license, and I retrieved the fake, magical ID from my purse grateful that Ash had the foresight to arrange for Emma McLean to act as my alias for the night. I smiled and sidled past as the guard waved me in with barely a pause. The interior of the place was dimly lit, with no windows to the outside world, and a long bar dominated the back wall with booths on the opposite side. The middle held card tables, and I glanced around as if deciding where I wanted to sit. I got more than one or two glances from unreadable faces, most dressed in business attire who were likely wondering what I was doing on their patch. A little unnerved, I hustled to a bar and chose a stool to perch on as I grabbed a drink's menu. I still hadn't spotted Ray as I glanced between the menu and the mirrored backsplash to keep tabs on the people behind me, being sure to position my reflection amongst bottles of booze. When a waiter approached, I bit my lip. Hey, what can I get you? The twenty-something guy with long blonde hair asked with a friendly smile. Ah, I frowned at the menu. I don't know if I'm in the right place. I was looking for somewhere with a lot more cocktails on the menu and less business suits if you get my meaning. I'm not from around these parts. 
the bartender snorted with a grin. And the first place you walk into is an Inquisition bar. Ouch. My name's Jackson, anyway. He pulled a laminated card from underneath the bar. Lucky for you, I'm good with cocktails. I can even add a pinch of something special if that's what you're looking for. Ooh, I scanned the menu with feigned interest. Along the left-hand side was a list of cocktails, but on the other were extras ranging from euphoria through to hangover free. I'm Emma, just on a quick stop down under before moving on. Well, welcome to Australia, Emma. I can't brew them up quite so strong here, but over at Sunny's they'll knock your socks off. Sunny's? I arched an eyebrow. Magical mafia place, he said with a shrug, as though that explained everything. I was familiar with the practice of adding recreational potions to drinks both in my hometown of Tumbling Springs where Marissa used to offer practical additions to subdue nausea and tinctures to keep drunks from brawling, and my experience in California, where they were more like euphorious. I didn't need my head clouded with magic, though, so I decided on a tequila and grapefruit concoction called a Paloma and tapped the menu with a sigh. I might get the directions off you after a drink. Unless there's somewhere a little more. Neutral? Sure. There's a few you might enjoy. Depends on what kind of scene you're looking for. A call from the other end of the bar drew Jackson's attention, and he told them to wait a minute. Have you decided? I'll get a Paloma, please. No extras. I smiled and handed the menu back. I'll get that to you in a minute. With the bartender off pulling beers on the other end of the bar, I rummaged in my purse for the small vial and palmed it casually as I propped my elbows on the bar. It gave me the opportunity to size up the room behind me in the mirror, where I'd yet to locate Ray Beecham. If he'd passed on the bar for the night I was in for a world of disappointment, and as for the rest, it was clear everyone was buddied up with at least someone else, with no loner types hanging around. It would make it difficult to insert myself naturally into any such group, but I wasn't sure what I'd expected at a place like that. The hope that Ray was nursing a drink at the bar, with an empty seat beside him seemed too easy in retrospect. I was getting more than a little worried that it was all for naught when the bartender returned to slide a long pinkish glass in front of me garnished with a wedge of grapefruit. I took a sip with an appreciative groan and paid with a smile, and let the guy have his moment with an impish grin before he had to hustle drinks out to waiting patrons. Considering whether I should use the opportunity to add the elixir or not, I caught movement in my periphery and a guy strode from the bathroom hallway toward the bar. It was Ray, and I gave him a friendly smile as he approached the bar. Apparently he didn't quite know what to do about a woman smiling at him, because he looked away the moment he met my eyes and leaned over the bar further along, evidently waiting to place his order. He looked older than me, with grey streaks through his hair and close-cropped goatee, and wore heavy-rimmed, square glasses. He wore a polo rather than a business shirt, and gave the impression of one who hunched over in the effort to make themselves less noticed. But he was by himself, at least for now, and was a scant few vacant stools away from me. I would never have a better opportunity. Hey, I said in mock hushed tones and grabbed my drink to move a few seats closer. Holding a cupped hand against my mouth, I said. Are you with those guys? I just came in looking for a drink and had no idea this was an Inquisition bar. I made the gesture of face palming my forehead. It didn't look like it from the outside. Ray eyed me askance. Not a fan of the Inquisition? Oh, nothing like that. I waved a hand. They just make me nervous is all. I don't know what it's like here but back in Alabama I wouldn't dream of talking to an inquisitor. It was the first of my little white lies. Alabama was close enough to Arkansas to pass the accent off, and I was sure two women from Arkansas and Melbourne would be too conspicuous for the likes of Ray. He only gave a shy smile though. Well, you're talking to one right now. We don't all bite. I slapped a hand to my mouth with a gasp. Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry, I've put my foot in my mouth, I didn't mean to offend you, it's just when I saw you weren't in a suit I thought maybe you were an outlier like me. Suits are overrated, he said with a shrug. 
I mostly work in the office anyway. Giggling, I sagged theatrically. I know, right? I'm glad I'm not the only person who thinks so. Can I get you a drink? I'm only stopping through Melbourne for a few nights and don't know a single soul here. I'm looking for any tips on what I should see on the magical front before heading off. Oh? You here on business? He quirked an eyebrow, then held a finger up toward Jackson, the bartender. Nothing so fancy. I shook my head and used the opportunity while Ray's attention was elsewhere to unstop the vial in my palm and sprinkle the elixir into my drink. Just worked out cheaper with flights to stop in Melbourne for a few days. I had no idea whether that was plausible, but Ray didn't give me any weird looks as Jackson approached with a beer. Ray glanced at my glass with a questioning look, and I took a small sip and smacked my lips. This has got to be one of the best cocktails I've had in a long while. What did you say was in it again? I cocked my head at Jackson. Tequila, grapefruit, lime and agave syrup. The bartender flashed a grin. Ever had one? I grinned wickedly at Ray. The man made a face and cleared his throat. Cocktails aren't my thing. I held up the glass in entreaty. Come on, you've got to try it. If you like it, I'll buy you one. Ray narrowed his eyes and looked at Jackson. I suppose you loaded it up with those giddy potions? Not a drop, Ray, I promise. The bartender held up his hands. Emma here apparently likes them as nature intended. Hangovers and all. I scoffed and held the drink out to Ray. If I need a little pick-me-up in the morning I'll stick to Alka-Seltzer. Ray hesitated, but under the scrutiny of both me and Jackson, he took the glass with an ambivalent grunt. Grapefruit, you reckon? The tension drained from my shoulders as Ray took a sip. Of course, not that it's my favorite fruit. Whoa. What I'd intended to say was that grapefruit was one of my favorites, but without even thinking, the contradictory statement flew out of my mouth. The elixir was working. If Jackson or Ray thought my admission was weird, they didn't say anything. Ray swished the cocktail around his mouth before swallowing with a shudder. Not mine either. I think I'll stick with beer. Jackson rolled his eyes and moved off to serve another patron, and I took the glass back and took another sip before setting it down on the bar. Still, it's pretty refreshing, don't you think? Ray shrugged non-committally and looked over his shoulder where I imagined his party was waiting for him to return. So, any words for the wise down in Melbourne? I didn't expect it to be so cold, and here I thought vacations should always be warm and tropical. It was a hint to Ray's recent trip, and with the truth elixir, I couldn't get more blatant than that without tripping over my words. Hoping he would take the bait, I rested my head on a fist and kept my features friendly. Not a good time of year to visit, I guess. Melbourne is famous for having four seasons in a day, the weather changes that much. Ha, huh, is that so? Maybe I'll have to make another trip during summer. I wanted to figure out my next move and heard Bali or Thailand are both good. Have you been? Thailand beats Bali hands down unless you're looking for resorts. I've been to both a few times but I'll take the beaches at Phuket any day of the week. Beaches sound nice for sure. I swirled a straw in my glass. You been recently? I'm always open to tips for decent hotels. Just got back actually. Ray took a long gulp of beer and frowned. But I stayed at a Holiday Inn on Patong Beach for a few weeks. Nothing fancy but I wasn't there much. I'll be sure to look it up. Trying to keep my voice cheery was a task with the confirmation that Ray was out of the country at the time of the theft. It was like a gut punch. I'd been hoping so desperately to uncover a web of lies, I hadn't prepared myself to rule Ray out and hit another dead end. With a sweep of my hand, I tipped over the cocktail into my lap and stood with a hiss. Shoot. Me and my clumsy hands. Ray likewise stood and stared at my soaked midsection, apparently at a loss as to what to do in a situation like that. Reaching over the bar, I grabbed a handful of napkins and dabbed uselessly at the mess. I'd offer you my coat, 
but I didn't bring one, Ray said a little redundantly. Never mind, I said with a tut. My hotel isn't far from here, I'll have to go back and change. Nice to meet you anyhow. Was it Ray? Ray took my proffered hand and nodded. Safe travels. I fled the bar after grabbing my purse with an apologetic look to Jackson, who had arrived with a dishcloth to mop up the mess. Neglecting to meet anyone's eye on the way out, I figured being mortified by the spill on my dress was understandable enough, even if I didn't relish the idea of a sticky drive home without a change of clothes. But it was all insignificant. If Ray had been on a beach in Thailand at the time of the vault breach, then Ash and I were back to square one on the case. I didn't look forward to sending him the news once I got back to Myrtle Glen. Chapter 18 Ash had only replied with a few scant words to my email the night before, so I was trying to come up with some kind of plan while working away in the nursery, under a broody, overcast sky. Thankfully it was Friday, which meant Megan was in the office seeing to the customers, but in my dejected mood, I was concerned I'd make for poor company with Travis that evening. I was sorely tempted to cancel the date but couldn't fathom a reasonable excuse. Perhaps it was as simple as leaving the office early with a headache and spending the night on the couch with a tub of ice cream and getting a decent night's sleep. Either way, with late-night trips across the countryside and working six days a week, I knew I couldn't keep up the momentum for long. The only thing that was keeping me at Garden Gate Nursery and supplies was the fact that I could play in the garden while tending plants, which was as much soothing as it was productive. It was a sign that things were very wrong. Usually I had a spring in my step coming into work each morning. Taking Ray off the board meant that the investigation had narrowed dramatically. It was either Stella who had hatched the entire plan or Ash's former associates, despite the tech illusionist's insistence that the latter was highly improbable. And as far as leads went, I couldn't think of how I could unearth the motive and means for someone of Stella's standing. Somehow I doubted I could pull the same sort of truth elixir stunt with her. It was only a matter of time before Ash handed himself in. If that phone rang again. Well, I was sure Ash would deliver himself promptly into the hands of the Inquisition. Especially if Zoe stood her ground and refused to leave Myrtle Glen with him. I'd been feeling pretty sour about the potion's witch since learning that she'd spurned Ash yet again, but as I pulled a Strelitzia from its cramped pot, I wondered what I might do in her place. I didn't get a chance to ruminate on that as Megan approached from behind. Anything I can help with? Oh, I don't know, you any good at solving puzzles? I asked offhandedly. I'm great at puzzles, Megan chuckled. The best ones are when the answer is smacking you right in the face. My dad always used to say the answers are usually in the questions. Why do you ask? Don't mind me, I shrugged, though my mind began to grind on Megan's words. My head is in the clouds today. Do you think you'd mind if I go get some errands done early and leave you to arrange some items to go on sale for next week? You can decide which wares and plants, and maybe some sleepers that have been sitting the longest. If you get some stickers together and take some photos, we'll have plenty to post about on socials. Megan grinned. Sure. You want me to prioritize the slow-moving stuff? Sure, but maybe some crowd favorites, too. Those lily pillies have put on some fresh growth over the last couple of weeks. They'll make for some great photos. No worries. I'll have a look on the system and leave you a list. Don't worry about a thing. I patted my eager employee on the shoulder. Thank you for all the hard work over the last few weeks. I know I haven't been around much to help out. Megan giggled and shook her head. That's the whole point of putting me on, isn't it? So you had some extra time up your sleeve? I'm really enjoying the job. Thanking the stars that I'd managed to find a star employee on my first attempt at hiring, I left Megan in the office and rounded up Gus from his favorite afternoon snoozing spot in the sun. If the answer was in the question, like Megan said, then I figured I had more to ask. And I knew exactly where I needed to go to have them answered. The candle shop in town where Zoe worked was along the main street, 
close to Cheyenne's hairdressing salon. While her relationship with Ash was none of my business, her connection to his former life and gangster associates were relevant to the case. I told my familiar as much on the drive over. It doesn't add up, Gus. She upended her entire life once on Ash's promise to keep her safe from her ex. But now that there are folks who are getting murdered around her, she won't budge? You suspect her again he cocked his little, kitty head and stared at me. Maybe, I said, unbuckling my seatbelt. We won't be able to rule her out until we ask some hard questions. Allowing Gus to follow me onto the street, I ignored the curious stares of passerbys watching with interest as my cat followed me like a well-trained hound into the shop front, filled with candles, crystals, and incense. Inside, Zoe was moving stock around on shelves wearing a baggy, tie-dye yellow jumpsuit that gave her the appearance of a deflated balloon. Her tired-looking eyes echoed the sentiment as she looked over, and I bit my lip, unsure how to break the silence. We need to talk, I said. Zoe took a deep breath and shrugged as she moved past me to snip the lock on the door, giving Gus a dubious look as she spotted him slinking through the shop. If you're here to talk me into leaving, you're wasting your time. You're a free woman, I reasoned, as I followed her past the counter toward the back of the shop. It's certainly none of my business what you choose to do. Zoe stopped by the cramped kitchenette and grabbed a couple of tea bags from a canister before filling two polka dot mugs. Then I guess you haven't come here to give me a talking to about not leaving with Ash? I took a seat at a card table crowded with boxes of stock. I heard he came to visit you, I ventured. But I'm not interested in talking about recent history. I ruled out one of his colleagues from the Inquisition last night, so the way I see it, it was either his boss who took the rotary phone, or his former associates in the Magical Mafia, and I think Stella Marshall could have come up with a more inventive way for the phone to go missing. Zoe's back stiffened before she turned with two mugs in hand. What are you implying? Only that I know squat about these people, and Ash has disregarded them from the start. But it makes a lot of sense that they would want their seized magical items back, wouldn't you agree? The potions which swallowed as she set down the mugs and sat across from me. And you think I would know something about that? You're the only other person I know who could. I let that hang in the air as I eyed the steaming mug of tea in front of me. I had no intention of taking a sip. And if I were in your shoes with all the folks around me dropping like flies, I think I would be inclined to take Ash up on his offer before I was next. Unless of course you have some way to be sure you won't be targeted. Zoe's lip trembled, and her eyes grew watery. I wish he would just leave. It's not safe, Cat, and it's all my fault. My brows flew up and Zoe clenched her jaw. I opened my mouth to find the right words, but Zoe beat me to the punch. They found him. They found him because of me, and there's nothing the Inquisition can do about it. Ash wants me to go with him, but I'm the reason he needs to run. Zoe rubbed her eyes. Matt won't stop now. He's relentless, and he must have a good tech illusionist working for him, because my accounts got messed up, and now I've got nothing to pay rent with. Hold on. I held up my hand. One thing at a time. Who is Matt and how is this your fault? Zoe sniffed and drew a tissue from her pocket. I waited with my teeth clenched for her to collect her thoughts. When Ash arranged for me to come out here, I had to cut ties with everyone I knew, even my family. The more they knew, the higher the risk to them, so I made a clean break. But I had to be sure they were okay. Every once in a while I'd call Mum at work and let her know I was all right. She understood why I had to run, she hated that I got messed up with gangsters, and Matt's people gave up checking in on her after a while. She moved to Adelaide, and I went to see her a few months ago. Ash never knew about it. I ran my tongue over my teeth, and I'm guessing that turned out to be a bad move. I got the call a week later, it was Matt, and he tried to sweet-talk me into coming back to Brisbane. I closed my eyes, why on earth had the woman chosen to keep this to herself? I pushed down my anger and tried to keep my features blank, 
I'm guessing he didn't take too kindly to the word no. At first I thought he accepted that I didn't want to be with him. I thought he would leave me alone, but he must have been keeping tabs on me, because... You and Ash took a little road trip while he was working on the vault job for Stella. Zoe nodded and lowered her eyes. I didn't hear from him again until the night Sharon died. He said he would hurt Ash unless I came home. You could have saved us a world of trouble, you know, if you came forward with this right at the start. I couldn't help myself and folded my arms to keep from launching into a tirade. We've been trying to work this out for weeks. I know. Zoe threw up her hands, and if Ash had just left like he was supposed to and started again, I would have figured something out. I couldn't leave with him, Cat. We would have spent the rest of our lives on the run. So, what were you going to do? After Ash was gone? Zoe pressed her lips together. If it would keep people from getting killed, I would have gone back. But I was scared Ash might try something, so I thought I could wait him out. And all this time Ash had thought Zoe was spurning him because, well, it seemed that the potion's witch had cared too much about him to run off into the sunset together. The Inquisition Is useless, Zoe said firmly. Half of them are working for the Mafia, and the other half are too busy cutting heads off snakes to notice that another three grow back in their place. I don't trust any of them. I figured Zoe's jaded view of the magical authorities had come from experience in her abusive relationship witnessing the bad seeds doing deals with the likes of her ex, but I had to believe most of them were better than that. And if Stella could put this Matt guy behind bars, then Zoe and Ash should both be able to continue their lives in Myrtle Glen without fear. You said there must be a tech illusionist involved. I'm guessing that isn't part of Matt's repertoire? Zoe shook her head. Matt was a pyromancer. From torching buildings through to reading flames. It doesn't surprise me that he wanted the rotary phone. The art of divination by fire was something that I'd read about, and the fact he hadn't been able to locate Zoe before now seemed remarkable, if he had an aptitude for the practice. It might have explained how he tracked Ash's movements when he'd left Zoe to meet Stella at the vault. I'm getting the Inquisition involved whether you like it or not, Zoe. There's no other choice. Zoe's eyes rounded like saucers. It was clear that the penny had just dropped, and if more people die, then they were going to anyway. You think after you went back to him he would put the phone up on a shelf and forget about it? Zoe's jaw hung open, and she shook her head frantically. No, I shouldn't have said. You can come with me or not. Either way, I'll be talking with Stella Marshall Pronto, and it'll be up to you on which side of the fence you'll be sitting on. Zoe gave me a long hard look before standing. This was a mistake. Zoe, I held up my hands to placate her. If we can. You need to leave. Zoe pointed to the door and heaved deep breaths. I opened my mouth to try to talk the potions witch off the wall, but she only screeched like a banshee for me to get out of the shop. She clearly revealed more than she had intended, so I puffed out my cheeks and stalked out of the shop with Gus trotting ahead of me. I needed to get home fast. The potions witch was liable to do something stupid, and I needed to get this information into the hands of people who could act on it quick smart. Chapter 19 with the biggest break in the case so far I sped toward home putting together a plan. I couldn't count on Zoe to make sound choices after our conversation, and if her ex was going to make a phone call as some kind of retaliation, it was going to happen soon. Of course it happened to be scant hours before my planned date with Travis. At least Gus was quiet on the trip back. He must have sensed that I needed some time to mull over Zoe's revelation. After confirming that he overheard the conversation, the ginger cat simply curled up into a ball on the passenger seat with his eyes closed, seemingly snoozing. Not that I thought he was asleep. Gus always talked about the benefits of dozing to make sense of things. After skidding to a halt at the house I left the truck's door open so Gus could follow and ran for the back door, as if the very hounds of hell were nipping at my heels. 
I needed to let Ash know what was going on. If Zoe made it to him before I did, she could have spun all kinds of tales about our run and that suited her purpose. I cursed myself for not trying to get the burner phone from her, it would have made things a lot easier. Inside I snatched up the tablet and sat at the dining room table to fire off an email, but just as my fingers hit the keyboard I suddenly didn't know how to put all this mess into words. Swallowing I rubbed my temples, trying to figure out the best and most concise way to convey the news without freaking Ash out over my intention to share the information with Stella. You seem anxious, child, Sorka said. Gus, can you please let her know what's going on? I need to think about this email, and can you both try to keep it down? Trying as best I could to keep Gus and Sorka's nattering out of my head, I considered how Ash would take the news. Would he be more or less likely to run if he thought Zoe was a risk of taking off with this Matt guy? The very same thug he'd so valiantly rescued her from in the past. He needed to know, that much was plain, so I typed it down as best I could with a postscript, that I would be in contact with Stella to throw Matt's name in the ring. So, this spurned lover had the skill to perform the magic we discovered? Sorka's voice cut through my train of thought. I don't think so. Unless pyromancers are capable of the patch job you saw at the vault. Fire has not much affinity with illusion. This is true, Sorka said. But that does not mean this sorcerer did not have a wider grasp of magic than most. He must have had a tech illusionist working with him. We know from Ash that the magical mafia is partial to having a tech illusionist up their sleeve. Matt had the motive, but maybe not the means. We must be looking at a contractor, but the Inquisition is better placed to figure out who that is. But more importantly, would reading the fire allow this guy to keep tabs on Zoe and Ash from afar? Divination by flame is a powerful tool. How strong from a distance would be up to the relative strength of the individual. It is much more likely that a fire is lit somewhere nearby if one can discern finer details from its visions. Sorka made a rumbling sound in her non-existent throat. It was much easier when flame was an abundant presence in every household. I hung my head in my hands, trying to figure out how Matt had discovered Zoe's whereabouts and learned of Ash's contractor work with Inquisition. If he'd been keeping tabs on Zoe's mother, her move to a new city would have drawn his interest, and perhaps he'd been keeping a close eye on her. When Zoe had visited, it could have given him the necessary link to follow her all the way back to Myrtle Glen. If Matt had traveled south once he had Zoe's location, maybe he was in range to look over Ash's shoulder and devise a plan that would liberate a magical mafia item back into gangster hands and scare his ex-girlfriend in the process with an offsider, of course, who was at least as good with tech illusion as Ash and his counterpart Ray Beecham. How I would present this to Stella was another thing altogether. First things first, though, I had to make an excuse to cancel the date with Travis. Rummaging in my purse, I grabbed my phone, and as I started typing a text message, it rang. I almost jumped out of my skin and after peering at the unfamiliar number, I glanced at the tablet and wondered whether it was Ash calling. There was a fair chance he would take that risk with the bombshell I just dropped into his inbox, so I picked up the call, as I was about to launch into a tirade to recount the day's events, an eerie tune coming from the other end of the line made me choke. Holding the phone away from my ear with shaky hands, I pressed the loudspeaker button and set the phone on the table like it might explode right then and there. I wasn't sure what would happen if I stayed on the call for too long, so after catching my breath, I hung up and held a hand to my stomach. This is the calling card of the charmed phone, no? Gus leaped onto the table and stared at the screen. I only nodded, at a complete loss as to what to do. It wasn't like I had a landline, and I had calls to make and dates to cancel. I've got to, I ran my fingers through my hair and stood gulping long breaths. Ash said he buried his phone, or maybe he dropped it in a bucket of water. Probably both. I need to. Get yourself together, Katerina Gus snapped. It is not surprising that after Zoe revealed her part in this, you are now the target. We must presume these villains know your intentions. 
The spell will not explode until the phone is connected to an electrical source, yes. I swallowed. That's right. So, there is no need to panic. They are simply trying to rattle you. Perhaps the Inquisitors can use your phone too. I frowned at Gus, waiting for him to finish the sentence, but his ears perked up and he looked toward the front window. It took a second for my human ears to catch up as I heard a car pulling into the driveway. It was still mid-afternoon, so there was no danger of Travis arriving hours before the planned date, but who else could be visiting at that time on a workday? When I tiptoed to the living room to twitch aside the curtains, I closed my eyes and groaned. It was a dark SUV. And climbing out of the driver's seat was Amelia Ward, my faux nemesis of the past few weeks, with a similarly black-outfitted male colleague in tow. Perhaps she's saving you the trouble of having to summon them Gus offered. I highly doubt it. I sighed and opened the front door. Well, well, Amelia flashed a smile as she twirled a pair of handcuffs as she approached. You can't say we didn't warn you, Cat. Then you go doing something as stupid as using a deception charm to talk with an inquisitor right under our noses? Stella got the go-ahead this morning. The council granted an involuntary reading. I took a step backward as Amelia crossed the threshold, unsure how to get the Inquisitor to focus on the here and now and stop gloating about my foiled espionage efforts. The phone. I pointed at the dining room table. I just got the call Amelia, so it's now one USB cable away from exploding. Amelia narrowed her eyes, then glanced at the phone on the table. Unfortunately, the tablet was right next to it but there was little I could do about that given the circumstances. When? she barked. I held up my hands. Just then. I swear I was about to call you guys. Anyway, I've got information about who's behind all this. I had our... Amelia held up a finger to silence me and stuck her head out the door to holler at her colleague. Get me a vacuum bag. I frowned. Um... I don't know how a vacuum bag will be much help. Amelia's face crinkled. A vacuum bag, not a vacuum bag. She rubbed the bridge of her nose, like with an actual vacuum inside. Standard protocol for handling explosives. Oh, I guess that makes sense, I said, a little chagrined. But you have to listen to me, there's more. Save it, cat. Amelia reached for my hands and I sagged as she cuffed me with a no-nonsense attitude. You can tell Stella whatever you want in a couple of hours. At this point, I'm not sure I should believe anything that comes out of your mouth. After being so adversarial with the Inquisitor for weeks, I wasn't sure I could blame her for being disinclined to listen to me. I was in a situation of my own making, and the only choice I had ahead of me was to roll with Amelia as far as Inquisition HQ. Then I could lay it all out on the line for Stella in the hope that she did something quickly. Before somebody else got killed. Maybe out of self-preservation, Sorka didn't speak up as I was arrested and steered out toward the SUV, and Gus likewise remained scarce for which I was glad. If Ash did something as desperate as come to the property to talk to me about the email, at least they were both here to let him know what had happened. In the SUV itself, I wasn't surprised after being buckled in to feel a sudden pressure around my body. I'd seen it once before when riding along with Amelia with a crooked witch in the back taken in for questioning. It was the equivalent of a cone of silence, and as we drove back through Myrtle Glen on the road toward Melbourne, my thoughts finally caught up with me, and I realized that I'd never sent that text to Travis to let him know the date was cancelled. Stella must have been really relishing my situation, I figured, as I sat in a nondescript room in the basement of HQ waiting for her to arrive. Without the benefit of a clock, I could only infer that it had been hours since Amelia had cuffed me to the table and left me to await my fate. After yelling to get someone's attention and warning that the killer would strike again unless they came and listened had done no good, I rested my tired throat and ruminated on what action Zoe had likely taken following our conversation. Had she gone straight back to Ash? Or Matt? Heck, maybe she wasn't even the victim like she said and was working in cahoots with Matt all along to set Ash up. 
I had to collect myself there though because as much as the notion tickled me in my current mood, I knew living a life under cover for years to thwart Ash was a long bow to draw. I was almost glad to have my head red when Stella finally opened the door with a smug grin and dumped a bundle of folders on the table in front of me, with Amelia trailing behind her. You really just couldn't leave well enough alone, could you? Stella chuckled. A nice piece of work on the concealment charm, though. I'm guessing a green witch didn't come up with that all on her own, huh? A little help from a certain illusionist, perhaps? I'm sure you must already have the answer to that question, otherwise I wouldn't be sitting here. I gave the Inquisition boss my most mulish look. Does that mean Ash is somewhere in this dungeon of yours waiting his turn? No, unfortunately. Stella smacked her lips and sat across from me. I was hoping you might be able to help me with that part. It was surprising that Stella had given away that much. I wondered, not for the first time, what had given me away during my trip to the bar. It was your accent. Amelia propped her hands under her chin and cocked her head. If I hadn't been at the bar, we'd probably never have known about it. I had a hard enough time reconciling that face with your voice from my booth at the back. I closed my eyes and groaned. My southern accent really gave too much away about me while solving crimes. So, is this how it's done? Are you reading my thoughts now, or do you need to plug me into an electric chair for that? I'm an open book, and you two will be eating your words when you figure out that Ash isn't behind this. Fighting words, Stella said with a smirk. I like it. Let's see how you're faring after an hour or so. Stella opened the folder in front of her, and inside was a slim metal band, which she carefully pulled out of the foam casing. It might not have been as daunting or as terrifying as the contraption I'd dreamed up inside my head, but I clenched my fists and stiffened as Stella stood to sidle round the table and fit the contraption around my head. Now Stella crooned as the band warmed against my skin. Let's take it from the top, shall we? Take me back to the first time you spoke to Ash after his disappearance. A lance of pain rippled through me as I tried to resist instinctively, letting out a whimper I knew I was in for a rough ride. Chapter 20 After Stella was finally done dragging her fingernails through my mind, my vision returned in a swimming haze as I drew rapid breaths. From the sheen on Stella's forehead, it appeared the Inquisitor had quite the ride herself as she delved into my memories, and it was gratifying that I wasn't the only one who felt like they'd just finished the most important exam of their life while grappling with a migraine. Amelia stood to remove the slim metal band from my head, and I slumped back in my seat. The room was silent as Amelia tapped away at a small device which I imagined kept a record of the reading, and when I met Stella's gaze I should have been satisfied that her mocking smirk had fled. Surely it meant the Inquisitor had seen everything that I wanted to reveal. Clearing my throat, I croaked for some water, and Stella reached for a pair of keys on her belt as she unlocked the cuffs which held me to the table. Amelia, would you? On it. Amelia stood and slipped out of the room. Why didn't you tell me all this as soon as I walked into the room? Stella dragged a wrist over her forehead. We might not have gone through with the reading. I swallowed to soothe my parched throat and shrugged. Would you have believed me? I figured this was too urgent to delay with cross-checking information and hesitancy on your part. We need to act on this now. Stella frowned and shook her head. You thought I did it. If I wanted the rotary phone, there would have been easier ways to get my hands on it. I couldn't be sure of that, I said, and until yesterday it was down to either you or Ray on my list of suspects. Stella puffed out her cheeks. I'm sorry, Kat, I can see how we were at complete loggerheads all this time when we should have been on the same team. You were looking for a killer, I reasoned. Same as me. Our information put us on different teams. We were both grappling with risk. Amelia re-entered the room with a cup of water. I gulped it and stretched my arms over my head. None of the discomfort from the involuntary readings remained in my body, but the resulting exhaustion made my limbs feel heavy, 
and my thoughts too slippery to grasp. We still have the phone, Amelia said quietly. Provided it hasn't run out of battery, it's the best lead we have. Stella chewed her lip then glanced at me. Did you use the phone after you got the call? I was about to send a text message, but the call interrupted. What does the rotary phone do once the call has been made? Stella stood and grabbed her folders and jerked her chin toward the door, indicating that I should follow as she entered the hallway leading back to the elevator. It will track every app you visit, call you make, or message you send. We tinkered with its capabilities once we apprehended Patrick Jones, and some of that research helped with configuring the warning sound, but we never tested it out with the Mafia on the other end of the line. Despite everything, I was glad I abandoned my text to Travis. I might have ruined my chances with the guy, but if he'd gotten a death call, it would have been my fault. I didn't use it. Amelia arrived five minutes after it rang. I wasn't sure what the Inquisitor had planned, but I was too groggy to demand answers as Stella shooed me into the lift and we ascended to level five. Being out of handcuffs was promising, but if time was of the essence, surely we should be heading toward the car park to head back to Myrtle Glen. I was about to say as much as the heavy metal doors opened into an open office area, but only trudged after Stella as she wound her way through desks to head to a corner office. The leather couch was much more comfortable than the hard plastic chair they had attached me to for hours in the basement. I sank down gratefully and propped my head in my hand as I waited for Stella or Amelia to reveal their plans. Zoe was a missing piece in the puzzle. The sound of clicking keys from the desk made me look up. Stella stared determinedly at the screen. We couldn't make heads nor tails of her. We figured she was probably some girl Ash knew in his former life that he brought along with him after he disappeared. You knew Ash and Zoe were involved? I figured as much when Ash brought her to that ratty hotel room he stayed in when meeting me at the vault. We were monitoring her, hoping she might inadvertently lead us to Ash, if we kept it cool for long enough. Who knows what she's doing now? I drawled. For all we know, she might have already gotten in the car to make the trip back to Queensland. She didn't say the last name of this ex of hers, did she? Stella cocked her head at Amelia rather than me. Matt, pyromancer for the Brisbane chapter of the Magical Mafia. Amelia shrugged. Should be enough to scrape something from the database. Stella grunted as her fingers hit the keys and curious, I set up a little straighter to watch with interest. From what I can put together he was an ambitious type looking for opportunities after Patrick Jones was arrested, I said. It's likely that he climbed the ladder since he was dating Zoe. But the bigger question is, who was the tech illusionist working with him? Both Amelia and Stella turned their heads to give me a strange look. It was a valid enough question, so I threw up my hand and arched my eyebrow. Ben Jones has the power and the skill to pull something like this off. Amelia said matter-of-factly. We figured Ash was working for Ben and would lead us back to his boss if we could find him first. Ben Jones? I shook my head. That's impossible. Ash said Ben was dead. Sure, on paper he is. There was an explosion when we arrested his brother, and it was almost certain that Ben was inside the building when it detonated but a year later we started noticing patterns in unsolved crimes that could only be him. Ben Jones is up there on the Inquisition's most wanted list in Queensland. Frowning, I put this together with what Ash had said about Ben and wondered vaguely whether he had any idea that his former boss was still at large, which begged the question. So, did you know before or after you hired Ash that he had connections with the Magical Mafia in Queensland? because as far as I see it, this was the disaster waiting to happen. Stella's cheek flexed as she pursed her lips. After, she grunted. It wasn't until we started going through the old files on Patrick when the phone went missing that I saw the photo of Ash. Coincidence, huh? I sighed. I assumed Matt had a tech illusionist working for him. Are we saying now that it's more likely that Matt is working for Ben? If so, how the heck are we supposed to track them down? 
Stella didn't answer right away and instead kept tapping away at the computer and swiveled her screen so Amelia and I could see what she was looking at. A mugshot appeared of a man with a snake tattoo on his neck and a shaved head. Amelia bent closer to the desk to read aloud the text beside it. Matthew Clark, known pyromancer working for the Brisbane chapter of the Magical Mafia, suspected in over a dozen arson cases, two of which he served time for in mundane prison five years ago. I'm guessing that's your guy then? I shrugged. Amelia gestured for Stella to relinquish her place behind the computer and sat at the desk before turning the screen around. I was guessing as an inquisitor more used to doing the grunt work, she was in a better position to navigate the system and dig up more dirt. Stella leaned on the desk and considered me with her arms folded. We know what this guy wants. Framing Ash for the crime is one thing but those victims tell a different story. I think all this guy is interested in is getting Zoe back under his control. Revenge on Ash is just a lucky coincidence. We can use that, but we will need you to work with us on it. I considered the Inquisitor warily, unsure if I was fit for much more than curling up on the couch and having a snooze for the next few hours. But we were finally at a place where we knew who'd done it and needed to figure out a way to apprehend him. Or them. What do you want me to do? We've got a phone that is a direct line to these guys, and you've got the connection with their prize. We need to bait a trap, and we can't do it without your cooperation. Won't they know you brought me in? I rubbed my eyes. What can I possibly say to Zoe that would draw them out of the shadows? Stella ran her tongue over her teeth and tapped her finger against her elbow. We turn you loose. Just like we would with anyone else after an involuntary reading and you'll make your way back to Myrtle Glen on your own. I'll have a team follow, and by the time you make the call to Zoe we'll have everything in place. If he thinks Zoe's close to running off with Ash, he'll have to act. Which is probably why the girl was smart enough to keep fobbing Ash off. It's her. Amelia piped up, and I leaned forward as she turned the screen. We always keep a file of photos with unidentified associates. Back in the day Zoe's hair was naturally brown and hung to her shoulders, unlike the blonde dreadlocks I was familiar with. Her face appeared gaunt in the photo with dark circles under her eyes as she sat across from a man at a cafe. I could only see the back of the guy who I presumed was Matt, but from that angle Zoe seemed sad. Let me get this straight. You want me to go back home and stick my finger in a hornet's nest after having my mind scoured? I sat up and cleared my throat to provoke the psychopath who murdered his ex-girlfriend's boss and neighbor to scare her into getting back with him. Oh, and you know, tried to murder me using my own damn phone. Stella showed the courtesy of looking abashed but shrugged. We could do it ourselves but I'm sure it will be a lot less convincing. Besides, you wanted in on this case from the very start. This is your chance to save your friend and put a killer behind bars. Dang it. I was between a rock and a hard place if ever I saw one. Dragging my hands over my face and willing my foggy head to clarity, I stood on wobbly legs. Fine, just tell me what I'm gonna need to do. Chapter 21 I wasn't ashamed to say that I got a couple of hours sleep on the couch in Stella's office as the Inquisitors launched into planning. It had been a long day, on top of an involuntary reading, and as Amelia observed, I was unlikely to get a train out to Rutherglen at 3 a.m. on a Saturday morning. From what I could put together, Stella had to assemble an undercover team, and after she handed me a coffee once the sun had come up, explained that the agent they left in Myrtle Glen had confirmed Zoe was still in town. So, you guys have been in Myrtle Glen for weeks then, I said before taking a grateful gulp. The council wants this cleaned up. We've had the Queensland division breathing down our necks, which has ruffled all kinds of feathers. There was a decision made on a national level that the vault should be located here in Victoria. Not everyone agreed at the time. I rubbed my grainy eyes and nodded. I'd been meaning to ask how the rotary phone had ended up in Stella's jurisdiction, but it sounded like this brouhaha was political as much as anything. If we act, how can I be sure Ash is safe? 
I looked into Stella's eyes. He doesn't know Ben is still alive. If he figures out something is up and acts. Stella sighed, and her eyes darted. Nothing is a given. We have to trust that Ash's skill in staying unseen holds up for the next few hours. It's likely he's far enough away that he won't know what's happening until after the fact. You really believe that? I stood and stretched my back. If you ask me, he'll smell us coming from a mile away. And Ben was the illusionist who taught him everything he knows. We can't risk contacting Ash. Everything hinges on this operation going smoothly. Matt will intercept Zoe if he thinks she will disappear, but if he can draw Ash out at the same time, he might stay out of sight until he can get his hands on both. We know he wants Zoe alive, but I can't say the same for Ash. I didn't like it, but Stella was probably right. I could picture the Inquisition busting down the door to find Ash and Zoe climbing out a window, and that would lead us exactly nowhere. Neither Ash nor Zoe be safe until Ben and Matt were taken care of. And at this point, it was likely we would only nab one of those two with this stunt. Will you protect them? You know, if Ben is still at large after this? You have my word. They'll have whatever they need to start fresh, so long as they cooperate with us. I nodded and finished my coffee in silence before Amelia came in with my phone and ran me through the plan one more time. She assured me there was no risk of an explosion en route, and that her people thought they may have disabled the explosion protocol altogether but couldn't be sure. And with 30% battery left, I would have plenty of time to make the call to Zoe, once I got as far as Rutherglen, and took a cab for the last stretch of the journey. I rode down the elevator with her to the ground floor, and after stepping into the foyer Amelia reached to touch my arm. I turned with a questioning look, and she gave me a lopsided smile. I'm sorry this has been all so confrontational. I hope you can understand why I was so standoffish at the start. I arched an eyebrow at the admission. You ever been through an involuntary reading? You seemed almost eager to bring me in. During training, Amelia said, I know it's pretty uncomfortable. I thought you might have spilled as soon as we came into the room with the reading crown. I made a face at the term for the mind-scouring instrument. You and Stella make it sound like you would have believed me. I highly doubt we would have moved so fast if I just told you about what happened. But I'm okay, and I know I was pretty abrasive myself over the last few weeks." Amelia bit her lip. Understandably. Deciding against giving her a lecture about the dubious council-sanctioned practices of mind-reading, I gave her a wave as I exited the building onto the city street. I'd learned through the course of the investigation that magical crimes were much more difficult to solve than my garden-variety murders and kidnappings in the past months, and had to admit involuntary readings must be necessary in a lot of cases. I had the directions toward the train station and cursed my lack of jacket as the brisk morning air sent goosebumps over my arms. At the platform, I stood bouncing on the balls of my feet for ten minutes before my regional train pulled in and huddled in my seat on the sparse car. It was a long trip without the benefit of a phone to scroll through to pass the time. I wasn't even comfortable keeping the thing in my pocket, so I left it on the seat next to me under a discarded newspaper to deter any would-be thieves. The nap had done little to cure my foggy head, and I dozed intermittently, as I stared out at the passing landscapes through the window. Rutherglen was the last stop, so I wasn't worried about waking up in an unfamiliar place, but every time the train bounced on an uneven track, I sat up in shock and had to catch my breath. When I finally trudged off the train and ordered another coffee at the nearest cafe while waiting for a cab, I stared at my phone. There was 25% battery left. I'd been instructed to call Zoe once I arrived at the larger township, assured that the Inquisition would make it back to Myrtle Glen well before I did, and yet I hesitated. Would everything be done and dusted before I got home and took my truck into town? Would Ash do something impulsive and end up in the line of fire because I'd neglected to warn him off? Would he even listen to me if I told him to stay away? The heavy burden of choice sat squarely on my shoulders, and I stood frozen with indecision. It was time to roll the dice, 
and even if I wanted to contact Ash, the tablet sat on my dining room table back at home. If I waited that long to call Zoe, Stella would know something was up. I dialed Zoe's number and took a shuddering breath to calm myself. I wasn't sure how I could get through the conversation and keep my nerve and was both relieved and aghast that the call went to voicemail after ringing out. Zoe's recorded voice sounded absurdly cheery to my ears, and I swallowed as I planned what I would say. Zoe, I know you don't have a choice, but please you can't run off with Ash until I talk to you. I'll be back in Myrtle Glen in about an hour, and I'll come to your place and tell you what I know, he told me flights are booked, but if you can stall him just a little bit longer. A beeping in my ear told me that the voice message had reached its limit, and I hung up before taking gasping breaths. Amelia and I had talked through what I would say, and my mind raced over the few sentences I'd managed to get in. Sense of urgency. Alluding to an imminent departure. Trying to sound convincing so anyone listening in would believe that Zoe had already made up her mind. I could only hope it was enough, and was relieved when I spotted a cab rounding the corner slowly looking for the person who booked it. I wanted so badly to leave the phone behind, but that would only mean some unsuspecting soul would pick it up and eventually put it on charge. So instead, I pocketed the cursed device, took a gulp of coffee, then jumped into the back of the cab with instructions to get me back home. The cab driver at least took my mind off things for a while as he chatted amiably about this and that, forcing me to engage in conversation. From his surreptitious glances in the rearview mirror, I thought he might be concerned about my presentation, but he was kind enough not to prod any deeper than polite conversation. When we finally pulled in at home after he'd given me a long account of his grandchildren's achievements, I paid in a hurry and thanked him for the ride. I watched him pull out of the driveway while glancing around for anything that might be out of place, then hustled to the back door to check in with my household quickly. I didn't have a lot of time to get over to Zoe's, but they at least deserved to know I was okay and had a plan to apprehend the culprits in the works. But when I rounded the corner to the patio, I realized I had a visitor sitting at the outdoor table, one with a shaved head and a snake tattoo on his neck. My throat constricted before I could scream. Even if I hadn't seen Matthew Clark's mugshot just scant hours earlier, the nasty grin and sheer presence of the large man as he stood would have terrified me. I had just a moment to curse myself for not checking before the cab left, then I turned woodenly to run. I didn't get far though. Having expected it Matt had already launched toward me as soon as I got started and grabbed my arm before I could make it more than a few steps. I grunted as he pulled me into a bear hug from behind, then cursed myself again for not calling for help when a hand clamped over my mouth. He swung me around to the back of the house, and I squirmed in his tight grip as he lugged me into the house. Where the heck was my telepathic household? Everything seemed wrong as Matt shoved me onto a chair and used a rope on the dining room table to tie me up. I should have gotten some warning. If Billy was around he would have... A smart witch would have recognized a warning when she saw one. Or heard one. Matt grunted a laugh from behind me. The call. I closed my eyes and my jaw trembled as he reached for my pocket and pulled my phone out. I knew where this was leading and called out to Gus, who I hoped was well away from the house and the impending fire. Your familiar won't be any help. Matt strode into the living room and returned with Gus under one arm, completely frozen. He placed my cat on the table, who appeared mid-stride with his kitty teeth exposed in a hiss. It was like he'd been taken to a taxidermist with a sick sense of humor. Neither will that thing you keep out in the water. Billy. I choked with a sob, imagining the bun yip exposed and likewise unable to defend himself. If Matt knew about the water spirit, then it was clear he had been keeping a close watch on both me and my property. And look here. 20% battery. I reckon it's about time we put this on charge, don't you think?" Matt dangled the phone in front of my face with a deranged grin and I stared past him to the charger plugged into the kitchen wall by the kettle. It was over. Why hadn't the Inquisition thought to sweep the house before I arrived? 
or at least gotten close enough to determine if it was safe. The answer was that both Zoe and I were bait, and Stella had put her money on the wrong horse. Please don't do this, I managed, shaking my head frantically. It'll only be worse. They know you're... Matt held up a hand to silence me and leaned over the window to glance cautiously outside. Then I heard it too. The sound of a car door closing was about the most welcome thing I ever heard. But when Matt frowned, I turned as much as my bindings allowed for, and my moment of hope fled into panic. It was Travis Larkins, and here I thought he might never speak to me again after standing him up for our date the night before. Chapter 22 When Travis spotted me through the sliding glass door, I screamed for him to run, but he was so focused on me, he didn't see Matt coming from behind. The pyromancer had gone through the laundry to sneak up behind him, and Travis was halfway through the sliding door when Matt looped a rope around his neck and jerked him backward with such force he landed on the ground. As Matt landed kicks into Travis's ribs, I sobbed and tried to reach for my magic, but while I could feel it, I couldn't touch the source of my power. It was like trying to catch the wind, and I couldn't decide if it was my frenzied state or something to do with the rope keeping me from my powers. Compose yourself, child, Sorka hissed into my mind. You'll not free yourself from these bonds by screeching like a banshee. Do not speak. Do not react. If you wish to counteract the magic holding you, we must link before that lout turns his attention back to you. Open your mind, and I shall slip inside. Outside, Travis had managed to roll over and was trying to push himself off the ground as Matt landed crushing blows against his spine. At that point, I would have handed over my body willingly to Sorka if she could make it all just stop. Sniffling, I closed my eyes and opened myself up, and felt the presence of my undead ancestor sneak inside. If Matt had sensed anything he said nothing as he dragged Travis into the dining room. The landscaper's eye was purple and swelling rapidly, and Matt grabbed a fist full of hair to heave him up before securing the rest of the rope around his torso. I could feel Sorka creeping around inside my head and testing the bounds of my magic, but she was proceeding cautiously. If I expected a big flashbang of magic to put this guy down, I estimated that I'd be waiting a while. Cat. I'm sorry. I was worried after Travis grimaced in pain as Matt thrust his head back against the counter. Shut up, the big man grunted. Should have taken a hint, lover boy. Now you'll both burn. Travis only closed his eyes and grunted, and I so desperately wanted to reach out and cradle him in my arms. It was more than a case of the wrong place at the wrong time. He was here because of me. If I'd just figured out a way to cancel that date sooner, he would never have come looking for me. Now, let's get this show on the road. I'm sick of this stupid little town, and thanks to you, I've got everything I need to chase down that little weasel and hand him back to the people he betrayed. Matt grinned smugly as he reached for the tablet on the counter. He didn't need to tell me he had a direct line to Ash, but he underlined the point anyway. According to you, Zoe will meet up with him at the roadhouse on the Northern Highway past Goldberry at noon tomorrow. It won't work. They're on to you now. You can forget any plans you have of dragging her back with you. Zoe will be long gone once the Inquisition learns of my death. I held up my chin, but the effect was ruined as my lips trembled. And if you think Ash would be stupid enough to show up anywhere without being certain that I'm there, then you're even duller than you look. Matt laughed and shook his head. Brave words for someone about to burn to death Salem style. They say it's exquisitely painful, but I'm sure I can make it worse. I wasn't sure I wanted to provoke the man further with Sorka still worming her way around my magical bonds, but if I didn't keep him talking, then it would be too late to matter. I tried to estimate how long it had been since the cab had dropped me off, and how much longer it would take for Amelia to worry that I hadn't arrived in town at our rendezvous location. The answer was much longer than I would have liked. Don't you threaten her, Travis slurred. I swear I'll. Another blow silenced Travis, and while I was moved that he would intercede on my behalf after taking a mighty beating and left tied up on my kitchen floor, 
I wished the idiot would shut up before Matt left any permanent damage. You think Ben will protect you? I said, trying a different tactic. As far as I see it, he's got you right where he wants you. He's got his brother's phone back, and you'll take the fall for it. You think a guy who faked his death to stay out of the Inquisition's hands rather than save his brother from being arrested would have any qualms about setting you up? We both know this won't go away until they have someone behind bars for the vault job. The Inquisition has made this case their top priority, and I'm guessing Ben is long gone by now. The expression on Matt's face faltered for just a moment before he replaced it with a look of bravado. Nobody will find us. The Inquisition is a joke. Up in Brisbane, half of them are on our payroll. That might be so, but it won't stop Stella Marshall from hunting you down. You've ticked off the wrong people, and now this case is getting attention right at the very top. That won't stop me from burning this hovel to the ground with you inside it. Matt rounded the counter and grabbed the charger cord for my phone. My heart hammered in my chest, and Sorka made crooning noises to keep me from full-blown panic mode. I made a strangled sound as Matt plugged my phone in and ducked back through the laundry door to get clear. Moments stretched on as I waited for the explosion, but as I felt Sorka moving more forcefully inside my mind, nothing happened. Cat, what's he doing? Maybe if you can get that chair closer we can use your feet to get the rope around me untied. I tore my eyes from the phone to stare at Travis, who grimaced as he tried to skid toward me. It would only be a matter of minutes before Matt returned wondering why the explosion didn't go off and took the fire into his own pyromantic hands. Are you close? I demanded telepathically from Sorka. We don't have a lot of time here. Hush, she hissed. Just a few more strands. Cat? Are you hearing me? We've got to get out now. I wasn't sure which route would be easier, but I figured while Sorka was working on one end, I could work on the other. Kicking off my shoes, I tried to get enough purchase on the floor to take bunny hops closer to Travis's position. The rope was secured around his back, so he turned with a grunt on his side as I tried clumsily to wedge my big toe in the knot to loosen it up. I thought it wouldn't work and went to say as much when Travis wiggled his fingers at his side. Try to push it down to my hand. I can grab on. The rope was tight, but I tried with all my might to do as he asked. The chair was in an awkward position by the table, and I tried to lean back to push it aside to get closer. But Sorka must have severed the magic holding me just as I titled back, and the energy rebound threw both myself and the table backward toward the living room. The glass top shattered, and as the air was punched from my lungs, a sense of release caused my magic to reverberate throughout the room. The ropes holding me turned to ash, and I rolled clear of the chair to crawl toward Travis. But before I could reach him, a force gripped my mind and took hold of my faculties. Sorka. I felt myself thrust back inside my own consciousness and witnessed Sorka standing through my own eyes and senses. With a careless wave of her hand, she disintegrated Travis's bindings and only stepped over him as he protested for me to stay with him. Then she wrenched the door open to pursue her quarry, Matt. I felt her fury and seething wrath as if it were my own and screamed soundlessly for her to stop and give me back my body. But she paid me no mind as she summoned more magic than I would ever dream of holding on to and held up her hand with a snarl to release it in a sphere of raw energy toward Matt, who stood by Travis's truck. The pyromancer dove aside before it hit, but as the impact threw the green truck on its side, it knocked him to the ground. Sorka stalked toward him with a menacing snarl, and a spell formed inside my mind which I recognized through the link as a death incantation. Stop, if he dies we'll never find Ben, I pleaded. Ash won't be safe until we find both of them. Sorka didn't respond and dropped to her actually my knees to grab Matt by the throat. A wave of satisfaction rolled through the link as the pyromancer's eyes rounded in terror. The spell's words sharpened in my mind, and as I tried to figure out their intent, which seemed like death except different, I noticed other sounds around us, the crunch of gravel under tires, Travis's shouts, the blaring of a siren. 
I fought for control, and when a hand landed on my shoulder, I won the tug of war for my mind. Get back. I recognized Stella's bark and tipped backward to land on my butt. Three burly inquisitors pressed forward and grappled with Matt on the ground as I skidded clear. As they slapped a set of cuffs on him, Matt howled with rage, and I pulled my knees up under my chin to take slow steadying breaths. Using all that magic had left me feeling singed from the inside out, and my tank was already running low after the involuntary reading. Everything was a blur around me, and I realized Stella was asking me something only when she crouched down beside me and patted my back. You hear me? We'd like to question Matt here if that's okay? We can't afford to lose any time taking him back to HQ. We can do it out in the garage if you prefer. I mumbled something that I hoped sounded like agreement, my eyes fixed ahead to Travis's mangled truck. It took a second to connect that with the fact the landscaper was inside and badly beaten, and my mind clicked back into place. Do you have a healer with you? It's Travis. He arrived after I got home, and... I swiveled and caught sight of the landscaper standing just outside the patio door, bent slightly forward and holding one hand to his ribs, but his focus was on the scene of SUVs, suited inquisitors, and no doubt his car with a dazed look on his face. This would take no small amount of explaining to do on my part. But after the beating he'd taken on my account, the landscaper had earned it. Chapter 23 I stumbled barefoot over the lawn littered with debris from the explosion toward Travis and reached to touch his cheek to gently get his attention. He took a sharp breath and stared down at me with a slight frown creasing his forehead, then reached up to clasp my hand. What happened, Cat? he said groggily. I glanced inside where the ruined dining room set barred the way, then past Travis where a bench sat beside the fire pit next to the greenhouse. Come on, we need to talk. The landscaper allowed me to lead him toward the relatively quiet spot and sat beside me with a wince. I kept hold of his hand and wondered how long we had before Stella sent her healer to look us over. Travis, I'm so sorry you should never have gotten mixed in with all of this. I was going to text you last night to cancel the date, but... Your ute was still here. Travis rubbed the back of my hand with his thumb. At first I thought, but it was bugging me all morning. I had to come and check to see if you were okay, even if it meant. That I ditched you? I snickered. I wouldn't dream of it. If you hadn't arrived when you did, maybe these guys wouldn't have made it in time to save me. Who was he? Why was he trying to hurt you of all people? I mean explosives. That's not your everyday break-in. I frowned and looked over my shoulder at the truck and realized he'd probably chalked the damage up to a bomb of some kind. Pressing my lips together, I took a leap of faith and stood to fetch the potted jasmine from the greenhouse that I'd intended to gift Ash and set it in his lap. Travis, there's no way to explain any of this without the truth. I lifted a stem under my forefinger and closed my eyes to grasp tentatively for my magic. I sensed the jasmine cells and the sheer life bursting from the plant and coaxed fresh growth in a rush of energy, my life force mingling with its own to reproduce more and more cells in a chain reaction. Drawing even that much magic burned, but when I fluttered my eyes open, the vine had wound its way up Travis's chest and around his neck. Despite the display, Travis was looking at me in bewilderment rather than my handiwork. Magic is real, Travis, I whispered. I'm a green witch, and there's a whole other world out there filled with witches of all sorts, some with better moral compasses than others. Travis frowned and took hold of the vine's tip between his fingers. He sniffed it as if trying to establish if it was real, and carefully unwound it from his neck. I wasn't sure if I should press on with the story or give him a minute to reconcile with what he was seeing, but he saved me the trouble. I guess that explains a lot, he said as though he was trying to convince himself. Every plant you ever sold me has thrived more than it ought to. And the palm tree. I chuckled. It took no small amount of magic to bring that one back to health once I took over the business. Bill had been smothering it in dust for years with no thought of watering it, 
let alone fertilizer. Travis cupped a jasmine flower in his palm, which was charmed to give off a luminescent glow. You couldn't truly see it in the daylight, but the petals had an otherworldly shimmer, even under full sun. He still seemed super dazed, which I guessed was why he was taking the news so well. But what does this have to do with that guy? I took a deep breath, trying to settle on the most logical place to start, but the sound of footfalls behind me caused me to turn. Amelia had approached and was holding up a... Wait. I stood and held up my hands, but it was too late. Amelia had used her stupefaction wand, and Travis's features grew slack. You didn't have to do that. You and I both know I did. Amelia gave me a sad smile, standard protocol for mundanes caught in the crossfire. The healer will see him now, and it looks like you've given us everything we need to explain the incident when we rejig his memories. We'll get the ute out onto the road and get him to a hospital for a checkup. Looks like it was a pretty serious car crash. But don't worry, the healer will take care of the worst of it, and insurance will take care of the rest. My eyes welled with tears as I shook my head. Of course the Inquisition would insist on making it like nothing had ever happened, but it didn't help the sense of being robbed of a precious moment. One Travis would never remember. I understand you two were meant to go on a date last night. Amelia cocked her head. I'm thinking it won't be much trouble to adjust that to say. Next Friday? That's when he really asked you out, didn't he? How did you know that? I sniffed. Amelia sighed. I have my ways, I know this must really suck, Cat. But you know the rules. Let my people do our thing. There's someone here you'll want to see. I frowned, then cast around the house. Aside from the mob of suits, a lanky guy in a grubby t-shirt stood with his arms folded under the patio, and I scrubbed hands over my eyes. Ash. I gave Amelia a questioning look, but she only shrugged. The idiot was busy confessing to a crime he didn't commit at Zoe's place when we arrived. Go on, I'll make sure this one gets taken care of myself. Biting my lip, I turned back to Travis and took his hand, then planted a kiss on his cheek. Even if he never remembered any of it, he'd come to my rescue today, and it was something I'd never forget. He didn't respond to my touch, and I thrust the bittersweet feelings away as I stood. One day he'd know all about magic, then I'd tell him all about the time he didn't crash his truck. When I reached Ash, he held out my sneakers a little awkwardly. You'll slice your feet open walking around like that. This place is a mess. Ignoring the gesture, I enfolded the tech illusionist in a hug and sobbed against his chest, feeling the tension of the last weeks drain away. He patted my back, no doubt unsure of how to handle my womanly emotions, and I released him after a minute or so and dragged my sleeve over my nose. You have no idea how good it is to see you. Really? He smirked. I figured you'd want to punch me after what you went through. That too. I chuckled and shook my head. I hear you gave Amelia a full confession. Ash's eyes narrowed, and Amelia let me go on about it for ages before she finally clued me in about what was really happening. I didn't find that surprising. After the wild goose chase she'd been on, she probably deserved a little comeuppance. Where's Zoe? Back at her place, Ash sighed. A busload of inquisitors stayed back just in case, but when Amelia said you might be targeted, I insisted on riding along. I. I puffed out my cheeks, unsure if it was the time or place to talk about Zoe's real reasons for pushing Ash away. It was her story to tell, after all. I'm sorry about Ben. I hope Stella can get what she needs from Matt to hunt him down. Ash's eyes hardened. I should have figured he was too clever to get caught in that explosion. If I'd been more vigilant, maybe none of this would ever have happened. It's not your fault. I took his hand and gave it a squeeze. Nobody would expect someone in your position to know. Heck, getting Zoe out of that situation took no small amount of risk on your part. Ash's jaw flexed, and I could tell he was still hurting, but I hoped those two could talk it out in time. While it felt over from where I was standing, 
I knew the battle was only half won until the rotary phone was recovered and Ben Jones was firmly behind bars. Do you think he's close by? Ash bit his lip and shook his head. That's not Ben's style. He's more of a work from the shadows operator. I'd say he left for whatever bolt hole he's hiding in the minute he got the phone from the vault and left Matt here to get Zoe. I doubt Matt knows anything useful. We don't know that. And I'm sure you know a thing or two about the guy which could help the Inquisition to apprehend him. I hoped anyway. What will you do in the meantime? Go into hiding, I guess? Stella offered me and Zoe protection, but I prefer to rely on my own skills. There are too many leaks inside the Inquisition for my liking. It seems that way. I frowned. It's surprising they get anything done from what Matt gloated about. He said most of them were in the Mafia's pocket. Some places are worse than others. Ash shrugged. Brisbane is their stronghold. Stella was pretty firm that any action will be taken from her office. That might make a difference. I sincerely hoped it did. It seemed like such a wasted effort to get all this way only for Ash to still be on the run, albeit from the Mafia rather than the Inquisition. But I refrained from responding as I saw Stella coming out from the garage where they'd lugged Matt to. The Inquisition boss spotted us and headed directly over. We've got our best reader working Matt over, so I wanted to check in on you to see if you were okay. Stella looped her thumb through her belt and quirked an eyebrow at the mess of Travis's truck on my lawn. And find out how all this happened. Explaining the wreckage was not something I was looking forward to. I couldn't be forthcoming with the Inquisition about Sorka, presuming they didn't already know about her from scouring my mind, but so long as they took my word for it, I had to take the blame for Sorka's impulsive and reckless choices. I, ah, uh, I know it's a right mess, but I was fighting for my life at the time. I swallowed and gestured to the patio furniture for the three of us to take a seat. As much as I was tempted to go inside to put the kettle on, the busted glass over the floor decided me as I sat. Matt was just about to put my phone on charge after tying me to a chair when Travis arrived. Once he beat the crap out of him from behind and got him tied up too, he plugged it in, nothing happened. Ash's eyebrows climbed, and I figured the news that I'd gotten the doomed call was news to him, but Stella only nodded for me to continue. Whatever your team did to the phone before I left HQ must have worked but I knew it was only a matter of time before he burned the place down himself. I licked my lips, choosing my next words carefully. I guess I went into autopilot after that. When I severed the rope's magic inside it busted the whole dining setting, and I grabbed whatever magic I could on the way out and just launched it at him. I know it was dangerous but a green witch doesn't have much by way of defensive magic to draw on. Some autopilot, Stella snorted. You're lucky you didn't burn yourself out completely. If this was any other situation, I'd be forced to charge you with reckless magical conduct. I know, I nodded solemnly. If the magic had struck, I'd be in a whole world of trouble. I'm sorry. Stella considered me for a moment, then jerked her chin toward the house. I'll have a team clean that up in a minute so you can get inside and put your feet up. You'll need some rest after the last 24 hours, and I'll keep a team out here for the next little while to make sure you're safe. Once we're done with the reading, I'll take Matt into HQ and keep you updated on the case. I yawned at the word rest and covered my mouth abashedly as I cast around. A couple of inquisitors were with Travis, one of them prodding him, who I assumed was the healer. It was any wonder that the commotion hadn't drawn more attention from the neighbors, and I said as much. Concealment fields, Ash said, attached to the vans. The Mafia used them as well to keep people from noticing their activities. Stella gave Ash a stern stare but didn't respond. It made sense that they'd figured out a way to create portable concealment charms for their operations. So I guess nobody will know about any of this then. Which is exactly as it should be. Stella stood and glanced at Ash. You need a ride back to Zoe's place? Ash looked to me first, and I placed a hand over his. I'll be fine. You two have got a lot to talk about. He mumbled in agreement, 
and Stella called for an inquisitor to send a van back to Zoe's. I gave Ash another hug before he left, hoping I'd see him again soon, and he mumbled in my ear that he would be back in touch soon. I watched as he left in the van misty-eyed, then turned my attention to where Travis was being bundled into another car with a tow rope attached to his truck, which was now hovering above the ground. It was a sight to behold, and even the debris of the truck hung around the mangled body in a shimmering cloud. I knew nobody would see the wreckage while in transit and hoped vaguely that the landscaper had good insurance as he was driven away. It left only a handful of vans around the property, and I waited by the back door, feeling a little useless amid the bustling of inquisitors, when a familiar budding against my calves drew my attention to the ground. Gus. I reached down to bundle my ginger feline familiar into my arms. Gosh, I didn't even check to see if you were okay after. I'm perfectly fine, hungry, if you must know, and I saved you the trouble of checking in on the water spirit. He is remarkably grumpy after being so rudely paralyzed and has gone to seek solitude in the river away from this ruckus. I gave Gus a squeeze and bent my forehead to his. He and Billy had come a long way from hissing and spitting at one another, and I was just glad they were both okay. He purred amiably at the attention, and despite his even tone, I knew he would have been freaking out about me the entire time I'd been gone. We had a lot to catch up on so I slipped my shoes on to crunch over the glass in the dining room and fetch the leftovers of a roast chicken before retreating to my bedroom. The Inquisition could deal with the rest. Chapter 24 I got the call at 3 p.m. on Friday afternoon. Megan must have thought I was a lunatic when I once again rushed out of the office with some lame excuse and a hastily scrawled note containing an address in Myrtle Glen I'd never visited before. I almost forgot to grab Gus from his favorite afternoon snoozing spot out in the yard, and when I scooped him up, he protested mightily in a litany of grumbling telepathic curses. But by the time we arrived at our destination, even Gus was sitting up sharply in the passenger seat and hopped over my lap to get out the second I opened the door. I wasn't sure what I expected exactly, but the modern seriscape gardens filled with healthy-looking succulents mulched in river stones across three levels ascending to the new build home wasn't it. The lot was wide, and gum trees provided plenty of shade on either side of the house. I could imagine a family living there happily, and as I got out of my beat-up truck, I couldn't help but smirk at how out of place it looked in the driveway. As I approached the door it flew open, and I grinned goofily at Ash who looked just as pleased to be home. I would have made him endure another hug, except I saw Zoe standing behind him, and had to tamp down a know-it-all smirk that the two were together despite all the hurt between them. They got him? I fist-pumped the air. How? When? You have to tell me every single detail. And what's with this garden? I was expecting weeds. Lots of weeds. Ash chuckled and shook his head. I'll need coffee for this. Plenty of it. Get inside, will you? With one last lingering look at the garden where Gus was sniffing around contentedly, I followed Ash and Zoe inside to a large, open-plan, ultra-modern living room and kitchen furnished with low-line leather sofas and a massive TV on the wall. What looked like a reptile enclosure dominated another, though I couldn't spot anything scaly inside from my vantage. Ash prepared coffee from a machine that took up a fair chunk of the counter as I sat at the long dining table, and while I thought the house probably spoke to Ash's previous exploits, I didn't mention it. It sure did beat Aunt Tabby's modest home. Zoe sat across from me a little shyly, and I met her eye with a smile. If she was good with Ash, then so was I. Dang it, I said clicking my fingers remembering the charmed luminescent jasmine. I was going to bring you a present. It's back at home. I tried to deliver it a dozen times to the shop when you first went missing. Is it better than having my freedom back? Ash rolled his eyes as he brought two mugs over and returned to the counter, because I reckon you probably won't beat that anytime soon. Um, maybe not. I took a sip of coffee. So does this mean I can stop waiting on the Inquisitors parked at the front of my house 
My guess is they'll be gone by the time you get home. Stella was going to call you, but I asked if I could be the one who broke the news. Ash brought over a mug of what looked like herbal tea and set it in front of Zoe, with a hand on her shoulder. She wrapped her hands around the mug with a dreamy smile at the tech illusionist. I probably owe her some thanks, I'll call her later, and maybe Amelia too. But it was fast, wasn't it? I expected to wait weeks to hear anything. Ash sat beside Zoe and took her hand. We both cooperated to give them everything we could remember about their operation. It filled in the blanks from what they could get from Matt's head, apparently. Stella said it only took that long because she needed top-tier approval to send her team up there to arrest Ben without the Queensland branch knowing about it. And she said your phone came in handy once they knew the explosion protocol had been disabled. Ray figured out a way to use it to locate the rotary phone. Huh. I gave an appreciative nod. Good for Ray, I suppose. Maybe they might even score a promotion out of this. Sounds like the Inquisition has a lot of cleaning up to do in their ranks. He's not bad at what he does. Ash gave a dismissive sniff. And Matt? Is he? I bit my lip, concerned that Zoe was sitting right there. Locked up for good. Zoe twined her fingers together and shifted in her seat. I haven't felt this free in years. They had plenty of unsolved cases to pile onto his charges, and I corroborated at least some of them. That is a relief. I gave her a small smile, and even if her eyes still seemed haunted, she seemed quite at home sitting in Ash's house. What do you guys do now, then? Me? Ash reached his arms overhead in a stretch. Tonight, I'm going to sleep in my own bed. You have no idea how awful the places I stayed at were. Stella agreed to have all my gear sent back to the shop tomorrow, so I dare say I'll have plenty of work to do over the next few weeks to get things up and running again. I still wasn't convinced that the computer shop in Myrtle Glen kept Ash afloat from all the times I'd visited without a single soul stepping inside. But if he had other streams of income aside from his failed Inquisition contract work, that was his own business. I'm guessing Stella won't hire you again for freelance work. Probably not, Ash snorted. But I don't mind. I've had enough of the law and the lawless to last me a lifetime. What about you, Zoe? I cocked my head at the potions witch. This has all been so rough, but your boss died through all of this. I can't imagine what you've been going through trying to keep up appearances on the job front. Zoe shrugged and stared into her mug. The Inquisitors helped out a little. They said they had to do a thorough memory sweep of anyone who might have noticed what was going on. But Sharon's daughter doesn't really want to keep the business going, so I was considering making an offer on the place and try to make something of myself, with a silent business partner. But first I'll head over to Adelaide to spend some time with my mum once Ash has fixed up the shop. Zoe glanced at Ash, and my heart warmed at the way his eyes twinkled. Then I spotted Gus beyond the pair staring at me through a window. Rolling my eyes I stood to open the glass sliding doors a crack to let him in. Your familiar is intolerable, he said in a snippy tone as he gave a brisk shake and leaped onto the dining table. No sense of decorum whatsoever. Pete? Ash snickered into his coffee mug. Yeah, he's a grumpy old bastard sometimes. It'll take him a few weeks to settle down after fending for himself while I was gone. My nose wrinkled as I stared at the reptile enclosure. Ash, what is Pete? My great-great-grandfather who lived here during colonial times, he was sent to the colonies after being sentenced for forgery. I couldn't draw my eyes away from the reptile enclosure. The apple doesn't fall far from the tree, huh? I don't suppose Pete is a frog of some sort now, is he? Ash barked a laugh, and I could tell he was enjoying my discomfort. A frog wouldn't suit his temperament. He took on the form of a brown snake when he became my familiar. An involuntary shudder ran down my spine. I wasn't fond of snakes. And you say he's outside, Gus? I happened upon him in a rockery at the back. Had I not been so nimble and quick-witted, he would have sunk those fangs into my flesh before we could even trade words. I did not want to get caught between Pete and my truck on the way out. 
Taking Gus into my arms I was about to say as much when Ash held up a hand. He's usually harmless. But he doesn't like cats on the property. If I'd seen Gus when you arrived I would have warned him. I feel like there's still plenty of things I don't know about you, Ash Stevens, I grumbled as I stroked Gus's fur. Pete's all right, Zoe interjected as she rounded up our mugs and took them to the sink, but maybe you can find that out for yourself if you hang around. Do you have plans for dinner? Ash and I were thinking of ordering pizza from Sabine's and staying in. You're more than welcome to join us. My cheeks colored as my thoughts turned to my rescheduled but not rescheduled date with Travis. I'd only seen him once at the store since the Inquisition had taken him off to stage the car crash, and while he still looked worse for wear despite treatment from the healer, he'd been in chipper form as he reminded me of our impending date. I, um... Well, I have a date, actually. It was supposed to be last Friday. Except I kinda stood him up. The landscaper? Ash raised his eyebrows. Looks like he didn't take no for an answer from what I saw at your place. I shrugged nonchalantly but couldn't keep the smile off my face. When he came to pick me up, my truck was still in the driveway. He was concerned about me so he dropped by just as. My face fell. I wish he wasn't caught up in all that, but it's nice to know he cares. Even if he'll never remember any of it. Dating a mundane has got to be hard. Zoe made a sympathetic face from the sink. When's the right time to tell them, you know? It's not like the old days when you'd wait for a wedding ring to reveal what they're getting themselves into. It's any wonder that witch and mundane relationships work out. I sighed, having considered the very question Zoe posed at length since my thwarted disclosure of magic. How can someone really trust you after all that deception? I'm sure you guys will find a way, Zoe said. I mean, what can go wrong between a landscaper and a green witch, right? I sure hoped she was right. Well, I better get going on that note. You know, outfits to choose and familiars to placate with roast chicken. If you are seeing a new suitor, an abundance of roast chicken should be forthcoming, Gus grumbled as he squirmed out of my grip to hop onto the floor. Ash laughed, and even Zoe smiled at Gus's attitude. I rolled my eyes theatrically and threw up my hands. See what I have to put up with? I hope this peat of yours doesn't give you anywhere near this much guff. Swap out the chicken for mice, and they could be the same person. Ash followed me to the door to see me out. Just promise you won't trip over a dead body, or get yourself implicated in some crime on your way home, all right? I snorted, considering the long line of crime-related drama I'd been embroiled in since arriving in Australia. I'll do my very best but no promises, okay? I don't need to jinx myself tonight of all nights. Ash folded his arms with a smirk but looked over his shoulder at the door as I climbed into the truck. It looked like he had something on his mind, and I twirled the skeleton key in my fingers while waiting for him to come out and say it. I've been meaning to have you say thanks to that ancestor of yours. He bounced on the balls of his feet. I was pretty dismissive of her when you brought that skull along for our road trip, but we might never have figured this out if we didn't see Ben's handiwork at the vault, even if we couldn't identify him at the time. Sorka. I gritted my teeth reminded of her actions on the day of Matt's arrest. It took every ounce of generosity I had to agree to pass that along before pulling out of the driveway for home. I'd yet to figure out what Sorka was trying to do to Matt when she had him pinned on the ground, but I knew it was no good and every shred of trust I'd built with the undead witch had fled in that moment. Sorka was a problem that needed fixing, and when I had a minute to spare I had every intention of bringing her skull to mom and grandma's attention and have them scour every grimoire in the Crow ancestral home to learn more about her. But not before my first date with Travis. Ain't nothing was going to get between me and the hunky landscaper before we could have our chance to finally have a drink together. Thanks for listening to Framed and Gamed, book four in the Trouble Down Under series. If you enjoyed this audiobook, consider subscribing to P.A. Mason's channel to make sure you keep up to date with new books as they're published. Until then, happy reading.